Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, good, good. Um, yes, I'm uh, happy to be your host in this next exciting session of this big event. I think this is the uh, 16th hour of the conference. And in this session, we unfortunately had a cancellation and Sophie, she went very suddenly very ill. And so the presenters in, uh, in, in this session will have two, uh, 10 extra minutes each. Uh, and uh, apart from that, the rules are the same. So we have, uh, then the present presenters will have 30 minutes and uh, there's uh, no questions at all, not even clarifying questions during that time. And then afterwards, we will have 10 minutes of discussion. And I should emphasize that please do put the questions in the Q&A and uh, just, just do that as, as we go along. And then in the end, I'll, uh, I'll read them up in the, uh, read them in the, uh, in the discussion. Yes, so I uh, believe that we, I, I think I saw Daniel. Yeah, I saw Daniel here. So uh, uh, our first presenter is uh, Daniel Otto Peralia. And he's gonna present on the um, impact of uh, feudalism on development. And uh, yeah, you can start sharing your screen, excellent. And you can take the floor if you like, Daniel. Maybe Daniel has some issues with the mic. Uh, let me see if I can help you. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, there you are. Good. Can you hear me, right? Yes. Okay, great. So, okay. So this is the uh, paper I am, I am presenting here, Delegation of Governmental Authority in Historical Perspective. Uh, Lordship, State Capacity and Development. Thank you so much for the, or to the organizers for, for setting this up. I'm very happy to be presenting here. And well, so I'm gonna start. So in this paper, what I do is to investigate the effect of a pivotal local political institution in medieval and modern Europe, the lordship. The lordship understood as the delegation of jurisdictional rights over a territory. Okay. To do so, I collect data on lordship, that's, that is signorial jurisdiction for ancient regime Spain, and document, firstly document for the whole country, a negative relationship between having been a signorial town in the 18th century and current economic development. To shed more light on the causal effect, I focus on the distribution of lordships in the former Kingdom of Granada after his conquest by the Catholic monarch. And I will explain later what, why I do this. Um, so the, I argue that the initial distribution of lordship was conditionally random. And interestingly, I find that the effect is also negative. Towns that shortly after the conquest were granted to novels are relatively poorer today. So once I establish this, I next move to explain the mechanisms. Why lordships that were granted in the Middle Ages or, or by the end of the Middle Ages are, are relevant today to explain differences in current income. And then I analyze several mechanisms and the one that I find more important is state capacity. Okay. Uh, former lordship had less state present in the 18th century and in the 19th century, and even today. And this is consistent with an interpretation of signal jurisdiction as a privatization of the local government, which has historically hindered the application of central government policies and uh, reduced the state infrastructural capacity in former manorial towns. I mean the central state uh, capacity in former manorial towns. So the, briefly about the contribution to the literature, this is uh, the lordship institution is very important in Europe and beyond. And was a key political institution, key local political institution in Europe during the Middle Ages and until the end of the ancient regime. And this is reflected by the aphorism like no land without a lord. But it's not only for historical Europe important, in other 
similar institutions to lordship are very common throughout history and, and throughout the world. Like in India and Japan and many other countries, you find institutions similar to lordship, consisting in delegating jurisdictional authority to private agents or entities. And also the, this phenomenon of delegation of governmental authority is related to the practice of an indirect, indirect role uh, in the context of European colonialism are also related to the very common practice of public office setting. Okay, very common in the, in the, within the Spanish Empire and in other countries. It also touches the literature on state capacity and de development. It's also related, partially related to the literature of Sertan and more generally about the contributes to the literature and the role play by political institutions in development. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Lordship regime. Okay, so the Lordship was, uh, as I mentioned previously, a very important local political institution that marked the history of European local communities for a very long stretch of time, you know, during the Middle Ages and the modern era. An important thing when studying Lordships is the Lordship is a very heterogeneous institution, so that the, the content of a lordship is different from place to place. And in some places, on some types of lordships included property rights over land, while in other cases it was just the exercise of the public functions, okay, or the territory. And the concept I use of lordship is according to the rest, recent historiography, is the lordship is the transfer by the crown to a private person of entity of jurisdictional function, that is administration of justice and government over a specific territory and its inhabitants. Okay, so this is the formal, the, the formal aspect of the lordship, the essence of the institution. Okay. Lordships, which by which I mean signorial jurisdiction, could be noble, ecclesiastical, or which includes monastic and military order, according to the owner of the jurisdiction. Okay, I focus for the paper on noble jurisdictions okay? and towns that were not lordship, that were not under the signorial regime, were towns under the under royal jurisdiction. It's called in Spanish realengo towns. In the scan, in the Spanish case, the lord's authority over the vassal was limited, at least. Uh, uh, from the end of the Middle Ages. No? For example, according to the Pragmatica de Medina del Campo, approved in 1480 by the Catholic monarch, the freedom had, the vassal had a uh, freedom of movement. Okay, there was, vassal were not attached to the land of the Lord from this period onward. So this is a very basic diagram that shows the difference between a lordship town and a royal town. In both cases, both kind of towns that were similar. No? In both cases, town had a city council as a governing body. And the difference is above the city council in a royal town, there was the king, but above the city council in a lordship, there was the lord. So the lord, the lord played play here a, a, a role to, a, a, a role that consists in the, on, on the one place, uh, limited, the Lord limited the intervention, the capacity to interfere or to control the king, the city council and the, and the town. So the Lord uh, limited the capacity of the king to intervene in the local affairs. And the other, and on the other side, the Lord uh, had, well, power, jurisdictional rights over the towns and over the city council. For example, the Lord appointed had the power to appoint uh, some uh, officials within the city council. The, the Lord was the, the judge, the, the maximum judicial authority within the city, within the town. Okay. And in contrast, in a royal town, the, the king had much more power to interfere, to intervene in local affairs. This is a, a, a diagram showing the evolution of the signorial regime in Spain. Okay, it's important to, to get some historical background. 
So, so we had the, the vast majority of lordships uh, were originated during the Spanish Reconquest in the Middle Ages. Okay, from uh, 70, uh, 722 to 1492. So these old lordships had important colonizing functions and the lord usually had extensive rights, including land ownership. Okay, after the, the Middle Ages, we, we had the, Hab the Habsburg monarchs and these were involved in many wars in Europe and they were with a chronic need of money and to rise money they also sold towns as a lordship. But in this period, lordship no longer had this colonizing function. The monarchs, the only thing that could uh, sell were the jurisdictions, okay? So the buyer of this new lordship were just buying the jurisdictions, the jurisdictional rights, and the economic value of this was limited. The main reason was to, for, was prestige. For example, to try to become a noble, Okay, or to increase the prestige within the nobility by having more vassals. Okay, then we had a different dynasty, the Bourbon monarchs, and the Bourbons didn't grant any lordship. Okay, so, and my data on lordships comes precisely from this period. From the, uh, I get the data from the Florida Blanca census in 1787, and by, by this time, the um, the economic value of ceremonial privileges and rent was uh, was low, but the law still was the maximum authority within the lordship stands. Okay, so finally, during the liberal reforms in the 19th century, the, the ceremonial regime was abolished. Okay. So we have the institution coming from the Middle Ages and persisting until the 18th 1930s, no, 1930, no, sorry, the 1830s, by the middle of the 19th century. Okay, so the data, this is the data I use. I collect uh, data on, um, on the jurisdictional category of each municipality in 18th century Spain. I use the census of Florida Blanca. The Census of Florida Blanca is a monumental work. The original publication has more than 50,000 manuscript pages, and the modern publication by the Spanish Statistical Office, uh, this was published in the 80s, had more than 60,000 pages. So, and includes institutional socioeconomic data on more than 20,000 population entities in 1787. So I spent uh, a, a long time like, collecting this data on every population entity. And as I say, this include data on the jurisdictional category and also data on the total population and the population classified by job, by job occupation. And I am gonna use this data later. And I also collect data on the initial distribution of lordship in the former kingdom of Granada. We talk about this later. And many, and I also collect many other data. I'm gonna skip this. So well, and here, this is the geographic distribution of lordships in the 18th century in Spain. Okay. Maybe this is not the best combination of colors, but, but, but what? In brown, we have towns under royal jurisdiction, and in blue, we have towns under noble jurisdiction. Okay. And in pink, we have town under military order jurisdiction, and in green, towns under the church, church jurisdiction. As I mentioned above, I am going to compare towns uh, with royal jurisdiction and town with no jurisdiction, okay, the brown and the blue areas. And you can see that, that the, this is a good balance of the territory in a novel and royal jurisdiction. That is, we don't have the con concentration and the concentration of one jurisdiction in one area and then another, okay, other jurisdiction in another area. So a meaningful comparison is feasible here. And here I have the, a table with the distribution of settlements and municipality by the jurisdictional status. Okay, so we have here the, the first columns show the population entities in 1787, and we have that 
43% of population entities were under novel jurisdiction and 36% under royal jurisdiction. Regarding population in 1787, 34% of the population live under novel jurisdiction and 46 under royal jurisdiction. So we can see that we have less population entities with royal jurisdiction, but these, these, these towns are larger. Okay. And considering population and today in 2001, we can see the population growth has been much larger in royal towns and in novel towns. Okay. And moving finally to surface area, we see that the amount of territory covered by both types of jurisdiction is very similar. It's, it's, similar, it's the same, 39%. Okay. So this is a good balance in geographic area and in between both categories of jurisdictions. Then, so um, what I do is in empirical analysis is to compare novel towns with royal towns, okay? Trying to control for every possible confounding factor. So to in this table, I show a balance analysis for lordship. That is how being a lordship town correlates with, with uh, geographic variables. No? Here we have on the the regressors in these regressions are the lordship is a dummy variable equal to one if the town was a lordship in the 18th century. I include regional fixed effects across the board. Okay, regional fixed effect one dummy for from each autonomous community, each one of the 17 regions in Spain. So we see that there is no correlation with altitude. No with ruggedness, neither with soil quality, nor temperature, precipitation, aridity, distant to the coast, distant to the river, distant to Madrid. But however, there is a, a significant correlation with distant to the capital city. Okay, so as you can notice that I am not using the system of asterisks to denote the statistical significance. So it's necessary to compare the coefficient with the standard errors. But I'm gonna tell you which coefficient is significant and which not. So in this case, this coefficient is significant. This means that on average, lordships are farther away from capital cities. Okay. So this means it's very important to control for capital cities done for provincial capital cities. Okay. This is a, there is 50 capital 50 provinces in Spain. So this is this come from each of for the nearest provincial capital city. So then we need to control for distance to the capital city and for capital city dummies. Okay. There is no relationship with pre-medieval settlements and no relationship with distance to Roman roads. Okay. So in this table, I conduct the, um, the regression analysis. The, uh, the dependent variables are, are measure of current uh, economic outcomes. The first column contains income coming from tax return. This is the best, the best proxies for income, but it's only available for municipality larger than 1,000 inhabitants. Okay. For this reason, the number of reservation is still lower. Then I also compute a measure of light density. Another variable is number of vehicles per household. Another variable is percentage of population with secondary or higher education. Another is the average socioeconomic condition of the population, and also I include a, a variable of, of an indicator of long-term population growth in the 20th century as a measure of economic success of the municipality. And we can see that, well, and I include many control variables, as you can see here, altitude, ruggedness, temperature, precipitation, coast dummy, distance to the coast, capital city dummy, distance to the capital city, and a quadratic polynomial in latitude and longitude plus region fixed effects, okay, and including for many control variables, and the coefficient, or oh, this is in log, income in log and light density in log, in logarithm. So lordship is negative and statistically significant here in income, in uh, also negative associated with current light density, with vehicle per household, with education, not with, a, so, uh, with socioeconomic condition is not significant as positive, but and also negatively related with population growth in the 20th century. Okay. And then I conduct many robustness checks here, but I don't have to explain in detail. I'm going to just briefly mention them. 
So I control for, I include province physics text rather than, uh, rather than region physics text. That is, I include 50 dummy, okay, rather than 17. And I include also what well, I guess is the example to municipality with asynchronous data. I include a cubic polynomial in distance to the provincial capital because we saw in the balance next table that distance to the provincial capital was significant. And also related to this, I include a very, uh, very demanding physics effects in distance to the capital city. I include uh, one dummy variable for each kilometer in distance for the capital city. Okay, so one dummy variable for municipalities within zero and one kilometer to the capital city, another dummy for municipality between one and two kilometers, and so on and so forth. And overall, the results are consistent, the negative relationship and remains. I also perform an adjacent municipality analysis that I don't have time to explain, but, um, but the results are consistent here as well. And then once I establish this negative relationship for the whole of Spain, I, I move to analyze the signal regime in Granada. And the reason why I do this is to address endogeneity concerns regarding using data and lordships from the late 18th century. Okay. Uh, it can be argued that the distribution of lordship is initially, initially approximately random. Okay? When the king initially conquered a territory, the king doesn't have good information about the, the territory and then partially grant this territory into novel. And this initial distribution, one can consider is, is approximately random because this lack of information about the economic potential of each place. But since then, since the initial distribution of lordship in the reconquest, there has been a long evolution until the 18th century when I get the data. Transition and, and importantly transition from royal jurisdiction to lordship and vice versa are potentially endogenous. So ideally it would be good to have data on the initial distribution of lordship, no? but for the whole country this is impossible. Okay, this, this happened, uh, the initial distribution happened uh, very far back in time, and, uh, and there's no data. Okay, so the solution that I I came about is to focus on the former kingdom of Granada. Okay, the former kingdom of Granada was conquered in the in 1492, the same time of the discovery of America, and this most recent conquest makes much easier to study and collect data about the initial distribution of lordship. Okay, and there are very good uh, PhD dissertation. Uh, yeah, that focus on, on this. And importantly, for my empirical strategy, most of the Granadian lordships were created right after the conquest. And uh, as I, uh, I'm going to show this now. Um, why these lordships were created? In principle, the, the, monarch, the monarchs uh, don't want to create lordships, no? but the Catholic monarch granted them in compensation for military help during the Granada War and for palace services and financial loan. Okay, so these lordship were all granted, not sold, but granted. So this is Granada within Spain. No? This was the former kingdom of Granada here. And this is the, the evolution of creation of lordships. Okay, here we have the, from 1476 to 1500, we have, the vast majority of lordships were created right after the war. Okay, then there was some new lordships. After after this after this period, these were towns that were sold as a lordship. Okay, but the vast majority were created uh, after the conquest. And I focus only on these old lordships. I call them old lordships, lordships created right after the conquest. Okay, um, which was the crown policy distributing this lordship? This is very important. Which was the crown policy? Well, the crown policy was clear. The main cities were kept as royal jurisdiction. Okay, the capitals, the capital provinces, okay, like Malaga, Granada, Almeria, were kept as royal jurisdiction. Whereas for the rest of the territory, well, the, the land was partially granted to nobles. Okay. 
and beyond the main cities, there was not a clear criterion for the distribution of lordships. Okay, and I put here a couple of quotations from historians, no? and they say in the distribution of lordships, it dominated the ignorance of the Granada geography and the logical confusion produced by foreign toponyms. Okay, and uh, another it is, another quotation: it is legitimate to ask whether there existed any criterion at all in the distribution of lordships. So then, the geographic distribution of lordship was conditionally random, taking into account that the main cities remain royal. For the rest of the territory, there was apparently no criterion. Okay, and here, I do again a balance analysis, but in this case for the Granadian lordships. And again, we can see that both lordships were both lordships not. And that all lordships were very similar to the rest of towns, except for a couple of variables distant to major rivers. All lordships were closer to major rivers, but this is actually a positive picture. Okay, but more concerning is that all lordships were farther away from capitals, from the provincial capital cities. Okay, on average, uh, all lordship was seven. Uh, one, uh, 17 uh, kilometers away from the capital city. So it's very important again to control for capital city damage and for distance to the capital city. Oh. And well, this is the, the baseline say, regression of the paper. And I say the baseline for because focusing on Granada, the measure of lordship is much more exogenous. So it's more credible, this coefficient. So, and again, we see a negative relationship, and in this case, the coefficient are larger, a negative relationship between uh, being a uh, old lordship and current economic outcome. And I, again, do all this uh, robustness check that I summarized above, okay, before. I include province uh, this effects, I include uh, the cubic polynomial in distance to the capital, I include uh, a demanding set of, of fixed effects in distance to the capital city. I also conduct an adjacent municipalities analysis for Granada. Basically, in the adjacent municipalities analysis, I compare uh, each lordship to surrounding royal towns. Okay. And now I have still six minutes to explain the potential mechanism. So I consider four potential mechanisms the destructive character of the institution of the lordships, economic inequality, state capacity, and religiosity. Okay, and the extractive character of the lordship is the first mechanism that comes to mind. Okay, right? One thing that one one tends to think that uh, lordships like that lords oppress the local population, except like uh, uh, collecting uh, taxes and duties. Uh, so, on, so this oppression of the population is related to lower economic development in the long run. So unfortunately, I don't have data yet to measure the extractive character of each lordship. And what I do is, in, is an, an indirect test. So if the negative effect of lordship today is due to its extractive character, then this negative relationship should also be visible in the past when the institution was still in place. So I analyze whether there is a relationship between lordships and living condition in the 18th century. Okay. So for economic inequality, I consider measure of land inequality. Land inequality in the 18th century and land inequality in the 20th century. And I also consider state capacity, and this is this mechanism is based in my reading, in my reading of the literature. Okay, because laws could have undermined the capacity of the central state to intervene and to implement policies in lordship towns. Okay, and these these uh, show up sometimes in the in the in the in the historiography. And for example, I quote here uh, a representative in the Cortes of 1625 that that they that this representative. Now suppose that the one who is talking is a representative in the Cortes of uh, 1625, and he said that was against the set of jurisdiction. Not because of the damage to the vassals, but the damage to the others. 
that is to people in rural towns. Since it is known that conditions are suffered in towns with novel jurisdiction and in rural places, where no one stops abuses of troops and no one tries to reduce taxes, as it happened in novel towns. Okay, where novels use the influence to reduce the burden of villages. Okay, so it's possible. It's possible that that lordships, that the, the lords uh, hinder the the power of the of the central state to apply policy and to and to and to intervene in, in the local town. No? So this the first four columns are indicators of uh, living standards in the 18th century. Okay. So we have the first column, log population in 1787, log population density in 1787, labor force in agriculture in 1787, and labor force in low qualification jobs. And interestingly and surprisingly, initially to me, I found no relationship. So towns that were shortly after the conquest granted to lords were not poorer, according to this indicator, in the 18th century. That is where when the institution was still in place. Okay. In column five and six, I look at measure of land inequality in the, in the 18th century and in the, in the, 19th, in the 20th century. Okay, percentage of land workers and land concentration. And also interestingly, the coefficient is not significant. Actually, it's negative. Okay, so land, land concentration was not higher in all lordships. And here, I, I include three variables related to state capacity. I, so this is uh, the percentage of state-related occupations in 1787. Oops, there. So also a royal employee's dummy in 1787, and also a post office dummy in 1878. And the post office was one of the main public service uh, provided by the central uh, state, no, by this, by that time. And interestingly, we see a negative coefficient. Okay, that all lordship is related with less central state presence in the in this period. So, and finally, I consider religiosity or the role of the church and an additional potential mechanisms. And here I include the percentage of, of labor force that belong to the secular clergy, and also the percentage of the population that belong to the secular and regular clergy. And I don't find uh, any relationship. Okay, here, I think this coefficient is significant, but, but it's not, but it's, it's, it's not, it's not a, a relevant for, to explain the long-term effect as explained in the paper. I don't have, because in principle one, one could think that if the laws, um, the law opposed to the development of the church in the municipality, that can be negative for long term if the role of the church is positive. But, okay, but actually we find a positive relationship. Okay, very briefly, then I this is a, this summarizes the rest of analysis that I do in the paper. So basically, I found a negative relationship between uh, all lordships, towns, and current income. Okay. I also explain the mechanisms. I find a negative relationship with historical central state capacity. And then another resource that I am not going to show uh, indicate that there is a positive relationship between historical central state capacity and current income, a positive relationship in, between historical central state capacity and current state capacity, and also a negative relationship between all lordships and current state capacity. So, all this is consistent with historic with central state capacity as a as a relevant mechanism to explain the the effect of lordship on current income. And finally, just to to elaborate on this, so it is interesting that that the, there is no relationship between lordships and living condition in the 18th century. But however. Lordship was already was already related with less state capacity. This tells us 
or this idea is an evolving role of central state capacity over time. You know? It seems that in the Asian regime, when the central state still didn't play a, a developmental role, the absence of the state was not a problem. But later on, when the central state started to play to provide public goods to the lack of the state present is uh, is detrimental to development. Okay, so I am gonna stop here um, to to receive questions or comments if there are some. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, uh, for this um, exciting presentation with cool data. I could uh, I, I can uh, start with a question and then people you can um, put questions in the in the Q and A. Um, yeah, but let me start. Um, so I'm I'm wondering about this, um, of course, the exogeneity of these. Um, could you imagine us or? A situation where it's the case that the reason why the king would choose to to give off some of his his power is that uh, he has low state capacity in these areas, and and so these um, yeah so I'm so I'm asking a bit about what 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 would be the reason for the king to give away these places because um, if he gives away the the, the places that uh, he he cannot control already. Um, maybe these are the, the more rural places, um, um, and 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 maybe actually the the can you rule out that these laws um, actually had a positive effect on development compared to if they did not uh, exist? Uh, so in a situation where the king just couldn't control these rural areas. Um, and he had nobody to do it, would it then have been actually even worse? Uh, yeah. Okay, so, okay, thanks for for the comment. What uh, note that that the uh, that I focus on the and the for making of Granada it was a, a conquered territory. So the initially the as soon as the king conquered the territory, the king distributed the lordships. So the king didn't have and you know the king didn't uh, as evaluate which territory you were able to control and which not. Okay, so this was like the situation in which the king is having problems in some territory and say, okay, I'm gonna grant this territory to another. This was a, 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 a new incorporation to the kingdom. So and then the, the territory was distributed. Okay, so it's not uh, I think I think actually the next question is very similar to what I'm uh, I'm, I'm trying to get at uh, uh, the question is could you please say a bit more about the emergence of the lordships uh, do you think that the issue of the political institutional conditions underlying the emergence of the lordships could enlighten your results that lordships were less conducive to economic development so I, I didn't uh, hear very well the, the last part of the comment. Yeah, so, so, so the issue is why, why did these lordships emerge in the first place? Uh, well, this is a, a, as a compensation. Well, the reason is, I briefly mentioned in the presentation, this is a compensation for, for military help, for palace services, and for financial loans. So ideally, the, um, the Catholic monarch didn't want to increase the already large power of the mon of the nobility, but they had no they had no 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 alternative. Okay, they had to to pay the to pay back the, the help they received, and they 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 kept the, the larger cities and partially granted the other towns to the to nobles. Okay, without a clear criterion, and, and this is based on my my reading of the historiography that this was not a systematic and uh, a systematic distribution of lordship to that is not the the, the poorer land were granted as a lordship because then you you also need to assume that the lord is not is not gonna be happy if they receive the, the worst land. Okay, so the lord also had bargaining power and also wanted to have good land. So the Okay, so I don't know where 
the, the people who are requesting is happy with the answer, but my, what I can say. All right, let, let's move on to, to another topic. So I was curious, um, um, yeah, so, so I was curious about the, um, the, 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 the church. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so you, you look at the Lords compared to Royal. Have you looked into uh, these other districts that were controlled by the church compared to, to the Royal? Just out of curiosity. No, no, I guess, no, I focus on the, on, on Lordship versus or Noble Towns or Noble jurisdiction versus Royal Town. And I'm, I'm another reason because for Granada, you only have these two uh, types of jurisdiction. Okay, so to make the result comparable between the whole of the whole country and Granada, I just focus on, on these two categories. But this will be interesting to see the, the, the effect of the relationship between church jurisdiction and, and current income. And staying on that topic, so I, I, I didn't really get what uh, you, you dismissed the, the impact of the on the clergy as a, as a mechanism uh, because of something, even though it was significant. What what was that? Well, because because I, I, I was I was very fast through this. Um, it's because in principle thing, because according to my reading of the of the historiography, that in some places the Lord didn't contribute to, to pay to help the church. Okay, for example, okay, so the uh, it was supposed that the Lord uh, the Lord uh, got part of the tithe, okay, and it was supposed that the Lord had to continue to, to maintain churches and to pay to priests and so on, but and it was very common that the Lord refused to do this. Okay, so then I I would expect a negative relationship between lordships and the importance of the church in a municipality okay because of this uh because of, of, of the behavior of lords and then if and then as the constitution is positive rather than negative and then i i rule out this argument okay yes i uh, I, I think oh, there might be a little bit of a mix between what's your theory and what's your empirics. Uh, it seems somehow that you uh, rule out the empirics because it doesn't fit to the theory, or, or, or was that? Um, yeah, basically, basically because of because of this. No, and, and okay, and, and importantly, I am not saying that the only important uh, mechanisms is the is the is just the capacity, okay. Perhaps if you if you analyze more carefully the role of the church, maybe maybe there is something there. But but you know, according to, to what I expected, and, and normally also one do this analysis, one does this analysis, having some uh, you know some uh, intuition or or informal theory, you know, from the from reading of from the reading of the historiography. And in principle the this result because the position is also is only marginally significant, if I remember correctly. So I, I, I didn't I didn't thinking. mean to pick uh, into that. I thought it, I just uh, thought it was interesting. Okay, no then but, uh, thanks. But but uh, thank you for your um, interesting presentation. And so if you uh, Turn off your screen sharing. Uh, Tiani okay. is uh, ready, I can see. Okay, so the, thank you the next the presenter you here, we have, uh, yeah, we have uh, Tanya Wang, who's going to present his uh, research on uh, the black, the impact of the black radio on civil rights. All right. The floor is yours. I hope everyone can see me and hear, hear, hear me well. Yes. Okay. So hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here. And thank you, ASRAC, for organizing this uh, great conference. My name is Tian Yi. Recently, I just began a postdoc at the University of Copenhagen after graduating from the University of Pittsburgh uh, this summer. And this paper is part of my dissertation package that takes a broad look at the political impacts of the media and the information technologies. Thank you again for being here. 
I think I will take roughly more than 20 minutes to present and I will leave uh, plenty of time for people to uh, comment and look forward to hearing anything from you. The civil rights movement is one of the most important breakthrough in American history in terms of racial equality and justice. In the 1950s and 60s, African Americans struggled for greater freedom and equality against legalized racial segregation, disenfranchisement, and discrimination in the Jim Crow South. While the movement was gaining momentum, Black-oriented radio, which was then a new format, and radio stations that aimed specifically at a Black audience were broadcasting across large swaths of the South. It was such an integral part of the Black community that Martin Luther King Jr., speaking about Black radio, mentioned that African Americans during this period were almost totally dependent on radio as their means to relate to, to the society at large. Because television did not speak to their interests and other black media, such as black newspapers and black magazines had much more limited reach to the African community. Historians have also debated about black radio's impacts. While most have noted its wide reach and intimacy to the black community, there has been no consensus on black radio's impacts, mainly because during this period, what we are talking about black radio stations, they were, were truly all owned by whites, especially in the South. And these stations also focused mostly on entertainment such as music. Although other historians have noted that these radio stations also helped spread civil rights messages. So did black radio stations affect the civil rights movement? That's what I asked in this project. In particular, I put together a novel data set to examine black radio's impacts in the civil rights movement. And my focus is on the impacts of black radio on black political participation and empowerment in the South in the early 1960s. For this project, I collected novel data that measure exposure to black radio stations using the predicted signal strength of these stations across all Southern US counties. And for my identification, I exploit plausible exogenous variation in the radio signal strength of these stations as a result of idiosyncratic topographic factors, which I show in my paper to be uncorrelated with a large set of pre-existing county characteristics, such as measures on black households characteristics, as well as pre-existing black political activism, which supports the identification strategy. So just as a preview of the results, in my baseline, I found that black radio facilitated black political participation in the South in the early 1960s, as measured by black voter registration a one standard deviation increase in exposure to black radio is found to increase black voter registration by roughly four percentage points or roughly 14% relative to the mean. And I find consistent evidence looking at the presence of, of NAACP chapters in the South, which was one of the leading civil rights groups in, the, in America. I also explore potential mechanisms using individual survey data, I find suggestive evidence that black radio program likely have increased the reach of civil rights groups, such as the NAACP. It, had, it, it appears to also have crowded out black people's TV consumption. And this is important because during this period, the 50s and 60s, TV has been shown by previous studies to negatively affect people's electoral participation. And therefore a reduction in consumption of TV could have benefited black political participation. In addition, I also find some evidence consistent with the view that black radio likely have provided more positive role models to the black community. In the last part of the paper, I examine the consequences of exposure to black radio. I find that exposure to black radio translated into substantive economic and political gains for the African-American community as measured by an increase in 
state to county transfers, as well as an increase in the legislative support for civil rights bills by Southern congressmen. So this paper contributes to a growing literature on the civil rights movement. Well, previous studies have studied how the major civil rights legislation, such as the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, affected African Americans' economic and political advancement. We still know very little about what have contributed to the success of the movement itself. So in this paper, I evaluate the impact of an important but little studied institution in the black community. And perhaps strikingly, what I find suggests that black radio facilitated black political participation and empowerment even before the arrival of the aforementioned landmark civil rights legislation which underscore the significance of black radio. Moreover, the paper also relates to the literature on media and politics. Well, previous studies have shown that media can incite intergroup animosity and conflict. Few have actually considered media and the potential for media to serve underrepresented minority groups. And related to my work is that of uh, Yoko Okuyama, who studies the empowering effects of women's radio in the post-World War II Japan on the female population. In this paper, I provide a news perspective looking at and showing media serving underprivileged minority, racial minorities can also empower racial minorities in their struggle for equality and justice. So some historical background. So what do we know as black appeal radio stations they emerged largely in the post-World War II America in the late forties. And this was the period when TV came in and drew away many advertisers from radio stations. And as a result, radio station owners had to turn to a previously forgotten audience, the black audience for uh, potential advertising revenues. And that's why they, came, uh, they created many black radio stations after World War II. These radio stations were mostly located in large cities. They were virtually all owned by whites with format targeting a black audience, usually featuring music and other programs of interest to African-Americans. So by 1960, the radio ownership among African-Americans in the South were almost complete. And there were roughly twice as many Southern American, Southern black households would tune into radio than to TV on a typical day during this time. In addition, African-Americans also rated black radio highest in such categories as empathy, honesty, objectivity, and entertainment. So while black radio focused largely on providing entertainment and music, it also actually provided a platform for civil rights activists. And this happened perhaps inadvertently because these white owners of black radio stations, they did not want to alienate their audience, which was predominantly black. So they had to, even though if they personally may not be in favor of civil rights, they had to give, uh, provide a platform to these civil rights activists to speak to their audience. For example, in 1964, roughly 95% of all the NAACP chapters that request airtime from the local black stations were accommodated. And this photo on the slide shows Georgia NAACP president William Boyd speaking on the local Atlantic, At Atlanta station, WERD. So having seen the historical background, let me talk a little bit about the, da the data. So data on black radio stations are not already readily available. So in order to study the, the impacts of black radio stations, I collected normal data on black radio stations from the early sixties from historical archive, mainly from the sponsor magazine, which was the, one of the major advertising trade journal during this period. I also cross-checked the data with other broadcasting publications. So in the end, I arrived at 55 black radio stations across the former Confederate South that were broadcasting 
or devoting at least half of their program to the African American communities. And on average, across these stations, they broadcast roughly 95% of their programming on average for the Black Americans. And crucially, for, uh, for my data, I also collected the location of the station and the detailed technical, trans techni technical information of the transmitters, such as the frequency and the power of the transmitters, which would allow me to use a professional radio software to generate the predicted radio signal strength of black radio stations across counties in the South as a measure of exposure to black radio. So in the following map, we see the locations of the black radio stations, which are shown in yellow dots. Well, here, the darker or the redder the color is, the stronger the signal strength was for black radio. In addition, for my outcome variables, I collected data on county level voter registration by race from 1960, the location of NAACP chapters over time and as control variables, I also collected other county characteristic, characteristics, such as a standard set of socioeconomic characteristics of the county, including a rich set of the uh, characteristic for black residents in the state, in, the, in each county, such as their uh, educational or so socioeconomic characteristics. The county geography, including the county's elevation and ruggedness within each county. And as measures of pre-existing racial attitudes, I also collected data on the 1948 votes, vote share for Strom Thurmond, who was the leading segregationist politician in America during this time period as a measure of support for segregation. And similarly, I, collect, I, I use data for, from historical lynching outcomes. So my empirical objective is to relate exposure to black radio to black political participation. And here, the main concern is that radio stations were not randomly located. In particular, one could be concerned that black radio were perhaps placed in those uh, counties or regions where the local African -American, Americans already had a high political activism. What alleviates this sort of concern some, to some extent is the fact that these black radio stations were virtually all owned by Southern whites, whose primary motive was arguably profits instead of political activism. And therefore, the station location itself is unlikely to be driven intentionally by black political activism. But nonetheless, the signal strength of these stations could still be correlated with other county characteristics that may affect black political uh, activism and these characteristics such as proximity to major city. Therefore, in order to address this endogenous concern, I followed uh, the strategy pioneered by Ben Oaken to exploit plausibly exogenous variation in the radio signal strength resulting from idiosyncratic topographic factors. And to implement this strategy, I follow previous studies to run the following regression. But before I turn to the regression, perhaps this is just a, a thought experiment. So here the thought experiment of this strategy is the following. So we are taking two counties, which were otherwise observationally quite similar, and even of the same distance to a radio station, to a black radio station. So they would have been treated equally, except because of some idiosyncratic topography factors such as mountains or hills, which weakens or diffracts the signal strength along the transmission route, these counties receive different exposure to black radio out of some, something we would think could be more uh, plausibly exogenous. So to formally implement this strategy, I followed previous literature and regressed my outcome of interest in a baseline, which is the share of black voting age population registered to vote in County C in the year of 1960 on black signal, which is the predicted black radio signal strength in that county, while controlling for signal, what I call signal free, which is a hypothetical signal strength or counterfactual signal of the station in the scenario when the earth is entirely smooth. 
So to understand what this is, just imagine a hypothetical world where there's no mountains or hills, everything is entirely smooth, the earth is smooth. Imagine that world and the signal strength of the signal strength in that world is basically signal free or free space signal. So what signal free does is it, con it considers all other factors that affects the signal strength except topography. Therefore, by controlling for it, beta is identified from the residual variation in radio signal strength that's due to topography only, which is arguably exogenous. And I also include pre-existing county characteristics such as the ge local geography, social economic measures, and pre-existing racial attitudes and past black activism, measures of past black activism. I also include the fixed effects of state economic areas. So state economic, state economic areas was introduced in the 1950 census. It is, it is sub-state geographic level within each state that groups together neighboring counties that share homogeneous economic characteristics. So each state economic area is a force within each state. And uh, in total in the South, there are roughly 110 uh, state economic areas in this period. So basically I will be comparing counties that were neighboring each other and similar to each other within the same state. And I cluster my standard error in the baseline at station level, although I also show the robustness to other alternative uh, ways to cluster that errors. And uh, for the ease of interpretation, I standardize my uh, signal variable to have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So here, the identification assumption is that when it's residualized, the residual variation in signal due to topography is plausibly exogenous. So to provide some support for this identification assumption, I do a balance test looking at what determines the signal strength. So here we can um, look at the left panel first, which is which is the from which is estimates from a single regression when I write when I run uh, black radio signal strength on all these pre-existing county characteristics, including a very rich set of black uh, households or black uh, educational socioeconomic measures as well as church membership and other county characteristics. And we see that although many characteristics are balanced, there are a few characteristics which are not. So in the second panel, I added one more variable, which is signal free, which is the free space signal with, in order to isolate or, read, or exploit the residual variation in signal due to topography. So once controlling for signal free, we see that across these more than 20 characteristics, exposure to black radio appear to be all to be largely balanced and uh, statistically insignificant, insignificant from zero, which provides support for the idea that topography variation is likely to be idiosyncratic. In addition, I also present a placebo test looking at past racial attitudes and uh, black activism. So that includes uh, outcomes such as the vote share for Strom Thurmond and the lynching outcomes before 1930. And as measures of black political activism in the past, I look at the presence of NAACP chapter in the county as well as the membership of NAACP in 1942. And across these different placebo outcomes, I do not find any effect from exposure to black radio. Again, supporting the conditional exogeny assumption of my identification strategy. So here comes the baseline results. So the outcome in this table is the share of black voting age population registered to vote in, count in, in each county in 1960. So in the first column, I include only state economic area fixed effects and the free space signal. And in subsequent columns, I added county's own geography, which is the elevation and ruggedness of the county itself, county's socioeconomic characteristic, both overall and by race, and past racial attitudes and activism, which we just saw in the previous slide. And across these different specifications, the results are robust, suggesting 
a positive and statistically significant effect of exposure to black radio on black voter registration. And in the last column, I further weight my regression by the county's black population in order to improve the precision of my estimates. This is because the measure, my outcome measure, which is black population uh, registered to vote is likely to have greater measurement error in counties with fewer black people. And therefore, I weight my regression to address this sort of uh, heterogeneity uh, problems. And therefore, in the last column, I see that a one standard deviation increase in black radio exposure increased black voter registration by roughly four percentage points or roughly 14% of the mean. So while this table shows the voting outcome, here I examine an alternative outcome, a measures of black activism, which is the presence of NAACP chapter within the county. Here, I can look at uh, the outcome over time. And especially we see that as placebo outcomes in the period before the introduction of black radio, we see that exposure to black radio in the later period is not correlated with an earlier presence of NAACP. Well, in 1964, which is at the peak of the civil rights movement, we see that black, black uh, radio is actually, exposure is actually, has a significant and positive effect on the presence, presence of NAACP in the county. And the results also hold if I control for the control for whether the county had a NAACP chapter in 1942. Therefore, only looking at within county change over time. So, so far we have seen the baseline results showing exposure to black radio have contributed to or facilitated black political activism and participation. One natural concern is that Black radio could be correlated with other radio or TV, for example, or other media, which may also affect uh, the same outcomes. And therefore, I checked, I done a robustness check to see that the results are actually also similar, even if I control for exposure to other types of media, such as non-black radio stations, which were other radio stations that, were, that did not carry a black program, TV stations, including all three major networks, and access to black newspapers. So as shown in this table, in the first column, again, this, just for comparison, we see, uh, we show the baseline result and in subsequent columns, I added controls for the exposure to these alternative competing media sources. And we see that even if I control for all these, uh, the exposure to other medias, we still detect a robust and similar magnitude for, for for the effect on black radio stations. And this suggests that black radio likely had an independent and unique effect on black voter registration. In addition, I can show that results are also robust to excluding major cities or their surrounding regions. So I will be focusing only on the smaller counties which were further away from these uh, black stations and these smaller counties with fewer African Americans were more likely to be ex exposed to black radio due to more exogenous reasons. Um, and I showed the results are robust to that as well. And in addition, I can show uh, also some heterog heterogeneity analysis. I find, if anything, the effects were smaller in counties uh, with a greater support for, for segregation as measured by the 1948 uh, vote share for Strom Thurmond, the leading segregationist politician. So having uh, seen the baseline results, I also provide some evidence on potential mechanisms using individual survey data. Uh, this data measure quite detailed uh, outcomes on South Black adults' attitudes and behaviors. However, a caveat of this data is that it only includes 18 counties in the South. And uh, so I interpret the results here only as suggestive evidence. But nonetheless, I find some evidence uh, suggesting that exposure to black radio is also associated with a greater uh, familiarity with and support for the NAACP. And this idea is consistent with the view that black radio likely to like, likely have provided, uh, likely to have uh, increased the reach of civil rights groups by providing a platform for these groups. 
In addition, as mentioned earlier, I also find that more exposed uh, black households also tend to watch less TV as a result, which could also uh, potentially benefit their, their civic mindedness and political participation. Because again, previous studies show the negative effect of TV on electoral participation. And lastly, I also find evidence suggesting that Black Radio also have uh, provided positive role models to African Americans, especially um, uh, from the results that I find more exposed African Americans were, were less likely to hold racial stereotypes. And this is perhaps uh, possibly be the positive role model effects are from the Black Radio, which broke down their pre-existing perceptions of themselves or um, the white Americans. So in the later last part of the paper, I explore the consequences of exposure to Black Radio. In particular, I explore Black Radio's impacts on Black political power. So here I focus on the interactive effects between signal, which is the same as my baseline, with a measure of the population share of uh, Black residents in the county. So here the idea is that Black radio could have a larger effect in counties with a larger share of African Americans. And in particular, I follow previous studies and look at uh, the outcomes such as state to county aid transfers as a measure of uh, the, the, the county's um, redistribution. And also I look at Southern congressmen's voting records on civil rights bills. So, so here we would expect if, so if black radio increased black political power, we should expect, we should expect to find a positive uh, coefficient on this interactive effect, which would mean that in those counties with more black residents and more exposed to black radio, there has led to a greater redistribution of state resources to the county and also greater support by their congressmen on civil rights matters. So this table shows the first results looking at the per capita state aid transfers in 1962. I find that in counties with a large share of black residents, a one standard, one standard deviation increase in black radio station roughly increased the transfer per capita by 7%. And here, so black is a dummy variable that equal to one if the state, if the county was in the top quartile of the black population share distribution. And the results are also similar if I look at non-locked outcomes. So in this figure, I look at the voting records on Southern congressmen uh, on civil rights bills. So here, the outcome is a measure of the conservativeness of their votes on civil rights bills. So here, again, it shows the coefficient on the interactive effect and a reduction or a negative coefficient would mean a reduction in conservativeness of voting, which means an increase in the support for civil rights matters. And what we find is that after the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1964, which granted suffrage to uh, African-Americans in counties, more in counties with a greater share of African-Americans, exposure to black radio led to a reduction in the conservativeness of Southern congressmen. So they were more supportive of civil rights bills after their constituency could, uh, could vote. And uh, also they, they were more exposed to black radio, which perhaps have increased their political activism as a result. So in conclusion, in this paper, I find that uh, a study uh, important but little explored institution in the black community during the civil rights era. I find that black radio facilitated black political participation in the South during the civil rights era. One standard deviation increase in the exposure to black radio increased uh, black voter registration by four percentage points or 14% of the mean and also increased the presence of NAACP chapters. I provide evidence that Black Radio also translated into substantive economic and political benefits for the African American community, uh, as examined from state aid transfers and also greater legislative support for civil rights bills. And intriguingly, and uh, uh, 
I find that most of these effects actually took place even before the passage of landmark civil rights legislation, which highlight the significance of black radio to the black community during the civil rights era. That's all uh, for my presentation. Thank you, everyone. And I look forward to hearing any comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, very convincing uh, presentation. I can see that there are some questions in, in the chat and the question and answer. So I'll uh, not say anything, but just read up here. Um, so one question is, in the map, we see that the strong radio signal areas are mostly around the stations. Mm -hmm. If the white owners were willing to provide their stations to blacks, is it a sig signal that the local attitudes to blacks could be relatively more friendly? Even though the station locations might not be related to black activism, could, could it be that the local attitudes to blacks correlated with the increase in political participation of blacks? So here, uh, if I get, get a question correctly, I believe it's a question on whether the the state, the state, the county that housed the station were, could be more friendly towards African-Americans. Yeah. I yeah, so that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we could be concerned about that. Uh, and exactly because of that, I actually can show, uh, first, first thing, a control for pre-existing county level racial attitudes, looking at past vote share for Strom Thurmond, the segregationist politician, as well as past lynching outcomes. So first, these are already included in my, all my regressions. And uh, secondly, I can also show the results are robust, even if I drop these counties, to so drop the counties that had a radio station or even the surrounding areas, the 50 miles radius out of that. So even if I focus on counties that were far away, which were less likely to be targeted by these stations, the results are still robust. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, Jared, Jared has a question. Yes, thanks, Tianyi, for another great presentation. Um, Hi, Jared. My question builds off of that previous one. Um, it strikes me that your identification should really be coming from those places that are further away from the signal. Like it's a, you know, 50, 50 miles east of the, the, the signal gets, gets it for some random reason, or maybe there's no hill, whereas 50, you know, 50 miles west, it doesn't get it. And that's the identification. Um, so I was wondering why you have that as a robustness check rather than as your main specification. Because if we think that there might be a prop, because I, I just don't see why, you know, places right around that signal, you're, you're, you don't have massive endogeneity concerns. Um, because those signals are placed there for a reason. You know, it's generally going to be around population centers. And within a few miles of that, you're not really, you know, no matter what the topography is, it's not really going to be um, writing it. So I, and, and when I say that, I mean, I think that, you know, all these other things that you show later on, like, you know, political power, things like that, I'd like to see that with the, the everything within a certain radius of the signal dropped. Um, okay. And okay. also on that, on that note, on that last note too, I, I never recommend this, but this also, this seems like the type of thing that's right for a matching exercise. Mm -hmm. you, you look at, you look at counties that are other similar or otherwise, except for one, one gets a signal and one doesn't. Thank you so much, Jared. Those are great suggestions. Uh, yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think I agree with you that counties closer to the station are more likely to be targeted. Uh, um, so if we, if we think like the station owner may have some sympathy towards uh, African-Americans, so it would make sense to drop these counties. So definitely I, I, can do, I can do that. Um, I can do more of those in the later, for the later outcomes as well, uh, just to, to make sure that the, the, result, the, the, the variation could be more exogenous. Um, and uh, so, and also secondly, I, um, I, I agree with you that the matching exercise would be a wonderful thing to pursue. I haven't had a chance to do it in this project, but uh, I definitely would love to put this on my agenda next to compare, for example, counties, uh, which were otherwise matched very similarly. Yeah, thank you for the wonderful suggestion. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. And then we have a question yeah. by Jonathan. Hey, Tianyi. Um, 
great presentation. I... Really, really like the paper. Um, and I, I just wanted to ask you a couple of quick things. The, the first one is that I saw um, another paper evaluating the effect of uh, the freedom rights and the freedom writers on, on uh, these same uh, type of uh, outcomes. So I was, um, and that seems to potentially be correlated also with the topography of, of the region, right? Because, you know, like it, it's, it's a buzz going up and down hills and potentially that, that can be selected uh, in, in certain ways. So you, you might see the, the, the bus going and routes where um, um, the, the area would be flatter and wouldn't be as mm -hmm. interrupted. So I, I was wondering if, if you've thought about like maybe including uh, controls mm -hmm. uh, related to, to the freedom rights. And then the other question was on, on the, the uh, specifications where you included uh, TV and, and newspapers, were, uh, were they also TV and newspapers uh, like focused on, on uh, uh, content that was consumed by uh, uh, black uh, consumers uh, or, or was it in, in general? Um, mm -hmm. And I was wondering just because of like the role of competition in these results, I don't mm -hmm. know what, what your take is on that, thanks. I think Jonathan, great suggestions. Yeah, definitely agree with you. Um, so I'd love to include this additional control for uh, for the freedom rights in my in my specification, I think that will be um, make that will, that will show my results are more robust. Uh, but uh, so I definitely I'm working on that as well. But uh, just one one thing perhaps worth mentioning is that I think the freedom rights ha actually happened in 1961, mostly 1961. But my baseline results were actually before that. So, but I, I agree with you for the later outcomes, it will be a good control. Definitely, I will work on that for sure. Thank you. Yeah. And for the second uh, uh, great suggestion, great question on the on the TV and other media, so these media and uh, uh, they, they were general in nature, so they were not particularly African American TV or uh, radio stations. And uh, so I was comparing to see whether black radio had a unique effect on that versus other more general media types. Yeah, but the the one of the one of the other controls is the newspaper. That's a black newspaper. So. So that's a more uh, uh, black specific media. Yeah, so I hope I answered that, your question. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. I'll just kick in one uh, last comment. I don't think we have others in the chat. Um, so another idea of an outcome, um, I was thinking like in, well, in inequality or polarization, and, and I actually imagine that it might be, could go both ways if, if uh, Blacks gain more civil rights. Could we then also have that the people against blacks would actually uh, um, go in the other direction? Mm. Uh, so, so increased polarization uh, mm. and, and inequality between black and white. Uh, and okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely agree with you. I think. Uh, uh, so there could be some anti-black um, antagonism that's triggered by exposure to black radio. And I agree with you, I think that could even have some backlash. So um, if we see this graph, interestingly, we see in 1963, which was the period when African-Americans were, were very actively pushing for civil rights, we see that in, these, uh, in the counties more exposed to black radio, indeed, we actually observe an increase in the conservativeness of voting of the local Congress in the district, which could be a result of the backlash uh, or um, polarization. But I agree with that. That could be also an interesting outcome in addition um, to measure. I've definitely think more about how to measure that polarization, uh, which I think is a, is a great addition to the paper. Thank you so much, Janet. Thank you very much. Maybe a last very quick yeah. comment mm -hmm. from Dan Hungerman. Uh, maybe not, no time for a response. I don't know. Yeah, please, Let's see. please. Uh, very Dan, quick yeah, please. from Dan. Yeah, I'll, please, be, uh, I'll, be, I'll be quick um, and maybe I'll email you because I have a And maybe you can stop your screen sharing, Tianyi, and then... Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just Start one, one quick comment is okay. I'd be really curious how expensive these radio stations are. Your effects are really large and, um, uh, you know, I, I would like to know how how big an effect you're getting for the dollars that these radio stations uh, are, are commanding. Mm. So 
they're doing more than just, of course, encouraging uh, voting turnout. They're entertaining people and mm -hmm. all of that. But, but your effects are so big, it'd be interesting to see how um, how expensive these radio stations are for the social impact they have. It's a wonderful suggestion. Thank you so much, Dan. I've definitely looked into the cost and the price uh, of, of this station and maybe do some uh, back of the envelope calculation, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, to find quite thank, you thank, so you. thank you so much for this uh, great thank presentation. Great comments, everyone. And, uh, thank you, really appreciate it. And next one up is, is Christine on, on the impact of uh, vernacular languages on, uh, on development. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So thanks uh, all for joining uh, the session. And thanks uh, for the organizers. Um, for having uh, our paper and for giving us the opportunity to present. Uh, so I'm presenting joint work with Andreas Link and Rajesh Ramachandran, and the title is Vernacularization and Linguistic Democratization. Okay, so in many states, both past and present, there has been a disconnect between the language used in written and formal contexts, for example, in the domains of public administration, education, law, and politics, and the variety spoken on a day-to-day -day basis. Examples include Latin in early modern Europe and standard Arabic in the Arabic-speaking world, both past and present. In this paper, we first um, provide a conceptual framework to explain why such a linguistic uh, situation, often referred to as the glossia, has been a stable hallmark of many societies over extended periods of time, often centuries, despite the costs it potentially generates for non-elites and for society more generally, given the general population's inability to speak or write in the elite language. To empirically assess the validity and implications of our framework, we then study perhaps the most important historical event that promoted the use of the vernacular, the Protestant Reformation of 1517. Um, today, there has been no detailed analysis and quantitative account of how when vernacularization, that is the increased use of the common tongues, the vernaculars in writing, occurred and its consequences. In what follows, I'll brief, I will first briefly sketch out our conceptual framework. I will then introduce our main uh, data sources. Uh, we'll then present our empirical strategy before turning to our uh, main results. So our uh, conceptual framework takes as a starting point uh, the classic linguistic situation. Um, and the key benefit of such a situation of retaining the elite language is that it eases the understanding across a large geographic area with numerous low varieties. So in the case of Latin, it facilitated, for example, the mobility among students and university lecturers across Europe. However, retaining an elite language potentially implies substantial costs for the vast majority of the population, the non-elites, when it comes to communication, knowledge acquisition and production, and political engagement. So in light of the costs associated with the, the classic linguistic situation, we identify based on the literature, um, three types of barriers to vernacularization. The first barrier is economic as writing and printing in the vernacular requires the development of a written form, including language standardization and development of grammars and dictionaries. So in the case of Europe, this process took uh, several centuries. The second barrier is social, as writing in the vernacular is often perceived as being of lower quality and associated with lower esteem compared to the elite language. And finally, um, the third barrier is political, as knowledge of the language of societal institutions is restricted to a small minority who can leverage their privileged status to dominate the population and extract rents. In few of these barriers, we can expect investment in the standardization of common tongues to rise when the cost of the glossier increase or when the barriers to vernacularization decline. We argue in the paper that an important consequence of the Reformation was the shift towards the production of vernacular texts, uh, tax, which significantly reduced the economic, social, and political barriers to vernacularization. So Mar Martin Luther, whose uh, 95 uh, thesis marked the beginning of the Reformation, deliberately chose to write many of his pamphlets and books in German rather than in Latin, and he translated the Bible into German in 1522. It's actually well documented uh, that he put tremendous effort in developing the German language over uh, regional dialects. And he did so for uh, several reasons. Um, so he wanted, he and his followers 
aimed at reaching the widest possible audience, and he wanted lay people to be able to read and to understand the Bible, so to engage with the, the text. Okay, to study changes in printing output over time, we've drawn several data sources. Our main data source is the Universal Short Title Catalog, uh, which has been used by now in several other papers. It's a database with all printed books and pamphlets after the invention of the printing press around 1450 to 1600 uh, in Europe. We use uh, language information to distinguish between works printed in Latin and works printed in the vernacular. We use subject classification information um, provided by USCC to distinguish between religious and non-religious works. We aggregate the USCC by printing place or by city in order to merge it with uh, available city level characteristics, mostly taken uh, from Rubin and also with available city population figures. For, our, uh, for most analysis, we restrict our sample to cities that had some printing output um, over this time period. So to cities that had adopted the, the printing press by 1600. Drawing on the USCC, so just on the raw data, um, and this figure um, shows two things. So first it illustrates that um, the number of titles printed in the vernacular indicated with a dark line here, um, surpassed the number of works printed in Latin by the end of the 16th century. So we see this uh, here. And further, as we also document more formally in the paper, uh, there was a sharp increase in the production of vernacular texts at the time of the Reformation, which is indicated uh, by this vertical line here. To estimate the effect of the Reformation on vernacularization, uh, we estimate the following difference in differences models, similar in spirit to Cantoni et al. 2018, um, where y is the natural log of one plus the number of religious or non-religious vernacular works in city I in time period T. Prot uh, 1600 is a dummy variable equal to one if the printing city was Protestant by 1600 and zero otherwise. Uh, phi T are period dummies uh, with the omitted period being 1500 to 1519. So we aggregate printing output over 20 year intervals um, as early on few cities had a printing press so early on uh, printing output is uh, zero or very low for uh, many cities in our sample. Uh, Delta I are a set of city fixed effects and we cluster standard errors at the ter territory times period level. Our coefficients uh, of interest are the beta uh, T's here, uh, which measure the difference in vernacular output in eventually Protestant printing cities compared to uh, Catholic ones relative to the omitted period 1500 to 1519. The key identifying assumption um, for our difference and differences approach is that in the absence of the Protestant Reformation, eventually Protestant printing cities and Catholic ones would have experienced similar changes in the production of religious or non-religious vernacular texts over time. Major concern here is that rather than reflecting a response to a shock on the supply side, the adoption of Protestantism was endogenous, reflecting changes on the demand side. So cities with a preference for using the vernaculars were more likely to adopt Protestantism, potentially more likely to adopt Protestantism. So in the paper, uh, we do several things and I'm happy to um, speak more about that as part of the Q&A. So uh, we, the data uh, luckily allows to examine pre-trends, um, we assess the robustness of our main results. So we drop um, certain cities from the sample. So we remove the top 10 printing cities. We remove cities within 200 kilometers uh, distance from Wittenberg. So where Luther uh, worked, we restrict the sample to cities located in the de facto Holy Roman Empire, as this is kind of where most of the variation comes from. And we also include additional control. So we um, include geographic and historical time. We also examine vernacular printing output in major fields outside religion rather than aggregate non-religious vernacular output. And as I'll also show later on, we we'll provide evidence for the underlying mechanism. So we provide evidence for the existence of uh, economic and political barriers to vernacularization. Overall, our results um, lend credibility to our identification strategy. 
Okay, let's take a look at the results. So I'll first, um, I'll first um, talk about changes in religious vernacular printing and then um, look uh, or move uh, to uh, changes in non-religious vernacular printing. And I'll always first show um, essentially descriptive uh, the pattern in our data and then show you the different differences estimates. So, um, so this figure shows or plots the total number of religious vernacular works in a city per 1000 citizens in 1500 aver averaged across Catholic cities uh, in gray and uh, eventually Protestant cities uh, indicated by the dark line. And it illustrates or what we can see here is that uh, there was a, a huge surge in religious uh, works printed in the vernacular uh, in Protestant cities immediately after the Reformation. In Catholic cities, we see a little happening around uh, the time of the Protestant Reformation. Um, religious vernacular works um, increase or were printed in uh, increasing numbers only later in the 16th century. Our difference and differences estimates on the interactions between the Protestant dummy and the various 20 year um, period dummies, uh, which we see on the um, left hand side here in panel A, uh, confirm the differential increase in religious vernacular works across Protestant and Catholic uh, cities relative to 1500 to 1519. So our omitted period for the first two 20 year um, periods following the Reformation. After 1560, um, differences in religious vernacular output fall back to pre-Reformation differences. Instead, what we observe is as a strong increase, secular increase in religious vernacular output. So uh, across both Protestant and Catholic um, cities. And in the paper, we discuss a potential explanation uh, for this pattern. Okay, now turning to uh, non-religious works in the vernacular. Um, so here it seems that um, outside the religious realm, uh, printing increased uh, in both Protestant and Catholic cities with perhaps some minor differences early on after the Protestant Reformation. When looking at our difference and differences estimates, um, we see that um, there was no uh, differential effect following the Reformation. Instead, what we see, especially uh, later on, uh, towards the end of the or second half of the 16th century, that there's a secular, a strong secular increase um, in uh, religious printing in the vernacular. And we see this both. So here we look at the aggregate level. So we uh, lump all, um, so any works outside religion, we lump together, but we find um, the same pattern uh, if we look at major fields outside religion. So the, these are listed here. Uh, at the top, we see the coefficient estimate we had before on religious, uh, so for when we look at religious vernacular works. And what we see here is just the first, um, uh, the, the coefficient estimate on the first interaction term, so interacting um, the eventual Protestant dummy with the first 20 year time period following the Reformation. So whereas religious vernacular output increased by over 40% in Protestant cities relative to Catholic ones, the first 20 year period following the Reformation compared to our omitted um, um, period or category, we find much smaller and statistically insignificant effects outside religion. This is consistent with uh, the idea that changes in vernacular printing following the Reformation were driven by the reformers who used the vernacular in their writing, thereby reducing the various barriers to vernacularization in all fields. That this increase in vernacular printing came at the expense of Latin printing can be illustrated in this table. So here we show non-religious printing output in the 10 largest Protestant and in the 10 largest Catholic cities. Uh, we see here um, that non-religious um, Latin printing output uh, hardly increased from the pre-Reformation to the post-Reformation period. So this is uh, shown in this column here. Uh, while over the same time period, we see a significant increase in non-religious vernacular printing indicated here. So, and we hardly see differences across uh, Protestant and Catholic cities. So 
uh, the last line always uh, shows the total. So for both Catholic and Protestant cities, and here we see a huge increase um, following the Reformation, while we see essentially a drop uh, compared to changes before uh, the Reformation. And towards the end of the century, these 20 cities produced significantly fewer works in Latin than in the vernacular. So here in this column, we see total output for the last 20 year period. And we observe that uh, works in Latin um, outside the field of religion, uh, or there are a lot less um, works in Latin outside the field of religion compared to works in the vernacular. Okay, we, um, in the paper, we then uh, provide some evidence uh, for the existence of economic and political barriers to vernacularization. So here, we first look at economic barriers to vernacularization. Um, we, um, or the idea here is that Luther's printing particularly eased language standardization among German dialects that were close to the dialect of Wittenberg. Um, to look at this, we restrict our analysis to German speaking cities that had some printing output over this time period and that turned Protestant by 1600. And then we draw on data provided uh, by Falk et al. 2012 uh, in order to classify Protestant cities as having either a low linguistic distance or a high linguistic distance where low linguistic distance is defined or um, as cities with a, uh, that have a low linguistic distance are those uh, that have a linguistic similarity to the dialect of Wittenberg uh, at the 50th percentile or higher and the remainder is classified as having a low, uh, as having a high linguistic distance. So there's some caveat to this because the data is based uh, or, or taken um, from a language survey um, from uh, the late 19th century. Okay. But doing so, at least we find uh, evidence, evidence that is consistent with the existence and, um, of significant economic barriers to vernacularization. So here we see um, on the left-hand side um, the, the differential effect for low versus high linguistic distance cities uh, when we look at religious works in the vernacular. And on the right-hand side, uh, we see uh, the same when looking at non-religious works in the vernacular. And for both, we actually um, observe these differences based on cities' um, linguistic distance to Wittenberg. We also uh, examine potential political barriers to vernacularization. So here we look at Catholic cities and we um, look at cities that are exposed to greater competition in the market for religion. Um, and we those that experience a stronger uh, and, and uh, expect that those um, exposed to greater competition in the market for religion um, experience stronger increase in vernacular printing output as compared to Catholic cities located further away. This analysis is similar in spirit to uh, um, the analysis presented in Cantoni et al. 2018. So here we classify Catholic cities as high competition cities if they have at least one eventually Protestant cities in their vicinity and the remainder is classified as low competition cities. And uh, here we restrict our sample to the uh, de facto Holy Roman Empire as uh, most variation comes from there. And uh, here again, we provide some, or we find some evidence for the existence of political barriers uh, to vernacularization. So at least in, uh, immediately after the Reformation, we see a differential effect um, when looking at both um, religious and non-religious uh, works printed in the vernacular. So then uh, we look at the consequences of vernacularization. So we hypothesize that the use of the spoken tongues allows broader segments of society to acquire knowledge and to participate in knowledge creation. So the switch from Latin to the vernacular that we documented uh, before directly implies increased access to knowledge given the general population's inability to speak or write in the elite uh, language. To assess the impact on knowledge creation, what we do in the paper is we examine whether the composition of authors and book content became more diverse following uh, the Reformation. Okay, okay to do so, uh, we collect background information on all authors with 50 or more titles in the USTC. And we were successful in doing so for nearly 50% of authors. We then classify authors 
as high socioeconomic background as having a high socioeconomic background if their family was noble if they were literate in latin the parents were university educated or if their fathers were churchmen otherwise they're classified as low so as having a low socioeconomic background and using this definition um 71 percent of authors are classified as having a high socioeconomic background um, alternatively, we also include authors with, with uh, missing information, and we uh, classify these authors then also as having a low socioeconomic background, based on the assumption that since we didn't find any information about these authors, uh, they presumably uh, did not come, or they, they presumably have a low socioeconomic background. Okay, so we uh, use the same different differences approach as before. Uh, just that now uh, the dependent variable is the natural log of one plus the total number of a city's vernacular works from authors with a low socioeconomic background. And this is what we find. So on the left-hand side, again, we see the difference in differences estimates on the interaction terms. And on the right-hand side, we see the estimates on the uh, period dummies. Um, so what we find here is um, a strong differential increase in the number of vernacular works from authors with a low socioeconomic background, particularly in the first uh, two 20 year periods following the Reformation. After 1560, uh, there seems to have been a general increase in works from authors uh, from low socioeconomic background, so um, in both Protestant and Catholic cities. We then look at uh, diversity uh, of book content. So now the dependent variable is the total number of a city subject classification. So based on information the USCC provides in total, there are over 30 subject classifications. So we count the number of subject classifications for vernacular works. And as hypothesized, we observe a differential increase in the diversity of book content immediately after the Reformation. Okay. So then um, having documented uh, the more immediate perhaps consequences of vernacularization, uh, we then turn to indicators of longer run uh, development. We show that uh, cities vernacular but not Latin printing output is positively correlated with future city population growth. So in the 16s and 70s, or 1500 to 1600 and 15 to 1700, it is not correlated with city population growth in the preceding century. So before the invention of the printing press, and the correlation, so this positive correlation is driven by non-religious vernacular printing output rather than religious vernacular printing output. We then uh, also uh, consider um, as outcome the future birth of famous individuals. And we find that cities non-religious vernacular printing output is positively correlated with future birth of famous individuals, which, is, uh, which has been used as a proxy for upper tail human capital. And uh, we find this positive correlation both in the cross section and in a panel of cities over uh, six 30 year periods. Okay, so to conclude in this paper, we uh, develop a conceptual framework to understand the persistence of the glossia. Uh, language um, may be seen as one mechanism through which religious elites exercising political power may influence longer run development. To empirically test the validity and implications of our framework, we explore a unique historical event, the Protestant Reformation of 1517. We show that the Reformation increased vernacular printing output also outside the religious realm and beyond Protestant cities. Um, this also implies or is one reason why it's uh, diffi presumably difficult to empirically identify the causal effect of Protestantism on long run development, uh, something Cantonero also discuss uh, in their work on secularization. Uh, we provide evidence for economic and for significant economic and political barriers to vernacularization. We then turn to potential costs of a diglossic linguistic situation. We show that authorship, composition, and book content became more diverse following the Reformation. And then finally, non-religious vernacular printing output is a key correlate of subsequent city growth and upper tail human capital. So just to emphasize at the end, uh, we think, uh, or we, we try to argue that Latin Europe is not a linguistic outlier. So for the larger part of the first millennium until the early centuries of the second millennium, Sanskrit, a high variety was the language of the royal courts and literary culture across large swathes uh, of Asia. 
in Diglossia is, for example, also still the prevalent linguistic situation of the Arabic speaking world in China. So the use of a well understood language for societal organization may help explain the rise of the West as well as the long divergence uh, between Europe and the Middle East. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, bit early. I think I finished a bit early. So, but uh, yeah. Oh, this is excellent. You have lots of questions. Uh, this is a very fascinating okay. work, Christine. I will um, pick some, oh, I'll take the, the questions in a row. So um, first we have a question from uh, Robert Barrow who asks, how, how, do you, how do you distinguish between your results and, and this effect, this more general effect of uh, the, the optimal number of languages? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and he points out the work by Lazier in the, in the 90s on this optimal number of languages. Uh, should I first take several questions or should I go one by one? Let's take one by one. Okay, okay, sounds good. So um, yeah, good question. There's also the work on, on language standardization and that um, and that, that was important for, for the industrial revolution. So I guess what Luther did is he, he managed to develop language at a, um, at a in, intermediate level, so to speak. So uh, beyond these um, dialects, um, that we observe or that that were very common back then and uh, a language that is perhaps too far away then again from uh, these uh, dialects so Luther aimed at and and he was really uh, he was relatively successful um, at developing um, uh, or yeah developing the language itself he made tremendous effort in that but he wasn't successful in the sense that for example the bible later on was translated again um, to reach other parts of germany uh, whose dialect was too different from uh, the language that luther developed so yeah i think i can't give a definite answer um, um, on this um, I don't know yeah. if there's a. Yeah. Let's uh, take the next question. So, have you? Uh, this is from Marco Sierra. Have you considered looking at Eastern Orthodox churches where there was not a strong inclination against translating the Bible in the vernacular? And in fact, several alphabets, Armenian and Cyrillic, not notably were created in order to translate the Bible into the vernacular. Okay, good idea. We haven't done, we haven't done so. Cool. Then we actually, um, now let's take, um, we had Jared in the, in the chat who had uh, a question. Uh, Jared, do you wanna say out loud, loud your question? Sure. Uh, so, my, uh, yeah, so I'm having, still having a little trouble with the identification assumption. You say that okay. in the absence of the Reformation, eventual, eventually Protestant printing cities and Catholic ones would have experienced similar changes in the production of vernacular texts. You know, if, Towards um, the end of the century, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, the, the, what I think it's what what's the counterfactual here is what I'm trying to wrap my head around because I mean, you know, beyond my work, you know, there's a long historiography of you know, the, the printing press kind of contributing to the success of the Reformation. So if, if we didn't have the Reformation, eventually we would have gotten uh, probably some translation to the vernacular. I mean, even let's just say Luther, it stays as a professor. He doesn't start, start the Reformation, but he wants to translate the Bible into German. The, your analysis would seem to suggest that it was the Reformation that mattered but if we can imagine the world where eventually you get a, a vernacularization is are these cities that eventually adopted protestantism or am i right to think that your assumption is that they were not would all else equal would not have been more likely to print these works even though they were much more likely to have printing presses in the first place yeah at least that's uh, what we find so we try to uh, get at this and we try to look at differences in vernacular printing for so maybe this um wait i can perhaps take uh, go to the paper where i have the figure on 
Uh, maybe that helps. So what we here do is we look at, so one concern is that certain cities that want to use the vernacular then adopt it, right? I think that's your concern that it's not kind of this exogenous shock, but it's, there's some self-selection to Protestantism um, by that. We, we, we don't really find it. So in terms of, um, so here we look at, so we don't find it if we look at total non-religious output, and we also don't find it here if we look at major fields outside religion. So in none of these, we find a differential, uh, we find evidence for pre-trends. Um, so neither here nor here. Um, and overall levels have been very low. So even if some kind of switch, so first say uh, people produce vernacular text in a specific field outside religion, then the reformers came and now suddenly they switched in order to push uh, the movement. It seems that numbers are just too low. So printing in the vernacular was just too low before in order to, um, to um, explain this. Um, I mean, if we look at just the, the numbers here, we see that religious or printing uh, of these religious works uh, just went really up by a lot with the Reformation. So they produced really lots of work. So it includes, of course, also pamphlets and not just uh, books. Um, so there are probably also lots of pamphlets um, among these titles, something we cannot uh, at the moment distinguish. Um, but also given the numbers that we have, uh, it seems that uh, we can think of this rather as a supply shock. But if you have a good idea for another way to test or assess this, I'm, I'm happy to do so. I mean, we looked at, yeah. It's, uh, I'll, I'll talk about it because we have a lot of questions, but yeah, I, I have some ideas. Okay, okay. thanks. Cool, um, I'll pass on the word to Benjamin Marks. Uh, do you wanna say your question out loud, Benjamin? Sure, thanks, Janet. Hi, Christine. I, I was, and I, as I was in the chat, it's so nice to see how far the project has come. Um, <laughs> my, so my question, it's a related question to your conversation with Jared, but I, I was just wondering how much um, we should worry that there's a little bit of reverse causality going on here. So those places that published more in vernacular shortly after 1517 were more likely to turn Protestant by 1600 uh, because people pro pro proselytized in the, in the vernacular. Uh, is that is that possible at all as a mechanism? So again, or? again, I didn't I didn't fully understand. Uh, so the, that, the, so. the essentially the reverse relationship to what you are documenting, uh, increased printing in vernacular, making it more likely to turn Protestant by sixteen hundred. So we did also analysis where we used Protestant by fifteen thirty, and results didn't change too much. So qualitatively, they remain okay. the same. Would that give you some? Would yeah, that that's, that's that's definitely useful. That's okay, useful. so maybe we should add that. We don't have it in the paper yet. Yeah. Okay, that's that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. We have a question from uh, Valeria. Do you want to say it out loud? Or Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk, really cool work. So I had a question about the effects of vernacularization. So you do show that there's an increase in diversity and the content. So the diversity of content, diversity of authors. But I, I was just curious, so is that within a certain linguistic fear? So because my, my point, I think that, rever that, that refers to what Robert Barrow was asking. Doesn't vernacularization decrease the exchange of ideas internationally? So what's the overall effect on the novelty of ideas that are produced? So I think the main argument we would do here is that the share of those literate in Latin is just so small compared to those who understand. So both in terms of also, uh, uh, yeah, understand the language uh, verbally, but also in writing, it's just so huge that uh, there's a huge benefit to switching to the vernacular. So maybe that would be different in other contexts. Um, so if we think about external validity, maybe, but um, but the literacy rates were relatively low, and that was also that that's also one of the reasons why Luther kind of aimed at or kind of used German language instead of Latin. So he wanted people. It was not just about reading; it was also about reading out these pamphlets to people on important places. Um, 
and that was something that uh, was only possible given that he used uh, German as a language and, and not Latin where people would have to translate that first. Um, so, so I think it's it's because sure there is some drawback, right? And I think when we look at the Arabic speaking world, this is also one of the arguments always made that Arabic kind of unifies these languages. But if we then look at the printing output within a particular country, it is very, very low, right? So, uh, and and uh, we we actually also tried to collect some data on uh, our information from printers in, in Egypt. And it seems like their anticipation is that readership is too low in Egypt and it wouldn't make sense. So they, they're not formally, um, there's no formal constraint or regulation that prevents them from writing in the vernacular, so in the Egyptian dialect, but they just think that there's not enough demand for it, despite the huge population they have. And that also affects children's books and, and like many, many types of books. Um, so, so I think that's kind of what we try to argue here that if the, if the gap is so huge or if, if it's so difficult for people to actually learn Latin, so Latin back then was also learning Latin was not so easy, right? There were only very few places where you could actually learn Latin. So it was very difficult to, to get hold or to learn this language and access knowledge that is available compared to when it then moved. And if we look at, so for, if we look at by subject classification in the USTC, um, I can show you that perhaps in the back, then we see that certain subjects uh, or certain fields open up in the uh, only after the Reformation. So once the vernacular is being used. Uh, so sorry, I hope I find it here. So yeah, so here in the in the appendix of the paper, we show for all subject classifications how the number of printed works in Latin and in the vernacular. And we see that for quite a few subject classifications, they only come into existence after the Reformation and one's uh, and, and um, works mainly appear in the vernacular. So of course, I, I mean, also suggest perhaps we don't know what would have happened without the Reformation. I mean, it looked like there was somehow an equilibrium kind of before the Reformation. Uh, and then we really see this, this huge shift, but I mean, yeah, it's difficult um, kind of know what would have happened uh, without it. So without making the shift. So I think something to appreciate was what was, at least to me, not so obvious before, is that it just takes a lot of time and effort to standardize and develop these languages. Um, so if we look at um, the first dictionary that was uh, that came out uh, for, for an ethnic group in Europe, and then look at when the, no, for the first Bible, sorry, and then the, the, the first comprehensive dictionary, I think on average 300 years passed uh, in Europe. So it just took these different ethnic groups very long, a very long time to develop uh, and formalize their language. And I think if that's maybe something that we're not so much aware of or uh, when thinking about this, that it is so difficult. Yeah. Good, thank you. We are right on time and I'll uh, say thank you to the three of you and um, pass on- Thank you so much for all the comments. Uh, yeah. Pass on the keys to uh, to Rachel. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Great. Okay. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you. Um, I have with me Robert Barrow, who's going to sit in with me here <laughs> on this session. Um, all right. Um, should we wait a minute, or can we launch in? Or go ahead. Okay. All right, so our first speaker is Eva Raber, and uh, she's going to speak on U.S. Church's response to COVID-19 preliminary results from Facebook. Welcome, Eva. Um, well, thank you very much for having me. So, well, let me share my screen. So I hope you can hear me well and you can well see my screen. Um, well, so again, thank you for thank you for having me for having me present all uh, well, this work in progress. I have deleted the preliminary part of the title, so now it's called U.S. Church's Response to COVID-19: Results from Facebook. So it is still a work in progress, and the results are still um, quite preliminary. So this is uh, work with Paul Seabright, um, who is uh, at Toulouse, and so as I said, this is this is work in progress. So I'm trying to keep the presentation relatively short. Um, but I'm also welcoming uh, comments by email, so feel free to drop me with any uh, thoughts you have and any questions you have, feel free to also drop me an email afterwards. 
So uh, I want to start with uh, uh, well, this cap recap of okay, what are religious organizations kind of centered around usually? And so usually they're centered around in-person gatherings. So this is really at the heart of their activities. Um, this is where people meet. This is where they establish their network. This is where a lot of the activity really takes place. Um, and so it's very important for religious organizations to, to regularly meet and to have this kind of meeting in person where people, people share certain activities together, rituals, but also talk to each other and exchange with the spiritual leaders. However, we have seen in recent times that um, there are certain circumstances where rig religious in-person gatherings can be problematic. And uh, well, I'm obviously talking about uh, the novel coronavirus. Um, so here we are in a situation where, where religious in-person gatherings have been identified as some of the early hotspots. I have chosen to this headline from France, where um, there is now this uh, idea that most of the hotspots that we saw afterwards most of uh, the cases are related to a big event of a French mega church where they met in Mulhouse and uh, there were over 2000 people and they kind of, they, they met and they, they sang together and uh, for days and that's basically was uh, originated, well, is the origin of a lot of cases afterwards. So that was kind of well, what we nowadays call a super spreading event. So we have this kind of uh, two ideas. So it is very important for religious organizations to have this in-person gatherings the same time now we have this them identified as the super spreading events but we're also in a situation where now we have increased risk um, and in actually may probably also increased demand for religion but we have this tension um, between okay they can't really gather in the same um, or they should not gather in the same um, way as they did before so we were interested in how did uh, well, Christian churches respond? Well, we focus on US Christian churches. And so we were wondering how they responded to the coronavirus pandemic and also to the intervention imposed by the government. So as I said, US Christian churches. So in the US, uh, we thought this was an interesting uh, setting because there is a lot of variety in uh, the denominations that you see. There's also a lot of independent churches and there is state variation in how the, how the counties were affected by the pandemic and the, and the churches themselves and also the interventions. Also another reason obviously why we chose this is that there was a lot of media attention drawn around this. So for example, this is a, one um, article where uh, you show that there were some pastors that were shown in the media as not taking this seriously, uh, saying, okay, we can continue with our gatherings because well, I mean, we're protected by God anyway. Uh, you see also you have this media articles uh, about uh, some pastors defying virus orders um, so that again not taking them seriously and saying like this is uh, actually too important we are going to continue to do um, our services however we thought okay um, we we want to bring a bit a neutral angle to this and we want to see um, if there because one of the options that um, churches had was to move their activities online. So instead of having them in person, they could move them online. And we wanted to see if we can find a, a proxy or a measure for, for how churches actually reacted in the sense of did they move their activities online. And was this move towards uh, online activities, was this a response to the severity of the pandemic or was it really the state regulations that in the end forced them to, to move online? And then we were wondering if there's different types of churches that actually responded differently. And so what we do, um, we have, a, well, actually there's a typo. So we have a data set of over 4,000 of nearly, well, we have a data set of over 3,000, so that's fine. So we have nearly 4,000 Christian US churches who are re registered at usachurches.org, which is a public, uh, and that have a public Facebook page. And of those that have a public Facebook page, we have basically all the posts they made between January 2020 and June 2020. We also have the posts until basically last month, but today this presentation I'll focus on this on this six month period. So then the second step is that so we have all those posts and when we want to identify online church activities, so services and Bible groups and everything that happens basically online. So we have, um, we have come up with two proxies for online activities based on this Facebook posts. So one is that we just basically look, okay, do they have a, a post on a Sunday, which includes a video? 
And the second one is a bit uh, develops this a little bit for, further is what I'm going to call an online identifier. And there we are going to predict online church activities with a combination of the post type. So again, is this a video? Is this a link? Does it contain certain, uh, certain only a text or a photo? But also then include some keywords that could have that that are in the text that could be keywords for for this. And then in the end, we basically combine this with um, policy uh, data and uh, COVID nineteen data on the display. I'm going to have this to you uh, to do this to you. I mean, you're obviously probably very well aware of this curve. So this is the US in daily death in the uh, from the COVID-19. Uh, and so I want to show this again to show you to motivate why we're looking at the at the time frame that we're looking at. So we're basically looking for now at the first wave. And so we're cupping it at June uh, at the end of June. So we're basically including the, the first little bit of the timeline. So um, because we're going to put in state interventions, so we use the intervention data from Céline et al. Um, and so just as a recap, so on March 11, the federal government banned foreign travels. And then basically there is one weekend where churches can already respond to this, uh, to this, ban, uh, this travel ban. But then basically the week after the federal gov government publishes guidelines on social distancing, tells people to work from home and to cut down on their context. And then suddenly things move very, very fast. So preschool, uh, public schools close, um, restaurant and entertainment establishments, men's were told to close. And then gatherings were also uh, kept. And then at a bit of later state, stage, most states issued stay home orders. Um, so, so when there was when they were issuing stay home orders, there was quite a variation in how they actually treated religious organizations. And so there were states that were relatively strict. So they really said, okay, no, no religious gatherings at all. And then there was um, there were states where religious uh, gatherings were exempt from limits. And then there was like the, in the, the medium way, which was like that they um, limited in person gatherings to 10 people or fewer or limited in other ways. So not necessarily to 10 or fewer, but they were still limited. Um, I'm gonna say at this point, so obviously when I'm looking now at a religious uh, activity, um, the risk how, how churches respond to the state orders, I'm not, in, in any way implying any causality. So this is a purely descriptive work. Um, these state orders are obviously uh, determined in an equilibrium of where you have different state values and different uh, religious settings. So for example, you could argue that uh, conservative states are more likely to have religious exemptions. Then also churches that are in a more conservative areas are also um, would react differently to a setting like this. So all the co coefficients, everything that I'm going to tell you from now on, everything I'm going to show you is go just going to be correlational. Okay. So I want to tell you about the data that we use. So as I said, we, this all started from this idea that we wanted to get capture church activity in a relatively neutral way. So we found this uh, data, the, this website, usachurches.org, where basically churches can register themselves um, and then not only do they register their name and their address, but they also give us uh, some, some characteristics such as the denomination, the size, um, uh, the worship style, that's what I'm going to use later on. And then they're also telling us if they have a Facebook link, so a public Facebook page. And this is basically the crucial information that we're taking from here. But, and then in the end to do heterogeneity analysis, in terms of denomination. So here you can see how you can add your church to the list. So you have the church name, denomination, address. So here we're going to use the zip code. And then on the right hand side, you can see that they can put in social media links um, like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and so forth. Um, obviously, a bias that comes from here is that churches um, input themselves into, into that list, or church members can do it. So they can be uh, so there can be errors in what they put in, and there is an obvious bias about churches that are very proactive in acquiring new members over online uh, searches. So these are from the from the start of probably more technology technologically friendly sample. So in the end, we have around ten thousand churches that register um, in this website, 
and uh, nearly half of them have a Facebook ID. Oh, well, they put in a Facebook uh, link. And uh, well, here you can see the comparison between uh, those that have a Facebook and those that have not, don't have a Facebook link in this USA Churches website. So you can already, well, you can see uh, certain things that are very much um, expected. So for example, mega churches are much more likely to have a Facebook link while uh, in large churches, while small churches are less likely to do so, you see that some, uh, some denominations are more active in that sense. And then you can also see that, um, I mean, that having social media is correlated with other social media, for example, Twitter and YouTube. We have to say that the share of, uh, of Facebook, so nearly, as I said, so I think over 40%, of the churches indicate a public Facebook page. When you look at Twitter, the, the share is much lower. So Twitter seems to be a much more minority thing. Um, and so that's why also we decided to go with Facebook because that's well, one thing is that Facebook is also much more used than Twitter, um, but it's also much more used evidently by churches. And so then we collected uh, the Facebook posts with the help of CrowdTangle that is free for academics. So I can really recommend that. And so now I have the proper number. So we have nearly 4,000 churches that posted at least once between January and June 2020. So in here, now I want to tell you what we do with this. So here you actually already have a preview of the results that we're going to find. So here, this is the number of posts between January and the end of June. And so you see this kind of regular spikes um, that, that seem to show up. And so let's zoom in um, on one month. So this is the month of January and I put the, the date of the post. So you can see that it's really this kind of spikes that you're seeing is Sunday activity. So already you have this intuition that uh, churches will use this, uh, use Facebook mostly on Sundays. So it should be kind of in relationship to their Sunday services while the posting behavior on other days is much, much lower. So we focus our, our analysis on Sunday behavior as, as the day where most of the services take place. So here you also see this kind of similar pattern when you look at the videos. So there it's really very high spikes on Sundays. So it's really on Sundays where churches post, um, post videos. You can see a little bit the same pattern and other posts as well, but it's mo the most striking for a video. So oh, now we want to identify um, church activities. So connected to really, okay, do they offer, do churches offer an online activity on a given Sunday that could um, substitute or complement their in-person gathering? So here we have two indicators. So the first one is that they're posting at least one video on a Sunday. And then the second one is this online identity uh, ident um, in indicator that we're using. So here, what we did is that we hand coded, so we read through well, our research assistant read through 1,600 posts. So here, great thanks to her for at this part. So she hand coded 1,600 posts. She read everything and she identified them as being on the, as offering an online church activity. So it was clearly specifying that it was online and it was clearly specifying that it was a church activity and not just a video of uh, of uh, someone uh, saying just a prayer, but it was really about uh, the, uh, the Sunday service. And then we used the type of the post and the two most, the 200 most used words in a random forest prediction so that we can, for the rest of the sample, which is obviously much, much bigger, we can predict which ones are the online activity. I want to quickly show you the, the importance of, uh, of uh, the predictors for the random forest. So here you can see that the type of the post is really what drives the, the, the random forest prediction. So you can see that live videos are mostly connected to Sunday services. But you can also see that some words that are quite intuitive show up. So for example, you have uh, below here, you have the word life which was basically never, nearly never used before, before the pandemic, um, but now actually shows up quite a lot. So here, this is quite important. You also have Facebook, um, but you also have YouTube uh, and online. So these are, are words that basically show up that show us that we're kind of going in the right, in the correct dimension. So now here is the church's online indicator um, the share of churches which have at least one activity on a Sunday, which is identified by this random forest as an online activity. And that's per Sunday. So it's really, we're going to look at Sunday activity. So that's why the curve now is much smoother. 
And you can see already the main results. So church, the, before the pandemic, there was around uh, maybe maximum 30% of the churches that posted some type of online activity. So it's not that it was zero before, but then it really has this kind of huge increase and it more than doubles. And, uh, and you can see already that it kind of flattens a little bit, but it continues to stay in a very, very high level, at least until the end of June. For the empirical analysis, we're going to look at two different periods. So we defend the introduction period. So this is the period where the government and the states introduced certain um, interventions. And then the relaxation period where there was a rollback of those interventions. So we do that by with the assumption that introducing a measure and taking it away is not, doesn't necessarily have the same, same, uh, well, same um, result. And so we do that in separate regressions to make it a bit more visible. Okay, so here, this is our panel data. So here we have this nearly 4,000 churches. We have uh, um, on each Sunday, so it's a panel regression with church fixed effects. And as the outcome variable, we have this online uh, indicators in the paper. We use at least one video, but and also online uh, indicator, but I think this one is uh, a bit better. So the first results that I want you to look at here and a bunch of this, like a lot of estimates is that we have here um, the correlation between the lock infection in the previous week on the county level and the lock death in the previous week also on the county level. And so we can see that there is a positive correlation between the churches offering an online activity and the coronavirus situation in the county. These coefficients get smaller when we control for all the state orders and include also these two indicators well, that I'm going to talk in about a second, but they're still staying positive and at least uh, close to close to significance in the in the, in the case of the death. So here it seems that churches do at least partially respond to the situation within their county. The second thing, so here we do um, include two uh, indicators. So one indicates that after the travel bans were in included, and the second one is after the federal guidelines are issued. So I've put also put the dates to indicate that they were very close together. So there's basically just one Sunday that is between. So that's basically this like steep increase that you just saw, and that's kind of split up in these two weekends. Um, the coefficients are very similar, and you can see that only in these two first weekends. Um, here I put a for you the average in February, so that only in these two weekends, the, the share of the churches that offered an online activity that more than doubled. I also have to quickly say that I also, we also include, a, include an Easter Sunday dummy because the, that's one of the peaks that you actually see in the, in, the, in the trend as well. The last thing I want you to draw your attention to is this negative coefficient here, which is basically during the stay home order. I'm already realizing that I'm very, very short of time. I quickly want to say that we're also looking into what type of uh, stay home order we do actually have. And here I want you to just look at this negative coefficients for stay home orders that actually have a religious exemptions. So for now, we're interpreting this as when you're in a county where, or when you're in a state which has a introduces a stay home order, but actually has uh, religious exemptions, you then have less motivation to continue using your uh, proposing your online activity. Very quickly, I want to show you that there is not much happening in the relaxation period. We do have some co positive coefficients here, but they all lose their significance once we include a linear weak trend. So there seems to be some fatigue effect and we can't disentangle this fatigue effect from lifting or rolling back the estate. We also do have uh, some heterogeneity analysis that I'm gonna just take two more minutes if that's okay. Um, so we look at heterogeneity by the size, um, by the worship style, and then with, uh, well, by political leaning of the county. So here you have the different curves for the, for the, for the different sizes. So as expected, mega churches, they already have a very high level of online activity. It jumps up, it stays very high, but they already had a high level. The large churches really, really catch up. They're also very, very fast. Medium-sized churches, small churches, they take a little bit longer. So it takes it one week and more to kind of push most of them over. Um, and it stays only for the small churches, only at 50%. Um, and you can see that these, those are also the ones where you have um, the largest decrease. 
here also very much expected the worship style. So it's traditional worship style churches that have start from a very low baseline level. They also have an impressive increase. Um, they do seem to lose their motivation also in the relaxation period. Then here, this uh, I want to show you because there's not really much happening and you might have thought that there is a lot of things happening. So here, this is churches in the, uh, where the Republican vote share is really high in gray and you have the churches which are in districts where the Republican vote share is very low. And you can see that, I mean, there the curves, curves do have a couple of points where they're different, but in general, there's a very, very similar pattern. So it's not like churches in Republican areas were not, re were not responsive at all. So if I want to point something out, it's probably the lack of completely well, of, of a pattern that shows very, very much difference. And so um, as a recap, I, we, we are very much aware so that we're just looking at correlations. We have a bias towards a more technologically friendly sample. We only have their Facebook data. So they could obviously, um, smaller, smaller churches could use other mediums. So for example, they could use uh, WhatsApp directly. We also have a difficulty to identify hybrid activities. So we don't know if this, the online activities are just of if they're really substitutes or if they're actually complements to their in-person person gatherings, but we are still interpret interpreting the, uh, the online identifier as churches making an effort to at least to provide uh, an online activity on additionally to their in-person activities. And then we're obviously uh, looking forward to, or looking forward, we're obviously about to extend the frame to include the summer and the fall and to do some uh, other correlational analysis. So, um, well, I'm happy about any question and any comment. Thank you. Um, thank you, Eva. Thank you. Um, um, I have a question. In, in looking at your chart on size um, and the response to the COVID, um, right, in, in getting on Facebook, uh, the, it, it seems to me that the liberal churches would be smaller that the more traditional mainline churches like the Methodists, the Presbyterians, um, in terms of size. And what and that the mega churches since the 40s have already been moving into media, radio, television. Um, they're very media savvy, whereas the mainline churches, as we call them in the United States, have not been uh, media savvy. Um, I think. I think what would be interesting is to see the lag. Um, so to give you a very personal example, I belong to a Methodist church and the mega churches are way ahead. They already have presence on Facebook, but we don't. And it's taken us quite a while to figure out how to get the technology and how to get it up. But not only that, how to educate our parishioners to go to Facebook and to see the service. Um, so I'm just wondering about is there some way to look at that lag? You know, how the mega churches are already there and the, and the traditional ones aren't? I mean, I mean, I'm sorry, the mainline ones aren't. No, I mean, so you, you clearly already see from, from this graph that the mega churches, I mean, half of them already have some online presence. I mean, half of them already stream their service on Facebook even before the pandemic. So th for these churches, um, you don't, we don't see a difference. So you really have this just this jump of like from one from half to eighty percent. So there were other mega churches that also kind of jumped the wagon, but I and they were really quick. So it's just this kind of line you don't really see that well. But they basically already responded on the first weekend after the travel ban was introduced. While you can see for the small churches here that uh, the first weekend there was a couple of them, and they basically took two weekends or even until Easter to kind of get their technology running. I also think that for small churches, it's it's relatively costly to have this technology, and they might they don't have specialized uh, team to do that. So for mega churches, uh, they off they have more staff that they can also use to to do that. So for them, it's less costly to just keep it going, which explains very little why they were just they're just continuing to do this, and they might just well they might actually continue to do that even. Well, even when the pandemic is over because it's really not so costly for them and they might see okay now that we have the technology we're going to stay with this i mean interested in if there's going to be small churches that are going to continue doing that because for them I, I assume that it's a bit more costly 
concerning the, the, the point about the, the denomination, so um, I actually do have quite a lot of Methodist churches, I think, in the sample. That's actually the one where I can do some, I can actually have a look and, uh, well, so the, the Methodist churches, at least in our sample, because in our sample, there's the ones that actually have Facebook, they're actually quite quick to respond. Um, and so they, they're actually there. I don't really find, uh, so I look at the biggest denominations that I have in the sample. So that's independent churches, Pentecostals, and I think it's, well, it's actually not Methodist, it's actually Baptist. Okay, so I'm taking this back. I don't have any results about the Methodists, um, but it's Baptist. So for now, I haven't um, found much uh, with regard to denomination, but it's also because I don't want to go into um, heterogeneity analysis with a really small uh, sample. So for example, I don't want to do a heterogeneity analysis with 300 Catholic churches that are uh, not uh, distributed over all states, so that the, that wouldn't make sense to me, and the results wouldn't be interpretable. Um, okay, thank you, um, thank you, Eva. Um, so now we're going to move on to um, Max Winkler, and uh, Max is going to discuss: Do disasters affect adherence to social norms? Can I, can I ask a question to Eva before, or do oh, you sure. not? Sure, yeah, 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 go right ahead. Can you, um, so, so it's really great work. Um, I was wondering whether you could do additional, so whether you could use your, the work you have done on your outcome variable to look into what church, what type of product or what type of, type of services the church are offering online. So if you have the Facebook posts, could you, do some sort of text analysis to understand what's the activity that's um, you know that's brought online after COVID. So when we were hand coding the posts, um, we we did have different different categories, uh, and so from from basically from the small sub sample, it really seems that um, the posts are really advertising their most of the posts are really advertising their sun, Sunday service. So most of them are connected to Sunday service. But we have uh, some other categories that are there. We did also expect them to use Facebook to really like send messages pot potentially about pot like politics or about the, the health crisis itself. But that actually seems to be, uh, doesn't seem to be necessarily the case. So it's a lot of like, oh, we're gonna meet on Sunday. Um, uh, let's join all on Sunday. And so, so that's really a big share of the posts. Um, then we also we differentiated between interactive and, and so just basically a stream and uh, having an interactive, for example, Bible study. So we haven't really ventured in that in that direction to see uh, how that curve looks like. But yeah, we, we did want to go a little bit further also with text analysis. And we, we did have a lot of ideas about, um, OK, what messages are churches sending? But here I, I'm now a bit much more cautious because they really seem to just advertise their activities and not really engage much with their followers on Facebook. Okay, thanks. Interesting. So thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Thank you very much. Um, Max? Yes. Would you like to go ahead? <laughs> <laughs> yes, just one second. Um... <clears throat> So I have an old uh, an old MacBook. It always takes a few seconds. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. So, do you see my front slide? Do, do disasters affect adherence to social norms? Yes. Okay. Great. So um, that's my so I'm Max. That's my uh, job market paper. That's the short version of my job talk. Uh, I, I tried to give you the gist of it over the next twenty minutes. So in uh, economics, uh, in recent years, we have um, there's lots of evidence that social norms matter for people making decisions and also for economic outcomes. This paper is not about variation in the social norms per se, but in variability in social norms. Um, what this graph shows you is, um, is within countries, if you take two individuals, what's the probability that these two individuals will give different answers to the same question in the World Family Survey? So in countries like Egypt, you have um, that probability is very low. So most people will, will, will give very similar answers to the same question in the World Family Survey. And in countries like the US or France or the UK, it's rather high. 
So there's lots of variability. The distribution in these responses to the survey questions is spread out. And one way to think of this is that, um, well, some countries have stronger norms than others. And there's at least two questions, uh, you know, that Matt, Max, could you move to the next slide? Are you going to move to the next slide? Yeah, yeah. So this was all the map so far. So okay. I was just, okay. I was just still talking about the map. Gotcha. Um, so okay. there's two two follow or two questions, you know, that 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 are interesting. One is where where does this variation come from, and and what does this variation do to uh, economic outcomes, political outcomes, and social outcomes. And I'm in this paper or in this job talk or in this talk, I'm going to dive into the first question. Where does this variation come from? Why do some individuals adhere more strictly to their social norms than others? And um, the idea or the hypothesis I'm testing is uh, whether collective traumatic experiences, what I call disasters from no one, um, affect how strictly individuals adhere to social norms. And that's an idea that's very popular, not just, um, so it's not so popular in economics, but it's been very popular in, in sociology, in anthropology, um, and in, in social psychology. And if you think um, about Max, this question... Uh, I, I, think, I think we can't, we can't see it. We, we're still at the front page. Uh, we're still okay, at the first then slide. That's not good. No, no I'm, I moved on. Try to reshare your, your, your screen, potentially. We had this issue before. If you if you exit the full screen, it might help. Okay. Okay. No, okay. No, you see it now? No. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Nice. Okay. So you didn't miss much. There's there was the map. There was the question, and that's it. <laughs> uh, but thanks for pointing out. Um, so 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 yeah. If you so the question is why 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 do we see this variation here? Uh, unless you didn't see this, that's the question. Um, and the, the hypothesis is whether, uh, you know, shocks, big shocks, large collective traumatic events um, affect, affect adherence to social norms. And if you, you know, this question isn't obvious if you think about this, uh, you know, without having seen my paper. And um, there's lots of stories, lots of books in, in across the social sciences that tell, you know, give examples of societies that fall apart after disasters, after wars, after natural disasters and so forth. There's other examples where uh, of people that come together, that join forces, and, and it show lots of solidarity in response to disasters. Um, so it's pretty much an open empirical question. And on this, in this last point, I want you know to give a few more examples to make this to make this to drive home this point. Um, there's many many examples of people showing lots of solidarity with their community and with their country during war. So, um, you know, we have, uh, we have social psychologists that ha have written about this, that society attains its maximum sense of organization and community during war. We have historical examples where, you know, there's massive volunteering during, during times of war. And there's even, there's examples of uh, community members ostracizing and punishing those who don't want to contribute, who don't want to volunteer. Um, to, 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 to the war effort. And, um, and lastly, there's, there's one funny example from 9-11. Um, it's called in political science, the rallying around the flag effect reflects uh, the approval rating for George W. Bush jumped from around 50% to nearly 90% within just a month. So I think all these you know, stories, examples are related to this idea that potentially after disasters, um, there is a response that makes us adhere more strongly, potentially more strongly to social norms. So in this paper, I'm collecting data on um, lots of different types of disasters, um, conflicts, epidemics, earthquakes, droughts, hurricanes, and economic disasters, and combine them with the World Value Survey and the European Social Survey. Then I have two outcomes, two measures of norm adherence. One is a simple survey question that asks people about you know, their the willingness to adhere to social norms. And the second one is a revealed measure um, of, of how norm adhering people are in the survey, in responding to the survey. Now I come back to this, to this new measure later, like in, in one or two slides. And then there's, um, I have, I have more analysis in the paper, but today I'm going to talk about two analyses 
one looking at short run effects of disasters and one looking at long run effects of disasters. Um, in the short run analysis, we basically have the situation where we have uh, individuals um, who answer to surveys uh, at, different, at different days, so it's at the day level, and then a disaster hits and I will compare individuals just before, in days before the disaster and after the disaster, and whether their responses in, in, in the World Value Survey and in the social, European Social Survey changes because of the disaster. And, and there's going to be a long-run analysis that looks at uh, different exposure to disasters during childhood. So in terms of outcome, as I said, there's two measures, and uh, both in the European and in, this, in the, in the uh, World Value Survey data. The direct survey question asks, uh, is, is the following statement. Uh, it is important to this person to always behave properly to avoid doing anything people would say is wrong. And people can, can state their agreement um, how much this statement applies to them from one to six. So that's a one, one, one measure of conformity to social expectations. There is, I'm also going to construct, or I want to have a second measure of, of norm adherence because you know, direct survey questions have sometimes problems um, when it comes to um, comparing different cultures, diff you know, people from different countries across places, um, there's um, what psychologists call the reference group problem. It's not always clear who these other people are in the survey question. So um, um, I, yeah, I want to have a second measure to be to be to to show to possibly show the effect on both outcome measures. And uh, this revealed measure builds on this variability uh, at the population level that I showed you earlier. So at the country level, it was whether two individuals within the same country give the same answer to, to the same survey question. Um, what's the probability that two individuals give the same, same answer to, to a survey question? Here, I'm breaking this down to the individual level. I'm taking an individual, let's say from, from the US, and I'm going to build social groups based on their, their geographical characteristics. So what state are they from? Based on, those, based on their socio-demographic characteristics. How old are they? What educational attainment do they have? Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's it. And in what year they took the survey. And then I would, I would, I compute an indicator, or I, I'm, I'm going to compile all the different questions in the World Value Survey or in the European Social Survey data and create for each individual the share of questions that they answer in the same way as the majority of people around them. So I'm going to build small social groups. The modal value in these social groups will be my social norm. And if people are in agreement with this modal value for most of the questions in the survey, they will get a high uh, normatering norm share. And sort of the, the appealing feature of this measure is that it's revealed. There's no social desirability. There's no demand effect or whatsoever people answer to different survey questions with perhaps different biases. And all these will be sort of bundled together um, in, in one norm adherence measure. So now, now um, I want to spend most of the time on the first analysis, on the short-term analysis, because that's the one that's tightly identified. Um, the European data has the huge advantage that it records the exact days of the interviews. Um, and that's, so it's possible to link um, those disasters that also happen on specific dates, like earthquakes and the start of epidemics, to the interviews. So um, I can basically see re people responding to the survey. And then at some point, an earthquake hit, hits while the survey is rolled out, while this, you know, these survey interviews are being conducted. And by linking earthquakes with, or by linking the disasters to these, um, based on to the dates of these surveys, it's possible to compare people just before a disaster hits and, and, and individuals just after the same disaster. So the outcome will, will always be one of the two, one of the two uh, norm adherence measures that I have. 
the explaining variable would just be an indicator equal to one for individuals for server respondents just after the disaster. And, and crucially, there is a disaster times country fixed effect. So, which means that, you know, you're basically just comparing these few people before and after the same disaster within the same country. So this gets rid of most unobservables um, that you, you know, that you may think of. <clears throat> okay, here's the first main finding of the paper. Um, here I have self-reported norm adherence as the outcome variable. And I'm plotting the coefficients of one regression where I interact the uh, uh, independent variable with, with indicator for different times. So 15 days or like between 15 to zero days before the disaster, zero to 15 days after disaster and so forth. And on the y-axis is the estimate of this coefficient. And what you see is that before the disaster, there's not much going on. There's no pretense, it's close to zero. And as soon as the disaster kicks in, in individuals that are being surveyed in days afterwards report more norm materials. They think it's way more important to avoid anything that other people uh, you know, might, fi might find offensive or might think is wrong. And the magnitude is about um, point 0.1, between point 0.1 and point 0.5 of a standard deviation. Um, which is, if you uh, you know, if you look at the raw data overall in raw data, this trait is fairly stable over time, um, and across countries, it's a fairly large magnitude. That shows uh, that the second graph shows you exactly the same empirical specification for the second outcome for for the for revealed norm adherence. Um, so again, it's the it's the estimate of of one regression with with day dummies or time period dummies. And again, it's, it's more or less uh, smooth and, and close to zero before the disaster and as the disaster hits, just a few days later, um, revealed norm adherence goes up in the survey, in the survey data. Now, that was, um, that was the first uh, sort of my first, my first dig into the data. Now, if you, if you, What's another, what's the follow up, or what's the next implication of this hypothesis? This idea implies that if you live in a community and you get hit by a shark, your response to the shark will highly depend on your local social norms. So, if the theory is correct, if this mechanism is correct, correct let's assume you have a left leaning, politically left leaning community and a politically right leaning community. So the local political norms are either left or right. If the theory is correct, we, what we should expect is that if both communities get hit by the same shark, um, we should see opposing uh, sort of attitudinal reactions. We should see opposing responses by these individuals. So in, in right-leaning in right leaning communities, we should expect people becoming more right. And in left-leaning communities, we should expect people becoming more left because that's the, that's the local norm. And I'm gonna have a few different outcome variables here. I start with political preferences. So the black, the black uh, coefficient shows you the average treatment effect um, of disasters on, on political preferences. There's, if anything, it's slightly leaning to the right, but, but not statistically significant. But if you split the sample on pre-existing local political norms, so whether before the disaster hits, these communities tended to, you know, to lean to the left or tended more to the right, you see that left right-leaning communities get far more right, or individuals in right-leaning communities get, you know, react strongly to the right. And, and uh, yeah, liberal left-leaning individuals, if anything, to the left, but, but not statistically significant. So there seems to be some perhaps polarization going on because of disaster. Now, this is the same graph with anti-minority, with a few different types of anti-minority attitudes. The first three categories are about immigration, and the last category is about um, um, attitudes to attitudes towards homosexuality, and again, the, the the black coefficients tend to be, you know, close to zero uh, for for immigration, a, a bit negative. So on average, these people on average become less favorable of immigrants 
and if anything, a bit more favorable of, of, of homosexuals. But if you split the sample in, along pre-existing norms, you get a slightly different picture. So in, that, in this case, it's the negative effect on, on attitudes towards immigration is fully driven by places that used to have local norms against immigrants to start with. And, and um, for homosexuality, this positive effect is only driven, it's purely driven by places that, you know, have local norms that, you know, that like or that don't mind um, homosexuals. Um, very similar result if you look at trust in, into institutions, trust into democ trust for democracy. So the top, uh, the top row is actually the most, the strongest, the strongest finding here in this graph. Places that um, you know didn't like or are not very happy with democracy to start with become far less happy with democracy. And places where that value democracy, that are happy with democracy, become, if anything, more supportive of democracy in response to the shock. And lastly, uh, religion. So there's a there's you know a fair bit of papers that argue and that show empirically that people become more religious in response to disasters. And that's, that's what I find as well. That's what I document as well. If you look at the, the black coefficients, um, it's not always significant, but they tend to be, uh, people tend to, be, to become more religious in response to disasters. But again, there's this huge, strong heterogeneity along pre-existing norms. So if you live, if, if you get hit by a disaster and you live in a religious community, you become, you become more than, than, than a 0 0.0 standard, uh, 0.1 standard deviation more religious. If you live in a non-religious community, either nothing happens or you even become less religious. Okay, so in the last three minutes, um, I'm going to extend this tightly identified analysis to, to the world. So bringing this, so it's gonna be in the paper, it's, it's a longer section, but here I'm just gonna give you the main finding. I'm using the, so I'm pushing this to the World Value Survey, which um, you know, covers the whole world and also allows me to look at more shocks than just earthquakes and, the, and, and epidemics. So I'm gonna have hurricanes, I'm gonna have wars, all the things that usually don't happen in Europe. And since the World Value Survey doesn't have this fine-grained information on dates, on the exact dates of the interview, I'm using a, an identific identification strategy that is very popular in the literature, where you look at uh, disasters that happen during childhood and then have long-run effects in your life. So, I always look at disasters before the age of 20, so typically between seven and 20, because that's, uh, you know, lots of prior research has found that that's a very important time in your life. And here the graph, again, shows coefficients of, of young age disaster experiences for different age at different points in your life cycle. So um, I have bins for people in their 20s, a bin for people in their 30s, in their 40s, and so on, and so on. And the interpretation of this graph is that um, if you got hit by a disaster, by an earthquake in this case, in your, in your teens, that has long run, long lasting effects on your norm adherence, on your self-reported norm adherence in this case, but also on your revealed norm adherence um, throughout your life. Um, so it's 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 fairly you know consistent in your forties and then it's it fa slowly fades away uh, towards your fifties and sixties. So it fades over time, but it seems to persist for at least a few decades. The same is true for hurricanes, um, for droughts, even though a bit a bit weaker. It's very large for epidemics, and it's 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 there. It's large for wars and and for economic disasters as well. So to conclude, um, I, the paper makes three points. Um, first, there is stronger adherence to local social norms after disasters. Um, looking at specific attitudes, um, I find that you know, to you know, understand what type, what kind of effects people, disasters have on, on specific attitudes, it's important to understand the local social norms that people are, are going to conform with. And thirdly, the effect persists for, you know, for at least a few decades. And sort of, I guess, to me, the biggest limitation of the paper is that it's self-reported survey data and not real-world behavior. So it's kind of 
the point I want to push next in this research agenda. And, but note, there is a, just now, uh, a forthcoming paper in the Journal of Political Economy, Political Economy that finds evidence using consumption data, uh, which is very consistent with, you know, with my findings here, where in India, during times of conflicts, Hindus and Muslims comply more with their local food taboos. So they either eat less meat, uh, less beef, or less pork during times of conflict. And in a way that's very consistent with, with what I document here. Oh, that's it. Great, thank you, Max. Thank you. Um, you have a, Jared would like to ask a question and you have uh, a couple of comments. So Jared, would you like to go first? Sure, um, th that, was, that was really, really great. Um, so you have heter, you look at heterogeneity by um, the strength of the norm and I'm I'm wondering. I, I think you might have uh, you might be able to look at more sources of heterogeneity to see how the response is. And one one thing in particular I'm thinking about is social capital, which all of, which is survey, you have you have that data. I mean the, the 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 surveys you're looking at have that data for sure, um, because you might think that if the mechanism one of the mechanisms is through social capital that you know people whether it be a church or social clubs or whatever become stronger because they come together. That might be an interesting thing to look at. I would actually suspect you might find very similar things. And one other small thing um, on your politics outcome, I think it would also be interesting to look at uh, support for the incumbent, not just to people on the left be become more left or right, more right. I mean, at least with the, you know, like the 9 11 example, both yeah. Republican and Democrat, regardless of where you were, you know, they, it, it tended to yeah, be. Yeah, that's a great point. Became more popular. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, I have, so I looked at social capital, I look at trust, uh, impersonal trust, and there isn't, a, you know, there isn't much there, but also trust is a weird, is a weird measure. So I try, let me try other outcomes, see if there's other outcomes that I could try. Thank you. Um, the commentator said that you solved his question. So um, does anybody else have a question for Max? If I can. Yeah, can yeah, I, go uh, ahead, Jared. Oh, sorry. Please, please go ahead first, oh. Jared. Oh, no, I just wanted to very briefly follow up. I by um, by social capital, I didn't mean it as an outcome. I meant it as a way to distinguish between you looking at high social capital and low social capital places, and to, to do essentially everything you've done with kind of high high norm following and, and low norm following. Um, I see. So that's Pre existing norm following. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, Max. Hi, hi. A very interesting paper. And uh, I was perhaps I missed I missed it, but I'm just wondering whether there could be some uh, like for your baseline results on people's social norm adhe adhesion, could there be some selectivity problem of who were interviewed after the disaster happened? For example, if if it's the people if the, if the if it's the people who are more likely to be, to be agreeable and friendly who would agree to be interviewed after a major disaster then we could see something um, uh, similar to what you find maybe perhaps one way to to to, to address this is to compare the uh, people pe the people who were interviewed before and after and make sure they were similar observation like along all the observational lines and I think yeah, just yeah, yeah. So no, you're absolutely right. That, that is so. It, it, what you want is a balance table that's in the paper, and 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 you okay. know, people on both sides of the line are balanced along all observables, pre-existing, predetermined observables. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Max, just a, out of curiosity, is there something like the epicenter of the disaster, and then going in? your interviews further out from the epicenter of the disaster and, and seeing also rural urban differences? Oh yeah, that rural urban, I, I didn't check rural urban. Um, um, so. Well, I was just thinking of an yeah, earthquake. No, it's something, uh, yeah. it's something, yeah, with earthquakes it would be possible because uh, that's very local. That's something I actually could look at and I know where people are. So you can see if there's, yeah, there's a gradient. Mm -hmm. okay, Thanks. Yeah. Oh, we can't hear you, Alexander. Can you hear me now? No, you, you have to get your volume up. Uh, 
can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it works. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, sorry. So, yeah, my question is that basically, if the adherence to social norms has something to do with the kind of group you belong to, can be ethnicity, can be nation, can be whatever, if, say, the state or your ethnic authorities or like national authorities, regional authorities help somehow people to cope with the disaster, can it be part of the story that you're telling? So, for example, you're becoming more attached to whatever norms the state is trying to push if the states, if the state helps you to cope mm -hmm. with the disaster, basically, something like that. Yeah, that's interesting. So um, I have something similar along these lines in the paper where I look at heterogeneity between uh, rich and poor countries and, you know, government places that have efficient governments and, and other places. And I typically find that in countries with, you know, that are either poor or where the institutions are weak, the effect is stronger. So, you know, which might be consistent with the idea that if, you know, if the government doesn't help you, your local community has to help you and you have, you, you know, you play by the rules of your local community. Um, so this goes the other way. This is like, these are situations where the local community becomes more important. I don't have anything um, that would show that the state becomes more important because of that. That would be a, I, I guess, like a next question where I look at specific norms that are pushed by the state um, and, and, and see if they react. Yeah, maybe the first step could be just trying to collect data on whether, on like the extent and the direction of the intervention maybe after these disasters. Uh, yeah, I don't know. But I, the, No, that's I a great, um, yeah, I, I have, I wrote this down, but that's a great, that's a great uh, question, thanks. No, thanks for the presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Max, one more observation. Just <laughs> um, international response to disasters. I mean, that might throw out a monk, you know, you have like in, international NGOs coming in and that might mm -hmm. influence people's perception. Mm -hmm. um, just a thought, just a yeah, no, yeah, that would be another level of heterogeneity. That's interesting. It doesn't apply so much to the European data, I suppose, because right? I mean, there's, there's like what, you know, that's basically, you have rather strong states, but for the world value survey analysis, that would be interesting to see if that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Jared? Yeah, yeah a small one. Yeah. Um, it also strikes me that, you know, not, not all shocks are the same, and you should have data on the strength of these of earthquakes in particular. You know, I, I live in Southern California, if we get a 5.0, or we're just yeah. going to continue on our day, it just, you know, yeah. Tuesday. Um, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so yeah, and I, I wonder if that's actually uh, diluting your results because it, you know, it might just be if, if you kind of exclude some of those weaker ones, it's the strong ones that are really driving what, what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, so right. I'm some, I didn't, some, in the interest of time, I skipped the description of the data, but I basically already focused on really uh, strong ones, so everything above six, um, for example. Um, and, and and only strong hurricanes and so forth. Um, and yeah, so I, I kind of throw away the, the smaller ones that people barely notice. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you, Max. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Thanks for all the questions. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, Hector Galindo Silva and uh, his paper on Fighting for not so religious souls, the role of religious competition in non religious conflicts. Hector? Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Can, oh, can everybody okay, hear you? Okay, let me, let me share the, the, the slides. Uh, okay, can, can you see the, the slides? I hope. Uh, yes. Okay, okay, so perfect. Uh, okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, you all for, for attending uh, uh, and thank you all the organizers for this great event. So um, so this is a, a joint work with uh, Guy Chuente, who is now at the University of uh, Kent. Um, so 
uh, as the title says, basically what we do in this paper is to study the role of uh, religious organizations and specifically we focus on competitions, competition between uh, religious organizations uh, in non-religious conflicts. So by non-religious conflicts, we mean uh, uh, those conflicts in which the issue, the main issue at the stake is not related to with uh, uh, the religious identity of uh, the parties in conflict. So uh, when, when we started this, this project with Guy, uh, 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 sorry. When we started the, this project with we, we first noted that uh, uh, most of the internal conflicts in the world, uh, at least in the uh, last uh, three, four decades, uh, can, can be classified as non-religious. Uh, however, we, we also noted, and importantly, that uh, these conflicts occurred in, uh, deep, in deeply religious countries. So uh, we asked what would be the role of uh, uh, the religious organizations in these conflicts, given that in these places, uh, uh, um, we can think that the religious leaders uh, can reach out more effectively to regional and local actors. So uh, we, we think that they, they, could, they can plausibly can help or, be, or build peace. So this is like the main motivation of, 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 the, of the paper. So this is what we do in this paper. We try to answer this, this, this uh, question. Uh, and uh, empirically, and we focus on, an, on a, a specific uh, country, which is uh, uh, Colombia. Colombia, sorry. Um, so, how many of you may know, Colombia uh, has suffered one of the longest running internal conflicts in the world. Uh, the Colombian conflict is non religious, according to this, this definition. The main actors in this conflict are uh, left wing guerrilla groups uh, and uh, right wing uh, paramilitary groups. Uh, but uh, also importantly, Colombia is a deeply religious country. Uh, today, approximately 70% of the population is uh, Catholic. And uh, or Colombia has experienced in the last uh, decades an intense increase in religious uh, uh, competition. So uh, this is, has happened also in, in many other countries in, in Latin America and, and other parts of the world. Basically what uh, has happened in Colombia is that uh, identification with uh, Catholicism has significantly declined. And identification with other non-Catholic churches, uh, non-Catholic religions, uh, mostly Protestantism, and uh, specifically Pentecostalism, has significantly increased. So, for instance, in the last two decades, uh, identification with Catholicism was decreasing uh, in around 14 percentage points, and identification with Pentecostalism increased uh, approximately in the same magnitude, or a little bit less. So, uh, so what we do in this paper is specifically in this in this in this context, uh, uh, we ask uh, what could be the role of uh, the religious organizations, and in particular uh, in, in in the scenarios in which uh, 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 you observe an increase in uh, religious uh, in the competition between these organizations, what could be the, the effect on, on political violence. So important for uh, our identification strategy is how we measure uh, 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 religious competition. So. Uh, we focus on the establishment of the first known uh, Catholic church in a uh, Colombian municipality. So uh, this establishment is, uh, we mean, the, by, by this establishment, we mean the, the, that uh, a, a, a first non-Catholic church in a municipality uh, obtains uh, its legal personhood. So uh, we argue that uh, given that uh, the Catholic church has been uh, present in all Colombian municipalities for many years, uh, so uh, it could be a proxy for a uh, religious competition when, when, when our first known Catholic church arrives in, in a municipality. So we also provide some robustness checks uh, related to, to, to this assumption. Uh, so let me give you a preview of the results. So our main uh, the result is uh, that uh, we find that establishing uh, the first known Catholic church in a common municipality increases the probability of an attack by a, a, an armed group, and uh, in particular, a, a left-wing uh, guerrilla group. So this uh, increases approximately nine percentage points. And as an explanation for this result, we propose a, 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 that political violence uh, increases because the armed groups feel threatened by the religious organizations. So uh, our idea is that uh, when uh, these organizations were competing with each other for members, so try to recruit members uh, from the population. And uh, this population uh, uh, includes uh, collaborators of the armed, armed groups. So the idea is that uh, these uh, collaborators may be recruited by these uh, 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 churches. And this uh, 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 implies a, a reaction of the armed groups uh, uh, to reduce the expected loss of this uh, support. This is like a, a main story and we, we try to provide some evidence uh, also consistent with, with it. it. Uh, uh, 
Let me skip this, 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 this slide that I tell you there, if I have time and later I will mention it. So uh, uh, let me say something about uh, our uh, empirical strategy. So we will use an uh, event study specification uh, and estimate the dynamic treatment effects uh, uh, with the staggered treatment uh, adoption. Specifically, we estimate uh, the model that is in this slide. Uh, so the outcome is uh, uh, the probability of a related uh, or conflicted event, for instance, a, an attack by a guerrilla group in a municipality I and, and, and GRT uh, or PUT. Uh, and the main uh, um, uh, independent variables are this IT style. So these are the indicators for being a tau PU relative to treatment. So when treatment is, a, 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 the treatment in our case is the establishment of uh, the first known Catholic church in a municipality. So in the, the specifications, but they are in our main specification, we include the fixed effects for municipality years or periods, uh, uh, and also municipality linear, uh, uh, municipality specific linear trends, department year uh, effects, et cetera, and many other controls, and we focus on in 1996 to 2009 because of data availability, but also we explore robustness to, to uh, alternative data sets that, uh, that, uh, uh, for which we have a longer period. So uh, uh, in our, uh, uh, in this uh, um, empirical strategy, we basically uh, make three assumptions. So the first one is a parallel chain assumption, uh, uh, then we also uh, assume no anticipatory behavior and a co cross cohort homogeneity. But let me just say that uh, uh, to examine the plausibility of the first two assumptions, uh, what they uh, do is to look at the determinants of the arrival of a non Catholic church in a municipality. And we find that the, this arrival is only correlated with previous uh, population size and rurality level and some historical characteristics. Uh, and we argue that we account for this, for this, uh, for this uh, determinants. Uh, also, our argument for, for this identification assumption is based on anecdotal evidence that, that, that scholars that have studied these, these groups in, in more detail uh, show that or argue that uh, uh, most of the Pentecostal uh, churches in Colombia emerged from the initiative of uh, religious leaders who decided to create uh, uh, their own church uh, in, rural, uh, in more rural, small cities. So uh, in Colombia, at least in Colombia, this uh, phenomenon seems to be very local. Uh, and also, uh, uh, we also observe some, some, some random element in the treatment because we look at the, the moment in which the churches obtain their legal personhood, and this is, is, is given by the central government and implies some, 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 some kind of uncertainty, uh, in particular related with, with the timing in which uh, the municipalities uh, uh, obtain this, this, this uh, legal personhood. So, but in addition, but uh, in particular for the uh, no anticipatory behavior assumption, we uh, don't separate an effect uh, uh, of violence uh, of being a uh, thousand uh, years uh, prior to the arrival of an Catholic church. So, uh, so we argue that condition on this covariates, these assumptions uh, and fixed effects, uh, these assumptions closely hold. And finally, for the, for the uh, cross cohort uh, uh, homogeneity assumption, we, we, we show that the results are robust to the two, two alternatives, at least two alternative estimators, uh, alternatives, uh, uh, the estimators are Abraham and Son and Twente and Will Meyer, who is uh, my co-author. Uh, uh, and in these uh, uh, alternative estim estimators, this assumption uh, is not required. So basically uh, we examine robustness at least uh, for the moment for these two alternative estimators. So uh, this is uh, our main uh, result of the paper, the main result of the paper uh, in this figure, uh, but the figure shows uh, uh, the outcome of the defining variable is the probability of an attack by a guerrilla group. Uh, the zero is the moment in which uh, uh, the non Catholic church arrives uh, in Amsplati for the first time. And then uh, what we uh, observe in this, uh, in this uh, graph is that uh, a significant increase in uh, the probability of an attack by a guerrilla group just after the uh, non Catholic, uh, just after the, uh, the non Catholic church established for the first time in a municipality. Uh, um, so this is, uh, I mean, like um, our main result. So in this table, we, we show that uh, uh, this effect is robust to, to alternative specifications with, uh, uh, with or without controls uh, uh, and with or without the municipality specific trends. So and in, in particular in column uh, five here, we observe that this effect is around nine percentage points. Um, uh, 
another uh, like uh, important result is that we look at the, if uh, uh, we find other effects on, on uh, attacks by other uh, groups, in particular by uh, parametric groups. We observe that the, uh, the effect is stronger for guerrilla uh, groups. Uh, and uh, it, it seems to be the case that for parametric groups, uh, it, it is still, there is still an effect, but it is smaller. However, uh, using alternative data set, we found that also an effect for parliamentary uh, uh, groups. Uh, so we focus uh, on uh, what we, we just say that the, the effect is, uh, is stronger for guerrilla groups and, and for parliamentary groups, we cannot say uh, many things, okay? Uh, so these are the, the, the main effects, the main, the main results of the paper. Uh, so we kind of, we also do in the paper is, is the, it, we examine several mechanisms that could explain these results in particular, but, we try to uh, provide evidence in, uh, that supports uh, uh, our uh, preferred mechanism. Uh, uh, as, 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 as I previously said, uh, the mechanism that uh, we think that it is the, the most plausible is uh, the mechanism that is based on the community forming aspect of religion. So the, histor the history of recruitment. So basically what we say uh, is that when a non-Catholic church arrives uh, for the first time in a municipality, so this, this church starts to recruit members uh, from the, uh, uh, the population and this population includes collaborators of the armed groups. So, uh, so these armed groups uh, uh, could be used in violence to prevent uh, or to reduce the expected loss of this support. Uh, so basically what, 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 we, what we do in this paper is to look at uh, if there is anecdotal evidence consistent with this story. And, 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 and we found that uh, it, it is the case. In, in particular, uh, we find that uh, 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 there are many cases in which uh, religious leaders, in particular, uh, the leaders of non-Catholic uh, Catholic churches, discourage activities promoted by armed groups. So we observe uh, 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 leaders of these uh, uh, churches uh, discourage, uh, that they discourage uh, recruitment of young uh, people as soldiers and uh, uh, discourage participation of the population in coca cultivations, which are, uh, which are activities that uh, uh, are important for the, for the armed groups. Uh, so, uh, so we observe, for instance, uh, we have many stories uh, uh, telling that uh, uh, leaders of these churches do these activities, I mean, discourage these activities, and uh, they receive uh, death threats from the armed groups. And, and uh, uh, in particular, we observe in these uh, stories that uh, these threats come from, uh, uh, in general, from guerrilla groups. So uh, to examine the plausibility of this explanation, what we do is to basically to, to, to run some heterogeneous effects for the, for the main results. So uh, first we look at the effect of uh, uh, a first non-Catholic church on the probability of uh, uh, an attack by a guerrilla group, but uh, we distinguish between uh, those municipalities with, with past cases of uh, forced recruitment, the panel on the, on the left, uh, for recruitment by armed groups. In particular, this happens for, for young people in Colombia. And uh, without, and those municipalities without past cases of forced recruitment on the right. So what we find is that the effect is substantially larger for those municipalities with an historical presence of uh, cases of forced recruitment, which is, we argue that this is consistent with, with our story because in these places probably uh, uh, recruit the population is more important for the armed groups. So when a uh, non-Catholic church arrives in a, this municipality uh, probably is, 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 is more, the, the activities are, uh, its activities are more expensive for these armed groups. Uh, and second, what we, what we, uh, what we do uh, is that uh, we uh, look at the, the same effect, but uh, distinguishing between those municipalities with coca crops in the past and without coca crops in the past. Uh, uh, on the left, we, with coca crops in the past, on the right uh, without coca crops in the, in the past. So uh, we found that the effect is substantially larger and in fact specific to do those municipalities with an historical presence of coca crops. So we argue that this is, uh, this evidence is consistent with, with, with our story uh, of, of farm groups uh, uh, being more active or killing more people in those municipalities in which uh, uh, they are more interested in, in, in recruiting the population and the uh, activities of the, of the churches uh, could harm more uh, this, this recruitment. Uh, so finally, the paper, we examine other uh, mechanisms. Uh, uh, where we, uh, 
here, uh, here I, I will just uh, mention uh, two that uh, we have for uh, stories, uh, possible stories. One is uh, ideological differences. So we can think uh, that, uh, for instance, uh, um, um, uh, uh, guerrilla groups are left wing. Uh, non Catholic uh, churches could be right wing. So uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this effect would be just. Uh, 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 because of the uh, ideological differences between these groups. But uh, uh, what we argue is that uh, uh, we still have a, a, an effect, which is a small, but uh, it's still uh, using alternative data sets, it, it still exists uh, for right wing parameters. So uh, probably these, these, these ideological uh, differences could stay part of the results, but uh, we, we, we think that it is not the main, the main, the main explanation. And, uh, and, uh, and an alternative explanation that we, 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 we try to, to, to examine is a, 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 um, a, a possible change in the, in the behavior of the population uh, in a municipality, uh, in, for instance, uh, related to their moral behavior, they become more relaxed uh, morally, and probably we observe more crimes in these municipalities. And then uh, it could be the case that uh, the police resources are exhausted and it could be exploited by the uh, armed groups uh, uh, and then they, 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 they could attack more uh, there in, the, in these places. So, and, and we argue that this, this explanation is it's unlikely because we, we, don't find, we, don't, we, uh, we don't find any effect on, on, on homicides and all kind of crime. So, so it does happen, uh, we cannot observe that at least with our measures, measures of, of crime or, or crimes. So uh, was, okay. So let, let me conclude. Uh, so we uh, we find out that when a non-Catholic church established for the first time in a municipality and attacked by a, arm, an army group, particularly uh, a left-wing uh, guerrilla group, is more like. So we propose an explanation for these results that and provide evidence that is consistent with it that is based on the expectation among armed groups that their, their membership, their membership will decline as a consequence of more intense competition uh, for religions adherence. So as an extension, we are, we are doing all, all the things. This is also a, a work in progress. So we are looking at the outcomes, fiscal outcomes, electoral outcomes, uh, and, and we are trying to look at more the, the long or medium term effects. For, for, for the main result, we only have short term effects. So this is something that uh, for the moment we are, we are trying to, to look at more in detail. So uh, that's uh, it. Uh, thank you uh, for, uh, for listening. Thank you, Hector. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Very interesting paper. Yeah. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, well, uh, Hector, I'm very familiar with the Guatemalan case, and I, that's okay. why I was really fascinated with your paper. Um, so I, I thought about the point about ideology. Um, actually, the Hostels, at least in Guatemala, are non-political. So mm -hmm. the idea would be not so much that they were taking sides in the armed conflict, but that they they didn't have a side. Um, so I, I, I just thought I'd make that comment. There's a book by David Stoll, Between Two Armies in the Shield Triangle, where he talks about, this, about how the indigenous populations were trying to stay out, being recruited by either side, by the government or by the, the military and paramilitary groups. Um, the other interesting point, you, you I, I wasn't quite clear about the moral point. Um, it seems to me that these Pentecostal groups would object more to the moral issue than the to political issue in the sense that they're very strict about not drinking, not smoking. So anything involved with coca, any kind of, you know, like in Guatemala, anything involved with the, with the drug would, would be the main reason why they wouldn't want to get involved. Not, not any political, but rather they, they wanted to stay out. But the minute that any moral issue came up, um, they would, that would cause them to be able to recruit individuals. Um, and very much like gangs, I, I find that the, the, um, those who convert out of a violent out, out of the guerrillas or out of a gang um, into a Pentecostal church, they, they have to prove themselves. They can't do it falsely. Um, there will be tests that they, that they are sincere about becoming a Pentecostal and, and abiding by it. Um, just some comments from what I'm familiar with in terms of 
uh, an another context about a civil war, Pentecostals begin to move in where there's an armed conflict and the Catholic church has been the dominant, the, the monopolistic church, which in fact did take, has taken sides uh, through action, uh, political action and um, the Jesuits, a very leftist perception. I don't know. I don't know if this no, is no, I agree with you. I mean, th thank you for this framework. In fact, I agree with you. In Colombia, what, what, what happened is more, more or less the same which is that uh, the, the groups usually, these, these, these leaders of these religious uh, uh, groups uh, usually try to be apolitical, right? So try to not, not uh, uh, don't, uh, try, but uh, we still observe uh, that uh, they, 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 say, say, they say to the population, don't go to the, don't, don't, without mentioning directly the groups, I mean, they, 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 they discourage uh, these activities. I mean, they don't say, don't go to the regular groups, uh, but they say don't uh, don't 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 go to work with uh, in coca crops. They they, uh, they they in fact they, they say that I mean according to some anecdotal reasons we have some some cases. They, but you are right that uh, that uh, I mean we don't know how often uh, this, this this happens. Uh, something that we are trying to look at now is uh, if this could explain. I mean this effect of that there could be some effect of learning uh, in the in the in the non-Catholic churches, which means that at the beginning, uh, the, the, the leaders of these uh, churches uh, do start, discourage these activities, and then they receive the, the threats from the, from, the, from the armed groups, the regular groups, and then in the future, they don't do that, okay? So, so probably this is related with, with some of our results, which is that the, is, the effect is, is short-term, but uh, probably in the, in the medium terms, uh, uh, what what this this apolitical uh, dimension could, could could be more important. This is what I'll, I'll, for the moment we, we are looking at that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions, Jared? Yeah. yeah. So sorry, I apologize if you said this. I had to step out for a couple of minutes to deal with some childcare issues. But um, I I want to if you could say a little more about the. And kind of building on Rachel's question, the, the, the choices of when to build a church by these groups. I mean, you show, you, you know, you show pre-trends, which is nice um, and important, obviously, for what, for what you're doing. Um, but I, it, it just seems like, you know, when you're talking about going into potential conflict areas, is this something that is actually on, on top of mind or maybe, maybe the people in that area, because it is a conflict area, might be kind of more prone to, to adopting a new, something like that. Yeah, don't, no, that's is, that's is crucial for our identification strategy. In fact, in, in this slide, I, I, I just showed the, some, some regressions that what we do with pre, observables, pre, pre, pre characteristics of municipalities, uh, observables. So what, what we are looking at is what, what, what we, we, are, we find is that we don't find any, 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 any for instance, if there was an attack by a group before, if there was an attack by a Parliamentary group before we don't find find that these uh, these uh, these uh, variables predict uh, the arrival of a, a non-Catholic church in a, in a municipality, right? The only thing that we we, we also look at the internal displaced population because I mean uh, uh, I mean it, it's, it's hard to believe that this is random, right? Uh, that 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 uh, uh, but uh, what, what what we argue is that uh, at least for, for for all the observables that we could find or like the internal displaced population for, uh, because of army groups, uh, uh, desertion from the guerrilla groups, forced recruitment, local, uh, loc uh, but, uh, what, the, the only thing that we, we, we found is a uh, population, okay? So what we, what we do in the paper, and we, we are, we're still working on that, is that uh, probably uh, uh, what explains the arrival of a, a non-Catholic church in a municipality is that uh, a, 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 a a leader of, of, of the population uh, uh, become uh, became so popular or, or decided to to open a new a new, a new church uh, because they see that in this population it's it's, it's for instance uh, uh, in these populations uh, they are uh, uh, becoming uh, uh, um, uh, more populated I mean in small cities but people uh, go there not 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 because of the armed conflict but because of over resources uh, so in these areas, uh, uh, these leaders decided to create uh, these, these churches. But, uh, that, uh, 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 so what we are finding is that uh, usually this happens in, in regions more often in which uh, uh, the, uh, um, what, what was said about the historical determinants is that uh, um, uh, this happens more often in, in regions in which uh, uh, the traditional political parties 
in Colombia has been less present. So uh, this is historically, what we look at historically is that uh, here we, we, we don't find an effect for the, for the both chair of a liberal and political party, which is political parties in, in, in Colombian municipalities uh, before. But if we look at the uh, long-term trends, so we observe that uh, 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 that this 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 uh, this uh, happens more often in municipalities in which uh, uh, at some point the political system is 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 is, is more open to uh, to other political parties. Okay, this is what we observe now, at, at least uh, 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 regarding some historical trends. So our explanation is is is, is some characteristic uh, physic, uh, fix in the municipality of uh, just for some fixed characteristics, the, 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 the political system there has, is, uh, has been less open. So, uh, uh, or, or, or more often relative, relative to, 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 the, to the municipality. This is our, our explanation that for the moment we have with the, with, with, for, uh, for this arrival. Uh, but regarding all the observables, we, we cannot say that uh, it, it, is, it is correlated with, uh, with, with other uh, with some, some kind of, uh, for instance, we can say that yes, if there are more attacks for the, uh, by the area groups, so people behave differently, people need to uh, uh, probably uh, uh, create more charges. Uh, but we, at least for, for, for this data that we have, we don't observe that. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, have you, have you thought about the fact that the, the Colombian Scenario would be that the Colombian government is recruiting, is is doing forced recruitment as well. So, so over the years, the Colombian government would, at some point in time, would be doing forced recruitment. Then evangelical Pentecostal churches are beginning to move into er rural areas where the the presence of the state is quite low. Mm -hmm. That there's this forced recruitment on the part of the Colombian government. So then, all of a sudden, the guerrilla movements are in a position where they're going to have to start doing forced recruitment because their presence is now going to be threatened. You see, there's kind of a dynamic. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. no, yes, no, I, I understand. I mean, uh, yes. Mm, okay. Yeah, I, I, I think that the, I mean, in the medium and long term, there's some kind of effect like that. Uh, uh, yes. I, my, my, my impression is that it, it, is, it is, I mean, given that these groups try to be apolitical, my impression is that they are not uh, they are not looking specifically to to places in which in which uh, uh, their group is, is is operating or not. I mean, they they, they after that they, they could learn, but uh, I mean uh, uh, probably at the beginning they don't do that. Uh, this is our, our main I mean I mean uh, argument. But uh, yes, you you're right that uh, I mean uh, in, in the data that we have uh, with this uh, empirical specification, we, we cannot do. You look at that, but uh, you are right that it is something important to look at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, any other questions? Any... Yeah. Okay, gracias, Hector. Okay. Thank you. Okay, gracias. <laughs> Very interesting gracias. paper. I'd love okay. to read it. <laughs> so, thank, okay. you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, okay, um, our last presentation is by Caris. Excuse me if I don't say your name. Pronounce it correctly. Please, uh, Doton Snidker. Um, she's going to be speaking on does ideational diffusion explain the witch craze, explaining the spread of witch persecution in early modern Europe? Welcome, Carice. Thank you. I'll go ahead and pull up my slides and start sharing here. We good to go on slides, everyone can see them? Okay. Um, so my name is Carice Stoughton Snitker, uh, pronunciation was spot on. And this work is with uh, Stephen Pfaff. Um, I just graduated from the University of Washington and Steve is on faculty there. Uh, this is a new project for both of us brought on by conversations that we had been having about some recent research, which I will get to in a moment. Now, uh, a fun sort of ASREC thing with this project is we actually started working on this because Steve passed me a note at the 2019 meetings in Boston. And it's been a side project for both of us over the, the past year or so. 
Now, in case you haven't been following him, Steve has had a bumper crop of publications this year on mutiny in the British Navy, uh, religious discrimination in American public schools, and one of his favorite subjects, Martin Luther. So we're now trying to give this project a bit more attention. So let's start with the concept of witches. Who are they? Now, in medieval Europe, before the 16th century, witches were simply people with supernatural powers. Europeans did not inhabit a disenchanted world. For them, the natural world was full of supernatural events, signs, and portents. Um, there's a very common belief in the efficacy of witchcraft, of divination, alchemy, fortune telling, astrology. Uh, Isaac Newton was a noted believer of some of these uh, some of these beliefs. Um, but the, there was also the idea that there could be bad witches, and bad witches were those that used supernatural powers for harm to summon storms, to cause sickness, um, to kill livestock, brew potions, and so on. So in this image here on this slide, we see one such witch that's creating a storm uh, that's wrecking a ship. Now, from the late 15th century on, ideas about witches collided with another part of the cosmological world, the idea that there was a cosmic struggle between godly and diabolical forces playing out in the world. So the concept of witchcraft expanded from being um, people that use magic to mean people using magic for harm and who receive that power uh, through pacts with the devil. So the concept of witchcraft now had two parts. First, through their pacts, witches are servants of Satan who worship him and take part in satanic rituals. Got an image here of one imagined satanic ritual. And second, that witches can be organized into covens who practice satanic rituals together and conspire together to harm others and society. So therefore, witchcraft is a threat to Christian European societies and witchcraft should be stopped. So then people face the question of how can witchcraft and its harms be stopped? And they figured legal proceedings is a great idea. Um, so they thought witches are are heretics who should be examined, tortured, and if found legally guilty, witches should be executed. So now we get to our empirical puzzle. So there's widespread popular belief in witchcraft in medieval into early modern Europe, but organized witch hunts were actually uh, pretty unusual. So there are a couple of reasons for this. Uh, for one thing, witch hunting was an organized judicial operation that uh, involved both secular and ecclesiastical elites. So you needed a, a reasonable amount of coordination and agreement there between those two groups. And also accusations came usually from below, but prosecution was selected and pursued from above. You end up uh, with substantial temporal and spatial variation in the persecution of witches. So now we're gonna loosely bin explanations uh, for witch hunting into two camps, a supply side camp and a demand side camp. On the, on the supply side, um, you have one uh, group of scholars that focus on uh, governments lacking enforcement instruments to direct or restrain witch hunting. And therefore you, they argue that you get more witch hunting in weak states uh, where these types of enforcement instruments uh, are not available or just capacity isn't there to enforce anything. Um, and then there's another argument from the religious economy's perspective that uh, during times of uh, interfaith religious competition, like during the Reformation, uh, you get groups pushing social reform efforts like witch hunting. On the demand side, um, there's demand for witch hunting because of scapegoating episodes when natural calamities happen that moral outsiders might be blamed for things like a bad harvest. What we're focusing on um, is diffusion and particularly in this presentation on ideational diffusion that the new concept of witchcraft and new inquisitorial procedures spread across time and place because of new print media increasing demand for persecution. So to simplify things just a little bit more, um, got a quote here from uh, the fantastic Johnson and Koyama book from last year, uh, that the persecution of witches required a system that treated those suspected of witchcraft differently than those suspected of more mundane crimes. So there's a focus there on the system itself and what's in place that can supply uh, witchcraft trials. Um, and then on the demand side, 
what we're thinking about is that the proponents of the new ideology of witchcraft called for legal innovations for the prosecution of witches, either by new laws or relaxing existing standards of evidence. So this new ideology framed witchcraft as a societal problem and not simply the crime of ignorant lone practitioners of witchcraft. And it provided justification for persecution of witches by secular magistrates and not just by uh, religious inquisitors. So let's talk a little bit about ideational diffusion and what we mean by that. Now diffusion refers to the spread of innovations, whether of ideas, institutions, norms, or policies across space and time. The basic insight of sociological diffusion, we're both sociologists, um, is that actors closest to the proponents of a novel idea or practice will be more likely to adopt it and will do so more swiftly than those who are distant from it. So ideational diffusion refers to the diffusion of new information and ideas which may be adopted or emulated through exposure. And ideas and innovations that appear to be more useful and more legitimate would be more likely to spread. In this case, we're gonna focus on how printing helped learn beliefs to spread more broadly and rapidly. Now, uh, Gutenberg introduces movable type printing in Europe around 1450, that brings, uh, brings about a new world of print capitalism. We've uh, heard a couple other papers about that already today. Um, and Malleus Maleficarum is the first printed witch hunting manual. It was authored by a Dominican theologian and inquisitor, Heinrich Kramer, uh, with contributors by a Cologne theologian, Jakob Sprenger. The first publication was in 1487. Um, we've got a picture of the, the title page there that's on the left. Um, there were 20 editions published by 1520 and a further 16 between 1574 and 1669. And then you've got the, the other title page image here is from 1669. So Malleus Maleficarum was the most important text in defining and disseminating the elaborated concept of witchcraft. It helped to unite popular superstitions with a literate conception of legitimate and growing threat to godly society. Witch hunting was not, so, not spontaneous. Uh, as I mentioned, it was an organized judicial affair. So you needed these two things to come together. Influential actors um, endorsing this sort of idea of witch hunting as well as the uh, changing superstition about what witchcraft was. Malleus Maleficarum is unique uh, because it provided what, why, and how of what an organized witch hunt was. So it was criminological, it defined the crime of witchcraft, defined its methods, and defined its motives. It was theological in that it defined witchcraft as heresy um, and explained why an upsurge in wit witchcraft would be expected as part of, of a satanic conspiracy. And it was practical. It reported effective inquisitorial and judicial techniques for the prosecution of witches, including explaining why it was necessary to torture and use irregular methods and standards of evidence. So it really legitimized uh, witch hunting. The, the first edition has uh, what is a forged papal bull uh, in the cover of it that uh, approves prosecution of witchcraft. So you really see these things uh, coming together. And there was very little uh, actually organized witch, witch hunting before the publication of Malleus Maleficarum. So this seems to be the seminal text for that. Okay, so let's get to some hypotheses. Short form, this is what we're thinking about. Um, that more people will be tried closer in time and space to the publication of Malleus Maleficarum or to similar texts, closer in time and space to other witchcraft trials. Um, we didn't talk about that too much, but we'll, we'll still show some results from that. Closer in time and space to confessional battles, that's the, that's, um, the religious competition argument, and then uh, in places where there are climate shocks, uh, which is that scapegoating argument. Now we don't, at, the, at this point, I'll get to this later also, uh, we don't yet have data on examining the weak state theory of witch hunting, so we're gonna ignore that for the moment. Uh, and hopefully at a later date, we'll be able to present some results about that. So how do we test these ideas? Um, first of all, on the left here is a map of trials in the blue T's, battles in green B's, and then uh, the red P's are Malleus Maleficarum printing locations. Um, so you can see they're, they're kind of spread all over the place there. There's only nine places where Malleus Maleficarum was printed. Um, but uh, so how we're gonna test these ideas is we're gonna use an approach that will model trial outcomes as a distribution of spatial and temporal variation in demonological printing, confessional battles, and climate. 
So we choose to use um, Bayesian negative binomial regression. Um, this lets us use a conservative count model um, and be more confident than we would potentially be with a Poisson model for our estimates. Um, we have a lot of non-normality in some of our dependent and definitely in our independent variable or some in our dependent and definitely in, in um, anyways, <laughs> um, I'll get to that in a moment when I show you some uh, descriptive statistics. Um, and uh, we're going to use some lag measures to get at that spatial and temporal dependence. And we're also going to use a hierarchical specification uh, because some cities have multiple trials, even multiple uh, trials in a single year, and we need to account for unmeasured city level uh, variation. So we're going to do partial pooling by city. So our dependent variable is persons tried. Uh, we take the witchcraft trials data that's been compiled by uh, Lisa and Russ and make some adjustments to it um, and end up with uh, a data set that uh, is organized by location and by year um, so that for each year and location, we get the number of people that were tried there. Um, and then in independent variables uh, for ideational diffusion, uh, we collect malleus maleficarum printing locations and the number of surviving copies from the universal short title catalog, which uh, I've seen pop up already in this, uh, in this online conference. Um, so it's, it's used by multiple people uh, in, this, in this world for doing these sorts of things. And we're also gonna look at five other printed demonological texts. For all of those, um, we're gonna look at how many editions, how many copies were, were made in the past 10 years of any particular year. And then we're gonna weight that by distance. I can explain uh, specifically about that in Q and A if, uh, if people are interested. And we'll do the same thing looking at all copies of demological texts, um, both in the past 10 years and then uh, weighting that by distance. For social diffusion, uh, we're gonna look at how many people were tried in the past 10 years. Um, in, and that's in a city or in any other city. Um, and then we'll do uh, distance weighting for that as well. So it, in total, we get to um, almost 15,000 individuals tried uh, within this time period. And we're gonna be looking um, based on what we do with the lags, it's ended, gonna end up being um, 1311 to uh, 1650. That's gonna be across 797 locations. So we use, and then moving on, so we use the confessional battles from Lisa and Russ. Um, we do the same thing again with calculating how many battles happened in the past 10 years and then uh, distance weighting those to every trial location. Um, and then we include the growing season temperatures from the previous year's uh, growing season um, from the community climate systems uh, 4.0 model. Okay, getting to our results. Um, so I, I do want to make a note here that um, prior to doing any of these analyses, we did scale all these variables to be centered around zero and um, with uh, and scaled to standard deviation equals one. So that helps us uh, both computationally and also with interpreting the results. So these are posterior, posterior um, uh, distributions here. And what you're looking at is something that is like looking at a posterior median, median is, your, uh, is your coefficient. And then we're looking at the intervals around that 50% and 89% uh, intervals. Um, so at the top there, those first two roles, uh, th first two um, uh, lines is looking at, uh, just looking at malleus, uh, maleficarum copies. So we see that more copies printed in the past 10 years uh, is connected to uh, more persons tried. We see that uh, more copies printed nearby is also connected to more persons tried. Uh, moving down uh, to think about social diffusion, more people tried recently and more people tried recently nearby, also connected to, uh, uh, to trials of more people. Uh, in this model, we're not seeing any connection at all to the religious economies theory that it's going to be um, some connections to uh, confessional battles. And we do see the, um, the relationship between temperature and persons tried in that um, when temperatures are warmer, uh, when there's a better growing season, um, you see fewer people tried. So we did, uh, today we're presenting results for just the, just looking at um, publication of Malleus Maleficarum, and then uh, looking at any demonological text that was printed. Um, so moving to this second model, um, we substitute again, like I said, the 
it just in those top two rows, we change from Malleus Maleficarum to any demonological text. Um, and uh, the results are generally similar, but we've got two noteworthy exceptions. So whereas Malleus Maleficarum additions were related to the number of people tried, um, that's that top line, in the first uh, graph that I showed you, in model two, the general printing of uh, demonological text is not con connected to trials. However, the spatial relationship um, for the number of, of copies printed uh, is connected to trials. So it seems like maybe uh, Malleus Maleficarum had an effect all its own in spurring trials broadly, um, but the printing any demonological text was related to trials nearby. The second difference between the two um, results is that in this model, we see that confessional battles were related to the prosecution of, wit of witches. But instead of confirming the positive correlation found by Leeson and Russ, we observe a negative relationship between increasing proximity to recent confessional battles and the number of people tried for witchcraft. Um, so that, that leads us to wonder if the spatiotemporal patterns picked up by Leeson and Russ are actually picking up the ideational and social diffusion that we are observing. So to wrap things up, uh, attempting to trace the vectors of social change helps us to understand variation in behavior and processes of cultural change are better modeled by accounting for social influence between units of observation here between trial locations. There's been a, a recent flurry of papers and blog posts about, ge about geography and proximity, what they mean and how they impact social scientific research that typically is not based on building in dependence among uh, observations across units of analysis. So I hope that we've convinced you of one approach to doing this and that there are strong theoretical motivations and not only methodological benefits for working social influence into your research. Uh, so like I said at the, at the outset, this is a, a project that is very much in process and we've got a list of the other things that we want to do. Um, the first and foremost among these is of course to be uh, working in legal and political institutions since there's a very strong case um, for including that. So we're, we're going back and forth, Steve and I, on what things we wanna use uh, to measure this. Um, the second thing that we want to do uh, is work in some uh, sort of baseline measures to um, exposure to different cultural flows, normalizing to participation in printing culture overall. Um, and then also thinking about uh, centrality in trade networks um, and whether uh, some places were more prone to diffusion because they were um, more incorporated into uh, trade networks. And lastly, um, one thing that we're thinking about is whether demonological texts spurred trials or whether trials spurred demand for demonological texts. Uh, uh, just looking at, at the data, it seems like both things might be happening, but at different time periods, um, that maybe there's an, an initial um, Malleus Maleficarum is spurring trials, and then later on there's an upswing in, in trials, and that spurs a second round of um, publishing demonological texts. So that's where we're at right now. And we're looking forward to uh, hearing your questions. Great. Thank you, Carice. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Jared. Hi, hi Carice. Uh, that was great. Um, so mine, just a, a quick comment on something you might want to, to think about to, I think, increase the, the real power of your result. On, on the Malleus, is it Malleus Malcarum uh, text? Maleficarum. Maleficarum. We'll call it Malleus. Malleus. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so so the, the idea is that that book was really important. Um, you might think about placebo books, say maybe take a top 50 books that were published around that time in various places and run the same exact tests. This wouldn't be hard to do. You have the USCT data. Um, USTC data that uh, that you you could do this with, and, f and if you showed that you know if it doesn't work for any of those books, or maybe it works for you know five percent because that's what we might expect randomly. That's that would I think really in in increase the uh, the power of your result. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. We'll have to look at the other uh, there are lists out there, so we'll, we'll pull some and see what else we can compare it to. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Julius, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. And uh, thank you very much for the really interesting and fascinating talk. Uh, I was wondering whether the printing locations of the Malleus Maleficarum uh, would also pick up some of the other forces at play here. So 
you might expect that book to be printed maybe at that place with a lot of religious competition. And um, so I was wondering if you could um, control for that additionally, or maybe you also have a story why that came up with that place, which might just be ex exogenous to the whole process. Yeah, so Steve knows a lot more about this than I do. Uh, so we'll hopefully answer the question well. Um, so far as uh, we've discussed, it doesn't seem like there's something particularly about religious competition that's connected to um, printing. I mean, certainly people have found connections between printing and religious and competition. Uh, but as far as the actual locations of where that's happening, um, you know, these are two different processes. Um, that are driving them. One is, is related to print capitalism and um, where printers are and where they choose to locate and what the demand is locally. And then on the other side of things, you have um, what's going on religiously and these uh, religious debates that are happening. Um, so we, we don't have, we can certainly look at that more, but at, at, the, at the outset, um, it doesn't look like that is the case for this text specifically. Uh, so thank you. Oh, sorry, uh, Chris. Um, in, I'm I'm kind of fuzzy. Is is Malleus? I'm sorry if I. <laughs> it, it, so in in terms of evolving doctrine on demonology, so it it could go two ways. It could become more orthodox. It could become more strict over time, and that might have an effect, or it could devolve and become more populist. And I'm wondering. With these other texts, what have you thought about that? What's happening with is his like more a doctrinal, like clear on the doctrine, has biblical references, and then over time it devolves, it becomes more of a populist type phenomenon. So I'll answer this a, a couple ways. Um, I don't know that I have a clear answer, but I'll try. Um, so portions of Malleus Maleficarum get reprinted in other texts, first of all. So you have other people um, that are sort of, they notice there's this trend, they also have ideas, and they're putting out their taking ideas from Malleus Maleficarum and adding on their own ideas. Um, so that's not necessarily um, a change in it being from one, one specific um, agreement on what the doctrine is to multiplying agreements or to sort of democratizing that. Um, but that there's a conversation that's happening and people building um, as this goes through time, you know, in, in as later editions or, or later texts are being published, you have people building on these original ideas and um, potentially elaborating more. Um, so that's not necessarily, uh, like I said, it's not necessarily moving from there being agreement to this is the, like the canonical this is what a witchcraft trial is, and this is what the theological foundation is to um, having disagreement about that or something like that, but more um, that you have local in different areas, people saying, well, I'm going to take that and then we're going to add on this other piece to it. And that doesn't necessarily change it um, so much as pr provides maybe, you know, you start out with the, the Dominicans and then you move to um, another religious tradition and they're, they're adding on their other particular interpretations and maybe codifying the things that they've been doing all along. So it's less, it's less making it, uh, moving it from top to bottom than uh, sort of fanning out the top. That's a really poor metaphor, but that's how I'm thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just, I'm just thinking of the opposite. So if you think of sanctity as the opposite of being demonology, uh, you would think that, um, over the course of history in the Catholic Church, sanctity has become more diffuse. Uh, it has actually become more secular in, in a way to adapt to contemporary conditions. Um, I was just wondering if there was a similar, yeah, you know, so then you would have different consequences. You'd be, end up having more saints. You'd end up having different kinds of saints and different types of martyrs. And so I was just wondering if there was a similar thing. That's all, I was just wondering about that. Yeah. Not that I know of. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know how to make this smaller, but let's see if I can do it. Okay, so I think it's Steve Pfaff. <laughs> he says, later books after Malleus also printed in secular languages shift from usage by theologians to secular authorities, such as magistrates. 
He also, I told him he could text me while I was talking and he texted me the same thing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. There is that, that switch that does happen. And we, um, we presented this at a conference um, pre COVID and uh, we actually had a conversation with someone about that, that it, at first, you know, this is definitely getting printed in Latin. And there was the, the previous uh, presentation earlier today about that, this switch from printing in Latin and to, pr to printing in vernacular, vernacular languages. And that did happen with, with Malleus and also with other texts. Um, we have one that's in our data set that is actually in English, all the rest of them are in uh, Latin, um, at least the ones that we're looking at. But there is, there is that shift um, that, that might be something like you're talking about that is bringing things uh, closer to the people that are engaging with it. Right, and it, and it has a causal effect. It actually produces something because of that, that shift. You, you may mm -hmm. see more trials, you may see different types of people being tried, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, any more questions? Yeah, Jared. Yeah, so I, I want to just ask something I know I've talked about with Steve in the context of Martin Luther. Um, you know, there's this great book, Brand Luther, which talks a lot about how the printers around the Reformation loved Luther because printers prior to Luther had to know that they were going to have a lot of sales before taking on the large capital investment up front to, to, run, a, to run a print run. You know, they, they essentially, they, you know, they, it was a really expensive thing to do. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering in the case of Malleus Maleficarum, how, uh, how quickly after these print runs happen, or how, how do, we, do we have an idea about how quickly after these print run ha runs happened, you would have a witch trial? Because I mean, I could also think that, you know, a, a local printer is saying, all right, this is, this, this is a place primed for a witch trial. I know I'm going to sell 2000 copies of this book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so just, just looking at the just essentially looking at sort of the histograms of it, it's not, it's not a super fast turnaround. Um, so the looking overall at um, when you get, there's an early spike in Malleus Maleficarum, but there isn't an immediate spike. And it's actually not a spike in uh, witch trials. You sort of get this um, low level bump in witch, in witch craft trials that happens after the first printing of Malleus Maleficarum. And the, um, why I mentioned in the presentation that I, I wonder about this relationship between um, printing as, and demand and trials um, is that towards the, the latter half of things, um, getting into the 17th century, there, is, there are definitely spikes in trials and spikes in printing that are more connected to each other. Um, but when we look at printing for, for all any demonological texts, um, not just Malleus Maleficarum, that's when we lose that more printing um, relationship between uh, persons tried and edition. So I, I can't say this with a, a firm, this is what I think is happening, but it, it might be the case that we're getting that Malleus Maleficarum link from the original bump in Malleus uh, printing, and then this um, sort of low level bump that happens afterwards where there's very few trials and then you actually start having trials that it seems like people are finding some use for this. Uh, uh, I, th I think it's a, a good point though. Uh, Thanks. Interesting. Well, and I don't know if we have time for one more quick question. If not, or, or the clock's ticking down. So I wanted to thank uh, Carice, Hector, Max, and Eva for their great presentations on this panel today. And I hand it over to Jared. All right, thank you, Rachel. That was that was a that was a great thank session. Um, and I want to remind everyone that um, you know use the Q and A function if you're um, if if you're attending this to ask questions, and we'll we'll answer or we'll ask them after the presentation is over. Um, in the interest of time, let me hand it off to Angela Cools. Okay, great, thank you. Share. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Great. Um, so thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk about my work on megachurch scandals and pro-social behavior. So the motivation for this project is that megachurches are gaining increasing prominence in the US religious landscape. So they're generally defined as Protestant churches with at least 2000 people in attendance each week. 
And the raw number of these churches has grown from only 50 in 1970 to over 1,600 today. And as of the mid 2000s, about 10% of Protestant churchgoers attended a mega church each weekend. These churches also have large budgets, so annually in total, about $7 billion. And they're important avenues through which people engage in pro social or other oriented behavior, um, things such as financial contributions, volunteering, and various service activities. So while these, these churches are important, we have a limited understanding of their causal impact on individual behavior. This is largely because churches don't spring up randomly. Um, they are more likely to be and more likely to be large uh, in places where the population uh, is more religious, has certain demographic characteristics, um, and other things that might in themselves be correlated with a lot of these pro-social behaviors. Um, so in this paper, I'm going to exploit variation in the strength of megachurches introduced by exogenous timing of sex-related scandals to explore the causal effects of these churches. Specifically, I ask, what is the impact of sex-related scandals at large megachurches on itemized charitable contributions and volunteer rates in the surrounding county? To preview my results, I find that an increase in one megachurch scandal per million county residents decreases itemized contributions by 1% annually. In terms of magnitude, this means that in the average county, one additional scandal will equate to a decrease in about $7.5 million in itemized contributions. I also find that an increase in one scandal uh, per million residents decreases religious volunteering by about one percentage point. And interestingly, um, there's no evidence that as people substitute out of religious volunteering that they're substituting into any other form of volunteering. Just to give a, a very brief overview of the, the literature this project relates to. Um, so, you know, it relates to this the very broad literature on the, the causal impact of um, religion and religious shocks on individual behavior and attitudes um, in contemporary world. Um, just a few papers in that very large literature noted here. And it more directly uh, relates to the literature on the, the Catholic sex abuse scandal, literature finding that places particularly hard hit by the Catholic sex abuse scandal in the early 2000s uh, saw decreased rates of people affiliating with Catholicism, actually increases in, in the rates of affiliation with certain dissimilar denominations, um, and also saw decreases in charitable contributions. Um, measured by itemized um, contributions. And interestingly, in terms of charitable contributions, um, the Catholic sex abuse scandal seem, seemed to have effects that grew larger over time. So um, the immediate effects of the Catholic sex abuse scandal on contributions were relatively minimal, but over time, um, they became more pronounced. So in this paper, relative to the previous literature, um, I'm looking at U.S. As Protestants, primarily evangelical Protestants, who are you know, different from Catholics along a number of dimensions, uh, different in their baseline um, contributions and, and pro-social behaviors. Um, and also I'm dealing with a different type of scandal. Um, so a lot of scandals within megachurches are focused on things like infidelity um, that might result in a resignation, but wouldn't necessarily involve um, a lawsuit. Um, this paper also focuses on a more recent time period. So the US religious landscape has changed a lot in the past 20 years with an increasing fraction of people um, not affiliating with a, with a particular religious group. And so effects of negative shocks um, to religion may be different during this time period. I'm also able to uh, directly examine the impacts on volunteering behavior. So to go into a bit of detail about how the uh, data set was collected. So we began with um, the, the Hartford Institute's databases of database of mega churches. So since the early 2000s, Hartford Institute has been collecting this, this database on mega churches in the US. Um, for the first run of this project, restricted it to just the larger mega churches in this database. So those that had over 3000 in weekly attendance. Um, as of the early mid 2000s, this was 451 churches. And then for each of these churches, um, Google searches were run with the church name, church city, and one of 10 different keywords. 
listed here, so sex, sexual molestation, abuse, affair, infidelity, adultery, immorality, scandal, and allegations. So on the first page of the search results was examined. Um, any article relating to some kind of accusation at the church was read, and this accusation was examined more to find the date that this accusation first became public, either through a church announcement or some news article, or some other way, and that date was recorded. Um, we only included accusations against people with former formal affiliations with the church, so pastors, other employees, or official volunteers, include, excluded uh, accusations against people without a formal role at the church. Um, there are a number of megachurches that had name changes over the course of the 2000s, uh, and so for these we ran the, the full search with the 10 keywords with both the original and new name. Uh, we also only included accusations at the main or original campus of the church. Some of the megachurches have various satellite locations um, and we're focused on the years uh, 2000 to 2019. So just to give you a, a geographical picture of the data, um, so as I said, there are 451 large megachurches in the data set and they're across 181 US counties. Uh, as you can see uh, from this map, megachurches are primarily a southern and western phenomenon, uh, although there are some in the Midwest as well. Um, this is largely because they primarily draw from an evangelical population base. Um, they also tend to be concentrated in larger metropolitan areas. Um, you know, they just need the, a, a large enough population to support this big of a church. So conditional on the location of mega churches, the location of scandals is pretty uh, evenly spread out. Um, so these are the, the scandals per capita in each um, different area where the darker colors represent more scandals. Um, so there's no kind of geographic something here. Similarly, the scandals seem to be e pretty evenly spread across time, um, the most number of scandals uh, in 2000. Okay, so combining, I combined this information on um, scandals and the database of scandals with county demographic information from the Euro Census Bureau, and then for the contributions um, regressions with itemized charitable contributions data from the IRS statistics of income from 2004 to 2017. So advantages and disadvantages of using itemized contributions, um, the advantages are it's hopefully accurate, um, represents the whole population level. The, the downside is that obviously not all households itemize their returns and higher income households are much more likely to itemize their returns, meaning the effects that I'm picking up here are predominantly the effects of megachurch scandals on higher income households. So if lower income households have a different response in terms of their contributions behavior, that's not necessarily something that would be picked up with this analysis. Um, however, if what you're interested in is the total amount of contributions, this is a pretty good proxy because households that itemize do make up over 80% of total giving. Um, for the, the final sample, I use counties that are you know, relatively similar to each other, so counties that have at least one mega church and at least 100,000 people. Um, this gives 166 counties over 14 years. So here are some summary statistics on what the data looks like. The means um, are presented in columns one and two. Um, for column one, it is all the counties that do not have a scandal over this time period. Column two represents the counties that do. Um, and then the, the difference in the counties, the T stat and P value of the difference. So as, as you'll notice, and as, as would be expected, um, you know, places are more likely to have a scandal if they have more churches, more churches per capita, and more people. Um, so if, if churches are bigger and, um, you know, there are more of them, there's just kind of more likely to more opportunity for a scandal to happen. Um, along other measures, though, such as the unemployment rate um, or per capita adjusted gross income, these areas are, um, are relatively similar. However, um, you know, because these areas seem a little bit different, especially places with more scandals are just likely to be, be a bit bigger, most importantly, um, I obviously don't want to just compare um, the outcomes of scandal and non-scandal counties. Um, so instead, this is the estimation 
uh, estimating equation that I'm going to use. Um, so the dependent variable is a log of itemized contributions in the county. The main independent variable would be the number of scandals to date. So between the year 2000 and um, time T, I will control for um, a variety of county demographic characteristics, um, so fraction female of various races and various age categories. Um, your fixed effects will quote, account for differences over time. County fixed effects will account for those baseline differences between counties. Um, and county linear time trends will account for the fact that you know, maybe counties that end up having more scandals are trending differently than other counties over time. Um, the cells will be weighted by county population in 2000 to reflect the behavior of the average person rather than the average county. So the identifying assumption here is that scandals are exogenous to another nonlinear change um, that are effect that's affecting contributions at the county level. Um, so the type of thing that I might be worried about that would violate this assumption would be if there are kind of underlying economic conditions or religious changes um, that actually lead to either people being more likely to engage in a scandal or um, you know, more investigative reporting of a scandal. Um, and so I will show an event study and placebo test um, that hopefully provides some evidence against this. So here are the main results. Um, in column one, uh, I only include fixed effects and linear time trends. Column two adds controls for um, county adjusted gross income and unemployment rate, as well as county population. And then column three adds the full set of demographic controls, so gender, race, and age controls in the county. Um, as you'll see, the coefficient is similar across all three. Um, three columns and it gains precision as more controls are added. In terms of magnitude, so one additional scandal per capita decreases contributions by about 1%. Um, as I said in the intro, this means that um, you know, one additional scandal in the average county will decrease contributions by about $7.5 million a year. Um, this number, so to kind of put this number in context, um, Willow Creek Community Church in Chicago had a large scandal in 2018 um, where the, the pastor was accused of sexually harassing various employees. And as a result, they said that their budget shortfall that year um, was going to be about $30 million. So um, obviously they're getting you know, income from other sources other than contributions, but it does suggest that um, an average effect of around $7 million is reasonable or $7.5 million is reasonable. Um, so I mentioned before that um, for Catholic sex abuse scandals that the effects appeared to get larger over time. So the immediate effects were relatively small, um, but that the effects became larger over time in terms of charitable contributions. And so I um, also split this analysis up into the short term and longer term effects. Um, and interestingly, the actually in the mega church case, the effects do appear to be relatively um, immediate. So within zero to two years after the scandal, contributions have already declined by 1%. Um, the coefficient gets a little bit noisier three or more years out, but it doesn't appear to have, have changed after that substantially. Okay, so, um, so I mentioned the two types of thing or the types of things that I'm worried about in terms of my identification strategy, um, in particular, whether there's some kind of religious change or pro-social behavior change going on that's actually driving the scandal. Um, and so to address this, uh, I look at an event study using the full specification, the column three specification here, um, and variables for the, the number of years before and after the scandal, with one year before the scandal um, being the omitted category. As you'll we'll see here, um, there's really no evidence of a pre-trend, no evidence of kind of declining pro-social behavior before the scandal. Um, but once the scandal hits, there's a pretty immediate decline in contributions, and this level um, remains kind of depressed for um, the remaining sample period after. Um, another thing that I mentioned, you know, that you could be potentially concerned about would be underlying economic conditions affecting both of these things. And so I do a placebo test looking at the impact of these scandals on adjusted gross income. So you'd expect to see no effect here if my identifying assumptions are good. 
Um, and in fact, the event study shows that kind of across the, the scandal timeframe, there's really no evidence that AGI, I was changing AGI is very full across the, the timing when the scandal takes place. Okay, so a couple other you know, checks I did. Uh, so, so one was, a, you know, I said I had included linear time trends to account for the fact that counties with and without scandals may be trending differently in their behavior. Um, and so in column one here, I run the full specification, but remove those linear time trends. Um, you know, the coefficient is a little bit less sig significant and slightly smaller. Um, but um, of the same, um, kind of in the same ballpark. Um, in column two, rather than I allow counties to actually trend quadratically before, uh, before the scandal, and in that case, um, the coefficient actually becomes slightly larger. Um, column three, so as I said before, these estimates are population weighted. Uh, so you know, one concern might be that really big counties, especially LA County, is driving this data set um, since LA is, is twice as big as the next largest county in the data set. So just wanted to make sure that the results hold if I exclude LA County, and they do. And then in the fourth column, um, if I kind of run the regression in an unweighted way, um, the results again are similar, indicating that these results are not just coming from what's happening in a couple big counties. Okay, and then the, the next step um, is to look at data from the current population survey volunteer supplement. So between the years 2002 and 2015, um, people who were in the September current population survey were asked a series of supplemental questions about their volunteer behavior. Specifically, they were asked, did you volunteer in the past year? And if so, for what type of organization? So I create dummy variables, it's one if you volunteered, zero if you didn't, and then one and zero for various types of organization. So the final sample for this is over 300,000 individuals. Um, there are 127 counties that can be identified in the CPS and have a megachurch. For this, I run a linear probability model using the most complete specification from the charitable contributions, regressions, plus uh, individual controls, since this regression is at the individual level for gender, race, um, number and age of children, employment, education, and age. So here again, tendent variable in column one is one if you volunteered at all in the past year and zero otherwise, two is um, for a religious organization, and so on. Um, and so consistent with there being a negative impact of scandals on um, the kind of religious landscape in these counties, um, there's both a short and long-term impact of scandals on religious volunteering. So um, an increase in one scandal per million decreases religious volunteering by, by about one percentage point. That's a pretty big effect on a mean of 9.3% um, um, as you can see in the bottom here. Um, interestingly, there, you know, there's also a small decline in civic volunteering. Um, you know, there may be fuzzy boundaries between uh, religious and civic volunteering. Civic volunteering includes things like ethnic organizations or um, can include things like Boy Scouts or things that might um, be associated with churches. Um, I think another interesting thing to point out is that there is no um, kind of um, evidence that people are substituting out of religious volunteering and into other forms of volunteering. And the, this is what the event study looks like for religious volunteering. So again, um, not you know, evidence of, of a pretrend before this, religious volunteering is pretty flat before the scandal um, takes place. And then after the year of the scandal um, immediately declines at about one percentage point. So overall on um, this paper, I use a newly collected data set to examine the impact of megachurch scandals on pro-social behavior. Find that an additional scandal per million residents decreases itemized contributions by 1% per year. And scandals also decrease religious volunteering and there's no evidence that people substitute into other forms of volunteering. So this paper provides some evidence on the causal impact of Protestant religiosity in the US on pro-social behaviors. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. So uh, as a reminder, you know, use the Q&A function. Um, I will take the first question while we're, while we wait for some questions to come in. I really wish, uh, I know Dan Hungerman had a, 
had an obligation this morning. I'm, or this, I guess it's now afternoon. Um, I'm sure he would have loved this paper. Um, uh, I have two clarification questions. One just is a kind of minutia clarification question. You had 3.2 million as your average county population for for places with scandals. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Uh, population weighted averages. Yeah. Oh, so that's not the, but that's the, the average population. I, I, don't, I don't think that's possible for 50. There's only a few counties in the United States that have more than 3 million people. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, yes. Yeah, so it's, it was weighted by population. Like the summary statistics were also weighted. Okay. So it's like uh, for the, the average person. So, so the average person lives in a county with that many people, if that makes sense. Uh, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't really matter. Um, my, my other question is how, wh what is the definition of a scandal? And, and another thing to think about when thinking about what the definition of a scandal is, is you know, it, or rather, is it when it's kind of reported in the newspapers? Is it something that people might have known about for a long time, like this guy was a creeper and they knew about it and then two years later it comes out? Um, I guess I just want to know is like, how, how, how are you defining it for this paper? For the sake of this paper? Yes, so yeah, so, so I'm, you know, defining it as the first evidence that something became public. So in a lot of cases, the church makes an announcement, um, you know, in more recent times, it's actually kind of moved closer to the person was also fired at the same time or something, but that the church makes an announcement of this going on or something. Um, so the actual accusation might have happened a year or two before the actual behavior might have even happened before that. Um, but the real thing that should have the impact is the accusation becoming public, although there, there's a possibility that there may be smaller um, impacts kind of, of, of a few people knowing before that. Got it. And, and are there, is there heterogeneity in the type of scandal that you see too? Um, so I have not finished fully coding that yet, slash my RAs have not finished um, coding that yet, but I, I definitely um, want to look into it um, in terms of whether the effects are different from the type of scandal. Um, in terms of, you know, just looking at the data, what we've seen there, you know, um, the scandals kind of range, right, from infidelity to, you know, child molestation issues to various other things kind of in between those two. Um, but yeah, that's something I hope to look at in the future. I'm sorry, I, there is another question, but I just wanted to push on this. Are, are there also economic scandals like, you know, stealing from the church or misappropriation of money? Because I'd imagine that that, I, ex ante, I actually don't know which way it would go, which one might have more impact. Um, but I think that would be an interesting uh, thing to look at. And yeah. I'm gonna, uh, let Sasha take the next question. You, you asked all my questions already. Um, no, I was also thinking about type of scandal, financial versus uh, mm -hmm. yeah, sexual stuff. Because it seems evangelicals are pretty forgiving about bad behavior, looking at mm -hmm. Trump. Um, and so I'm, yeah. Would you also say that the effect size is economically big or small? Um, yeah, I, I don't know that I necessarily have a, have a feel on whether it's, um, it's bigger. So I think certainly in terms of, you know, I mean, seven and a half million dollars is pretty large, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, contributions, I, I don't have a, a great feeling on that. I don't know. Do you have, um, Ideas no, I was wondering what they could benchmark come up with a yardstick of some kind. Yeah. I don't know. Um, political scandals. How much do party donations go down if mm -hmm. there is fraud? Stuff like that. That's yeah. I, I will look into that. Actually, don't don't know. That's a great great point. All right, so we have two questions coming up. The first one from Alexander Yarkin, and then I'll then I'll read one in the queue. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for great for great talk. Just two, two things to clarify. First, oh, can you turn up your mic a little bit? I can't quite hear you. Can you hear me? Oh uh, yeah. Yep. So uh, the first question is basically 
if I understand correctly, you link scandals spatially to your outcome variable in yes. the same place. Yes. I'm just wondering, how should we think about these kind of spatial effects? For example, could people be attentive to scandals happening elsewhere? And maybe they're even more attentive to like bigger scandals happening elsewhere. And then the second yes. thing, um, since you have individual data on contributions, if we think conceptually of like this, uh, your outcome variable, like these uh, contributions and stuff, mm, and in the religious context, it's like as like a club good thing. So like generally membership in the religion organization is a club good thing. And then when kind of, you know, maybe moral costs of being in this organization in this club are going up because, because of a scandal, I can mm. imagine and I think I heard such stories where basically more committed members are increasing their contribution to the organization you know? mm. and less committed members are getting partial doubt, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like this, yeah. What was this paper um, on Ramadan fasting? I don't remember mm -hmm. who were the authors, but I think they, yeah. they had something along these lines. Um, yep. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, I think the, the first point is, is, is a good point that, um, you know, these scandals are obviously, especially some of the larger ones have national or potentially international um, effects potentially on, on people's, um, you know, affinity with various uh, religious groups. Um, so I did kind of just some, some basic looking at, you know, Google Scholar at various scandals and kind of saw, um, you know, where, where the most searches were. And it, the, the vast majority of searches did seem to be in the surrounding geographic area, um, which increased, you know, to some extent anecdotally, but um, increased my confidence that, that this was a, a primary shock. And, you know, in terms of church attendance, obviously it's primarily going to be people um, in the closer geographic area. But, um, but I think, you know, to the extent that there are contributions coming from people outside of those realms, this, this may actually kind of underestimate the effect um, of, of these scandals on, on contributions. Um, and then, yeah, I think this idea of um, the club good is, is very interesting. Um, and um, I, I'll think a little bit more about how, how to kind of put that in. I'm hoping at some point to get um, general social survey data and do a little bit more with looking at kind of how individuals are responding to this. And that may provide some information on whether you know, some people are becoming more committed and some people less in these circumstances. It's great, thanks. Yeah, thank you so much, thank you. All right, so Andrew, we have three questions and I think in the interest of time, I'm, it, um, uh, we should take all three. And then if you know, you, in the remaining time, you can um, uh, respond to what you can. I will read the first two, then uh, um, Jonathan Miranda Medina will ask one. So the first one is from Marcus Shera. Marcus asks, could you get any information on where people who leave church with scandals go? Do they go to other churches or do they leave church altogether? Could you look for an exodus, I think the pun was intended there, that is reflected in increased attendance in nearby churches? The second one is by anonymous attendee who asks, I may miss some parts, but I'm wondering if you can check whether the effect is larger for females, given that you collect sexual harassment scandals. All right, and then the third one is uh, Jonathan, if you'd like to ask your question. Yeah, um, so the first one is partly uh, related to, to what Jared was saying, just like what is the role of competition if you see heterogeneous uh, effects by how many mega churches are in the area and that drives mm -hmm. uh, some of the results. And then the other is if you've looked at marketing expenditure by these mega churches, so it might be that uh, they're getting uh, affected, but they're increasing marketing. So you might be identifying some form of lower boundary for, for the, the results. If, if you can see it, how do they, how do these churches respond to these scandals to try to mitigate that result? Yeah. One, uh, one minute to do a quick response. <laughs> um, yeah, that's great. I like the idea of looking at heterogeneous effects by you know, how many you know other churches are in the county, um, things like that. Great, um, females versus males. Yes, uh, I will look at that with the volunteer data. Hopefully if I get GSS data, um, so that, that's a very interesting point. Um, and where do people go? Very interesting question. If anybody knows of any place I can get like attendance data or anything like that, please let me know, that would be great. All right, well, thank you. Uh, now, Jonathan, if you'd like to 
uh, go ahead with your presentation. So thanks very much. It's great to be part of this excellent conference. I saw so many fascinating talks and my only challenge was not to stay up all night to watch all of them. And I'm, I'm happy to see that still so many people are here, which are also in time zones, um, which suggests that it's quite late now. So this paper I'm presenting here is together with Max Winkler and Joe Henrik, and we are focusing on innovation and if you think of innovation, then it's clear that this is key for long-term economic growth. Now, if you ask what factors determine innovation, standard economic answers would be, well, it's the resources that go into research and development. More human capital, more research and development, innovation goes up, but also population size. If a constant fraction of the population works in R&D, then you also should get more innovation in large population because in, in innovation is non-rival, information is non-rival. You need property rights which incentivize innovation. And more recently you have a literature which looks at immigration and they find that immigration is positive or is associated with innovation and often the notion there is it's those high skilled, highly motivated people coming from all over the world to the US and then once in the US they contribute to the innovation in the US. And what we want to do here with this project, we want to highlight another aspect and this is diversity. And here we are very much influenced by cultural evolution and the notion or the idea is that innovations of all sorts arise predominantly from the recombination of existing knowledge drawn from individuals and groups which are diverse. So if you have people with different backgrounds interacting, they have different knowledge embedded in them and by interacting, they can exchange this knowledge and they can recombine that, which will then create innovation. So the central hypothesis we want to test with this project is due to its recombination potential, diversity is a key determinant for innovation. Higher informational diversity causes higher levels of innovation. Before we jump into the econometrics, I want to give a simple conceptual framework which helps structuring to think about this whole thing. So assume there's a population and this population consists of n individuals and each individual of uh, this population belongs to exactly one group K and within the group each individual carries a unique piece of knowledge. So what that implies is that within a group everyone has the same set of knowledge but between groups you have different sets of knowledge. And from such a stylistic uh, population we can then uh, calculate our measure of recombination potential. So what we do here is we calculate the entropy or the expected surprise of one random interaction. And here we borrow from the literature in information science. So basically we calculate this measure of entropy and this is the fraction of a given surname times the log of this fraction uh, of the surname and then we aggregate all those different fractions up and uh, multiply it by minus one to arrive at entropy. And the way you can think about this is that it tells you that in expectation how valuable or novel is the information you get from one random draw. And for example, if you have a very homogeneous population, only one group, your entropy will be zero because you can predict what the person you randomly meet will have uh, uh, in knowledge embedded in him. But if you have a very uniform population with lots of different groups, then you get high entropy. So if you meet some random other, there's a high chance he has information which is valuable in the sense it's very novel. Now, how do we relate this to uh, um, innovation? So innovation here is innovation in a given time period, A dot, and we just, you know, um, um, say, well, it follows this simple Cobb Douglas function. What we also argue here or put in is a D, which stands for population density and capital N, the number or the total number of the population. The rationale is, well, if you have higher population density, the probability that people bump into each other is higher. 
And the same is true if you have a high, po a, a large population, then there's more people who can bump into each other, though this should also um, increase innovation. So how do we conceptualize this? How do we measure recombination potential? How do we measure this diversity? And if you know my research agenda, you know that we will focus on families. So here the idea is that much of the informational diversity stems from variation between families. So these uh, families will vary. Um, they will be different when it comes to pass down traditions, culture, but also knowledge, but also technology, um, shared experiences, socialization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So within families, knowledge is quite homogeneous. And between families, you have this variation. And um, if you have a very uh, population now which varies in this measure, then you will get more innovation. And the way we operationalize this is that we focus on groups of people that share the same surname. So the surname proxies here for within group homogeneity and between group heterogeneity of information. And of course, it's an imperfect proxy. It's um, surnames doesn't delineate each family but it goes towards family. And at the same time, it's a proxy for a common cultural background because surnames will also denote whether or not people are from the same geographic, originate from the same geographic region. So in a way, we now have a measure which is far below traditional measures of, let's say, uh, ethnic diversity. And to calculate this, we look at the US, um, we look at the US up to the year 1930, we use the US census and we calculate counties recombination potential. The nice thing is also when we look at US within country, the, at least at a national level, there's many commonalities, the institutions are very similar. So what you have here now is the map of the US. This is uh, entropy or combination potential, I, I use those words interchangeably, at the county level and we partial out population, population density. So what you're seeing is not uh, um, related to population. And maybe not surprising, you see the Appalachians, the South has very low entropy. But interestingly, you also see Utah, which has a very low um, entropy. And we're, we're kind of thinking whether this has to do with Mormonism and polygyny, but we have to dig into that deeper. So this is now the map of that is measure of recombination potential. How do we measure innovation? We use the comprehensive universe of US patents to describe innovation. And it's, this is primarily constructed based from Google patents. And with this data set, we can use both the number of patents and the average number of citations as dependent variables. So we also have a measure of the quality of the patents. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, I will only show you and the number of patents as the dependent variable. And if you look at the map here, again, population, population density is partialed out. You see a, quite a large overlap between the map I just showed you previously. And before jumping into the econometric specification, I want to show you some raw association. So what you have here is the association between entropy or this recombination potential on the x-axis and on the y-axis you have the log patterns. Again, we residualed out population, population density and also state fixed effects and you see a clear relation. What we do now is we start with a very simple specific or less specification. Of course, there's endogeneity concerns, but we'll come to that later. So it's a very simple specification. Dependent variable is the log number of patents in account EI accrued in the decade starting in T. Our explanatory variable is recombination potential. Then we have these further covariates. We have decade and state fixed effects. And now if you look at the results here, you see that uh, in the first column that the recombination potential is highly significantly positive the associated with the log number of patents. And just to give you an intuition what this coefficient means, it means that if you increase the recombination potential by one bit, it uh, the number of patents increases about by 250%. So you see it's a very quantitatively large effect. And to give you some more intuition, what does it mean? We increase the recombination potential by one bit. Basically, it reflects that on average, a person would need to ask one additional question to learn the surname if 
uh, a person or a surname would be randomly drawn from the whole population. So now in column three and four, we enter log population and log population density, and as expected, the coefficients go down somewhat. We also see that log population and population density is also significant. The coefficients are still large. So here it means a one bit increase in column three, a one bit increase in recombination potential leads to a more to 130% increase in the number of patents. So we, we are worried about reverse causality. What we, so, uh, what we have in column five then, so we, were, we are basically restricted to what the census has to offer. In column five, we want to control somewhat for economic um, standing of the county. So we have the log manufacturing output per capita in, in, in five. And you see comparing uh, column four and five, the coefficients hardly change. Now, if, it, if I tell people about this research and I mention I do something with surnames, they always uh, ask, so do you something uh, related to Craig Clark type of analysis where the surnames basically stands for ability or characteristics embedded in, in surnames? And that's exactly what we're not doing. So we're really interested in this diversity independent of ability or characteristics embedded in surnames. So in column six, what we can do, and that's the, a nice feature of the data, is we can control for say, surname fixed effects. So this gets rid of all confounding effectors, which might, um, where ability or characteristics of the individual is embedded by, by the surname. And you see the coefficients hardly change. So now I want to do a horse race with other indicators. If you focus on the first three columns, so column one again, is just a correlation between the recombination potential and log patterns when controlling career year fixed effects. It's highly significant. Then in column two, we add log population and log population density. And in column three, then we have all three together. Here without state fixed effects, you clearly see that recombination potential does the heavy lifting. It's, it's highly significant. The coefficients doesn't change much. And also, if you look at the R square right here, the R square from the regression with recombination potential only, and the regression from adding uh, log population, log population density, doesn't change much. This is very different if you look at compare column two and three. There, the R square um, uh, goes up quite a bit if you add recombination potential. And uh, just one more horse race. So here we have another diversity measure. This is birthplace fractionalization. So here we calculate diversity based on the state or the, if it's a migrant, the country of origin. And it's highly significantly associated with patterns. But once we control for this recombination potential, so this diversity at the lower level, uh, diversity which try, aims to get at this diversity of families, then this um, birthplace fractionalization is no, no longer um, significant and also the R squared increases substantially. Everything holds with the alternative dependent variable average citation of patents. So now I want to quickly talk about our identification strategy. The idea is that migration is a major determinant of recombination potential. So then we want to exploit the randomness in migration to instrument for the, this recombination potential. And here we simply follow and adapt a paper by Bocardi et al. So in the first step, the idea is to predict the stock of each surname in each county by past economic push and pull factors. And once we have the predicted stock of each surname in each county, we can use that then to calculate the predicted um, a measure of the recombination potential. So now I go a bit into details. So what you have here is the first step where we predict the stock of each surname by past economic push and pull factors. So the outcome variable is the stock or the total number of residents in county I with last name K in year T. And here our um, variation is coming from where we argue this is idiosyncratic following this Burkhardi et al. paper. So we have push factors, which is the total number of immigrants with name K who enter into the US. And there we exploit that there is variation over time. So we start in the year 1880 and then we 
estimate a parameter for each decade. Once those people with surname K are in the US, we have heard that they, their settlement um, choice within the US is endogenous. And here we say we use a pull factor. So we, we, um, we, we say the, it's the attractiveness of a county where those immigrants with name K are settling. And this attractiveness is proxied by the share of immigrants uh, of the total immigrants of all immigrants in the US who go to this county I. And now you might worry about several um, things. The first worry is maybe specific counties are particularly attractive to people with a specific surname. So what do we do here? We have county fixed effects. So uh, any uh, any vari uh, any time invariant factors for, from county wouldn't be able to explain that. And what's very nice in the setting again with surnames that we can also include last name interacted with region of county fixed effects. So any time invariant factor that would make one region in the US particularly act attractive um, to some person with surname K, this couldn't bias our estimates. And lastly, we calculate these pull factors, so the attractiveness, the share of migrants going to county I, um, in a way where we leave out the surnames K, so this measure is, is not influenced by this, by this particular person with surname K. Um, some more worries. Well, maybe people leave the Europe to aim for a very specific county in the US uh, or people with a certain surname. So when we calculate this total number of immigrants with name K, we also use a leave out um, measure. So we're not including people, uh, people with surname K going and living into this region, the destination county I. And the third worry might be well, you're, you're capturing time trends, time varying factors. And for this reason, we included here um, in the, into our estimation factors that capture um, the attractiveness of a county over time. This time it's not interacted. So once we estimate this, we have the predicted stock. Once we have the predicted stock of surnames, we can calculate the predicted entropy. And what I'm going to show you, show you now are the results. So in column one, you have the OLS regression. Column two, you have the reduced form. And the interesting part now is uh, columns three to eight. And these are just mirroring the OLS regressions that I showed you earlier. And um, But now we instrumented recombination potential. And you see that actually the coefficients, they're almost exactly the same than in the OLS regression, which gives us confidence that um, it's unlikely that our estimates are biased by some unobserved factor. Some stuff we're doing, but I don't have to the time to go into details. We also do panel specifications. And the nice thing about the panel specification is that we only exploit change over time, which is nice, but it's also we discard lots of variation all across uh, regional variation which um, is where we have more variation. Everything holds if we just use panel specification. And this is the case even so that entropy is not changing very quickly over time. The nice thing now with this panel specification is that we can also exploit an alternative estimation strategy as we adapt this uh, typical shift share by card, which exploits that immigrants uh, locate close to family. So now we do the shift share at the level of the surname. And we can do this because if we look at the changes, we're not looking at stocks anymore. So we can um, uh, model changes in the surname, uh, in, in the entropy by changes due to immigration in this given period. So I'm coming to the conclusions. Our results suggest that diversity is a major determinant of innovation. Recombination potential is highly predictive of innovation in US counties. Um, and we proxy the innovation by the number of patents, but also citations per patents. We exploit idiosyncrasies in migrant settlement patterns to instrument this recombination potential, uh, which allows to causally interpret our results. And uh, another takeaway is that I think it's important to look at diversity measures below the levels of ethnicity. There's much 
um, information which is often not exploited. And one claim based on, on this, maybe it's a bit bold, is that this is evidence that the US may have become the leader in innovation precisely due to this diversity, precisely because it was a melting pot with people with very diverse backgrounds, which then allowed this recombination of ideas. All right, thanks very much. All right, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I will, uh, we'll, we take questions again, you know, put them in on the Q&A if you'd like. I will take the first one. Um, uh, so I, yeah, I mean, I think I, I buy all of the uh, empirical analysis. So I want to ask you about the interpretation of your entropy variable, because uh, you know there's the literature that you cited. It's you know largely like Petra Moser and I think you know to some extent uh, Fabian Waldinger who look at Emma Gray's and patents, and they have a slightly different take. I, if I interpret theirs, it's not about recombinative. Uh, possibilities. It's more about, you know, the, the either the US attracting, you know, there's push and pull factors with immigration in there's right, there's the pull of the US and the openness and then there's the push, you know, of you know, Jews leaving Nazi Germany or something like that. Do you, is, you, you do control in some of your specifications for share of, of immigrants, but it doesn't seem like you're really kind of getting at that possible possibility because your entropy, entropy factor is, or your variable is taking into it is partially um, affected by immigration. So how do you interpret your findings in light of that, that literature? So what I, where I think we make a contribution to this literature is um, also if you look at this Bocardi paper, uh, they often show that there is a relation between immigration and innovation and here you, you can interpret our results as giving a mechanisms why you should find this relation. Um, and one, one thing is that one big source of entropy is, of course, uh, immigration. But having said that, of course, this is not the only reason why you'd expect immigration to have an impact on, on innovation. So what, what I've been showing is one channel, it increases this diversity, it increases entropy. The other channel is um, what they've been uh, a lot focusing on, that it attracts high ability people, high skilled people who contribute to innovation. The, the nice thing about our specifications is that we, I mean, we can control for the number of immigrants, but we can also control for sur surname fixed effects. So in, in case there's certain surnames which have ability embedded in the surnames, we, we control for that. And that should, um, and that, that's evidence that what we are capturing is really about diversity and not about um, knowledge or any any specifics uh, embedded in, in immig immigrants. Okay, so I, I might have some more things on that, but I want to get to others first. So Sasha and then uh, Jean-Paul. Hi, super fascinating, uh, John. Uh, one, uh, I would have guessed, but I'm not sure that Odette uh, Galor has some stuff on genetic diversity and innovation. And um, I may be wrong, but assume it is. Then how would your measure be different from genetic diversity? And what is there the idea behind genetic diversity? I also thought there the idea is diversity of ideas coming to the table. Um. So in an earlier ver version, I, I still had him in, in here uh, and citing him. So when I, I, I started thinking about this, um, this was very much inspired by Audit Galores. And this measure that we are, we are creating here um, is a measure that we took from population genetics. So under the assumption that each surname um, can be mapped to exactly one family, I mean, that this is an assumption that is violated, but presume it wouldn't be, then our measure, or let's say the, then the Herfindahl index, which would be based on, on surnames, is actually uh, a measure of genetic heterogeneity. So the, these concepts are highly related. Um, and um, what we show here is, is basically you can think of this notion of audit galores that uh, genetic heterogeneity or diversity, more generally it's some more innovation. Um, he looks at this at the cross-country level. So in a way, 
you can think of this also that we do this within the US where we have a lot more ways to address um, questions regarding causality and so on. But again I want to circle back is that since we can control for certain fixed effects we can rule out um, that there's any genuine genetic effects driving uh, what, what we find here at least which is embedded in, in, in these surnames. Hi, right, Jean-Paul. Hi, Jonathan. Yeah, great work. Um, your interpretation of the entry measure is that this is reflecting the diversity, a diversity of ideas at a particular uh, unit, the county level. Um, the, this is so people are endowed with ideas and diversity um, is better. And this is, this is reminiscent of Scott Page's work in some way, right? His PNAS paper. Um, I can send you a link if you're not aware of that. Thanks, yeah, would be um, great. The, um, but there's another interpretation, and that is that this could reflect uh, extended family networks. It's not so much that you're endowed with ideas, though I, I do believe that, but, um, but that these ideas are produced. And if you're a part of the extended family networks, uh, you have certain obligations, you have certain roles to fulfill, and this, this doesn't free you up to kind of innovate, to develop patents, etc. And this may be more about social structure, and the incentives for innovation uh, than the diversity of ideas. It, it, it's just, it's possible that it could be. And I wonder how you could distinguish between those two mechanisms. I think that's a very good point. Um, so what we, when constructing, and that's also why I had this conceptual framework, is what we really assume here is that uh, in this conceptual framework that there is a random draw. And um, you could also think of, and, and the random draw, basically the implicit assumption is that people are free to interact with everyone and actually people just interact randomly with everyone. And that's that's uh, what this recombination potential capture uh, captures. Is this the case? Well, probably not. And if you look at the, the south of, of um, the US, probably there's, I mean, there was segregation. And so all these are factors that hinder the free flow of of, um, of information, and um, and also the point you're making. Yes, if you have large families, then you might only interact within the families. Mm, I have to think more of how we could address that or or disentangle. Uh, another way would would be to say, well, this is the um, this is the a similar side or, or a very similar mechanism. Um, I mean, one more thing going back of where, where we started originally is from cousin marriage. So a way you can think of this measure also, it's the degree of random inbreeding. And if the entropy is, is low and you flip it around, this means random inbreeding is very high. So people in the Appalachians, just if they meet someone random and, and would get married, uh, they they would marry someone who is somewhat related to them. And of course, that then goes to, to your notion, what you just said about extended families. Jonathan, there's three questions in the queue. I think we're going to take them all. And then if there's time, you can respond. Um, the first one I'm going to read from Adina Ajikamene. Um, in your panel analysis, uh, does the magnitude of entropy change? Is, does it change over time? If yes, how do you interpret it? So that's the first question. Uh, the second question comes from me. I just want to kind of build on what I was talking about before and ask you about the role that universities might play in your findings um, to the extent that a lot, um, a lot of immigrants or others are coming from university, are coming to university towns and particularly that the, that patents are coming from those same places. Um, just, uh, just something to think about there. And then the third one, Sasha, if you'd like to ask. If I understood correctly, your measure is agnostic about the proximity between people with different surnames. So Schulz with Z and Schulz with TZ is two different surnames, but it's still probably pretty much the same origin. And then Schulz and Ortega uh, suggest a very different um, heritage. So I'm wondering whether that makes a difference. What I have in mind is also some work by Francesca Cinirella on religious uh, diversity in Prussia and innovation. Um, so what does two different surnames capture? Um, 
and there is always the risk of siloization um, on the one hand, on the other hand, the interactions you are talking about. All right, we have maybe 30 seconds if you'd like to just give a very quick response. Okay, first response, thanks very much for all the questions. They're super helpful. So this is the first time I'm presenting that and it's super helpful to get these questions um, to incorporate them in the research. Very quickly, panel analysis, uh, the coefficients go down uh, quite a bit, so they have, which, um, which is to be expected because uh, the, the variation in entropy over the decades is, within a county is not very um, large. And since I'm out of time, I'll just say thank you for the questions and um, I, I will look at the, the papers that you just mentioned. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, so Patrick Testa, would like to begin? Sure, thanks, Jared. Let me share screen here quick. All right. Can everyone see the first slide there? All right, great. All right, so this is a brand new work with uh, Andy Ferrara, who's at the University of Pittsburgh now. Uh, it's called Resource Blessing, Oil Risk and Religious Communities and Social Insurance in the US South. And so let me get started with uh, just a couple of facts. So first, uh, the United States is characterized by uh, high levels of religious participation as compared to much of the rest of the Western world. And this is especially true in the US South and Southwest in places like uh, Louisiana and Texas, uh, Louisiana where I am now. And second, the US also leads the world in oil production with many of the same parts of the US South um, serving as the epicenter of the world's uh, oil age during the first half of the uh, 20th century. And so in this paper, we contend that the religious intensity of the US South stems at least in part directly from this oil abundance. Uh, and in particular from uh, exposure to oil's uh, economic volatility uh, against uh, which uh, religious communities provided an, imp an important form of, of social insurance. Uh, and so to get at this, uh, we, we spent the fall and winter building this, uh, this large data set charting uh, major oil discoveries uh, uh, during this oil age period from 1893 to, to 1992. Uh, we focused on these oil age states of Louisiana, Texas, and Oklahoma, uh, as well as counties in uh, sort of surrounding areas uh, that is within 200 kilometers of oil abundant counties in these three states, uh, where we define oil abundance as, as a county having at least one major oil field uh, lying underneath it. Um, that is a, an oil field with 100 million barrels uh, or more. And then we, uh, and oh, here's a, a map, uh, I should say first, uh, showing our sample. So here are the, the counties in color are the oil abundant counties. Uh, that lie above these major oil fields. Uh, er, lighter colors are earlier discoveries. Uh, darker colors are, are later discoveries during this period. Uh, the remaining counties are our control counties. Um, uh, and then, of course, we link this with, uh, with county level church membership data uh, from the ARDA from uh, 1890 to 1990 uh, for major Christian denominations, for, for most major Christian denominations. Uh, and then we, and then we, of course, we, we uh, oh, sorry, one more map. Uh, this, is, this is showing the, the variation in, in, in religious. Uh, membership uh, as, a, as a share of the population by county. Um, this is 1916, so very highly concentrated in the, in the, the, very, the south parts of Louisiana, uh, and then 1990, so there were increases in religious participation over the period of the sample. Uh, and then we, we exploit this, uh, this, both this spatial variation in uh, oil discovery, uh, oil abundance rather, and, and the temporal uh, variation in oil discovery years uh, using a difference in difference uh, framework. Uh, so just to sort of um, uh, preview the main results in case I don't get to them, uh, oil abundance in our samples associated in these DD uh, specifications with uh, about a seven percentage point increase in church membership among the sample Christian groups. And just to put that in perspective, um, that means that these major oil discoveries explain about 30% of the overall increase uh, in, in the sample Christian church membership uh, over this period. So this is a pretty uh, sizable driver uh, of, of this uh, increase in Christian membership. Uh, and then when we break it down by the denominations, um, Southern Baptists uh, see sort of the largest relative growth. So they're growing a lot over the course of the sort of the mid 20th century, but they're growing even more in these oil abundant counties. And I'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, but first I wanna talk about why, why we think uh, social insurance uh, is a particularly important mechanism to explore. So to get at that the notion of, of religious communities as social insurance, we ask three further questions. Uh, the first is, uh, do membership increases stem from or, or, or grow with oil's economic volatility? Um, so to get at that, we use variation in world oil price 
uh, volatility over time. So we use these running standard deviations. Uh, we find that a one standard deviation increase in uh, 25 year oil price volatility increases our effects by a quarter. So pretty sizable increase. Uh, and then we try to see, are these effects rooted in sort of demand for economically relevant services? So, you know, we're, you know, we're churches maybe doing something economically meaningful as opposed to just th this being sort of religious coping type thing. So to get at that, we look at crowd out. We try to understand uh, using variation in the availability of various private and public insurance substitutes if, the, if this is sort of a relevant channel. So for instance, if we look at uh, state varying unemployment insurance or workers comp, uh, benefits, um, uh, a poverty line equivalent uh, availability of that at the state level is associated with about a 67% a uh, decrease in our treatment effects. Uh, and then the last thing we do, which is sort of maybe the crudest part of our analysis that we're still working on a little bit, uh, is try to understand the precise channels through which religious communities uh, smoothed consumption in oil abundant counties following oil price shocks. So we break the, the sample down by sort of below and above median religious uh, participation, and we find that large religious communities uh, tend to reduce the relative uh, unemployment increases from oil price shocks in oil counties by about 30%. So there's less unemployment volatility. And we think this is driven by less out migration following a negative oil price shock, uh, as well as a, sort of a containment of, of oil price sectors within oil, oil price shocks rather within the oil sector. Uh, and so I'll get to that a little bit later, but first I wanna talk a little bit about some of the background trying to motivate our story a little bit. So to uh, just to motivate why we think social insurance is a plausible mechanism, uh, I want to just briefly highlight this large literature, uh, you know, on the economics of religion uh, that we're all aware of um, that, sh that shows religious communities to be uh, obviously an important precursor um, to, to modern insurance and a sub an important substitute for the welfare state. So just to put that in perspective, um, prior to the New Deal, uh, so in 1926, U.S. churches spent about $150 million um, per year on social expenditures as compared to $23 million and $37 million per state and local government. So you know, sort of dwarfs these these expenditures. Um, this obviously decreased uh, after the after the New Deal. At you know at the at the at the at the federal level, uh, you know, government spending on social expenditures increased. So this is the work of Gruber and Hungerman. Of course, it also goes the other way. So in the 90s, there were these welfare reforms, and so you know, decreases in welfare spending are also associated with increases in church spending. Uh, also worked by Hungerman, uh, and then of course underlying this is a well-developed body of of theory um, in which religious communities are modeled as as clubs, which provide various you know local public goods. Uh, which are derived from members' participation. So this, to the extent that you know, the major denominations we're looking at span, you know, many regions, not just oil areas. Uh, with idiosyncratic risk, um, this includes things like mutual insurance. Uh, and obviously, this is supported by uh, some some work that's been done more recently. Um, rainfall risk in agricultural communities, business cycles uh, in Indonesia, uh, and the list goes on. Um, now, I just want to show this picture here. I thought this was funny. I kept noticing these signs as I drove around all summer, and I thought this one was particularly funny. Uh, because it's right next to an insurance ad. So maybe others are sort of familiar with this mechanism. Um, now, why in response to oil? Why would we expect a demand for social insurance to increase in response to oil discoveries or oil abundance? Uh, well, as it turns out, uh, natural resource rich con uh, economies are subject to significant uh, risk exposure. Um, so just not just oil, but, but natural resource uh, rich economies in general, uh, but this is especially true for oil. So oil prices are some of the most volatile. Um, they experience more volatility than 95% of all other products sold in the United States. Uh, and the same can be said about revenues. So oil rich countries experience uh, a lot more revenue volatility than uh, non-resource non rich countries uh, and even other resource rich countries that aren't oil abundant. Um, and in, and, um, this, and so this shows this, uh, this oil price volatility here. This is the sort of the, sam the sample period, uh, including the 25 years before uh, the start of the sample. So you can see that oil was very, oil prices were very volatile uh, during these early years They kind of settled down uh, during the early 20th century, and then they pick up in terms of volatility uh, in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and this has been cited in sort of recent work in the economic, uh, economics of development um, as, a, as a potential driver for the resource curse. That is, uh, you know, income volatility and, and economic growth volatility, um, you know, tend to be sort of, um, you know, negative, negative uh, inputs for, for economic growth. And this is exacerbated by the lack of, of well-developed credit markets, which is sort of relevant for what we're talking about. Um, and so we might think that oil abundance would 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 drive religious participation or drive demand uh, for social insurance offer, offered by uh, religious communities to sort of smooth economic well-being across time. Um, and then finally, uh, oil and religion sort of go hand in hand in a lot of different ways. Um, for instance, they they show up in the American historical narrative. There's some uh, really great work being done by Darren Dosha, uh, who's an historian at uh, Notre Dame, um, on sort of the sort of the coinciding uh, rise of oil and religion and and throughout throughout America, beginning in the early 20th century. Um, this is a great quote from 
from one of his one of his more recent papers. He wrote a book recently uh, on this on this very subject. Um, so he sort of highlights the sort of double-edged sword of of oil from from a from a religious standpoint. Um, and then of course these connections also show up in both sort of the popular and political culture uh, today. So you know they show up in movies, the books, um, they show up in, in politics. So this is a apparently in Oklahoma there's a, there's a holiday on you know, every October 13th uh, is oil field prayer day. Uh, and then, of course, uh, in, in, in the most recent uh, presidential election, this sort of narrative pops up. So we think that oil and religion, uh, you know, have, have a lot in common. They're, they're sort of connected at the hip. Um, and so we think that, that that might be an important story to sort of um, get at. And so let me just talk a little bit about our empirical strategy before I get to the results. I want to make sure I don't go over in time. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we use this data from the ARDA on these uh, various religious censuses. Um, this is kind of little data spanning this 1890 to 1990 period. Uh, in particular, we look at membership, which is sort of the strictest definition of religious participation. So for a lot of these Christian denominations, membership entails uh, some form of baptism uh, or confirmation. Um, um, and so that, you know, membership tends to be much lower than adherence. And this is sort of important for, under, you know, for our understanding of, of religion, uh, religious communities as, as clubs or as, as providing club goods. Uh, and then we link this with this oil abundance data. So this is the same uh, county level data that, that Guy Michaels uses in his, his, in his 2011 paper. Um, looking at the various economic effects of oil, uh, and, and he limits the same, the same sort of oil age, uh, oil age uh, counties uh, around Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma. Uh, in particular, our main sample excludes uh, counties that are adjacent to oil counties, trying to limit it, limit some of the spillovers. So this, the, the the coefficients I show you in a little bit will exclude the counties directly adjacent to the to the treated counties. Um, so this is sort of our our sample in a nutshell. Uh, you can see this this um, this non dotted line here is sort of the CDF of oil discoveries over time. So much of the oil discoveries were happening sort of between 1916 and 1950. Um, this other, this dotted line shows uh, the share of the population that's a member of these major Christian denominations in the sample. Um, you can see that there's this large increase after World War II, which is sort of consistent with the sort of the rise of Southern evangelicalism. There's a bit of a dip here in 1936, which uh, is driven by sampling uh, error. There were some denominations that opted out of that particular religious census. Uh, as it turns out, our, our results aren't aren't sensitive to dropping that year. So it's not too much of a concern of ours. Uh, okay, and then finally, we connect this with other various sort of uh, outcomes and covariates from the censuses and the county data books, um, as well as um, some data from a recent uh, paper by Price Fishback looking at state level social insurance, which we used to sort of get at this idea of crowd out. Uh, and then finally, um, from an identi identification standpoint, uh, we use this difference in difference approach. Um, so here's our outcome variable, which is just the share of the population that's a member of one of these Christian uh, denominations in the sample. Uh, and then this is our, our treatment indicator. So uh, this just means that a county is considered uh, treated, as con that is it's considered oil abundant um, for all years after its first major oil discovery event. Um, and, then, um, and then in addition to this sort of two by two difference to difference approach, we also have these event study uh, frameworks to try and get at sort of dynamic effects and identify any potential uh, pretrends. Now, before moving into the results, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the sort of identification concerns. Um, so some of the comments I've gotten uh, uh, you know, recently, and that we've started presenting this, uh, sort of re revolve around this idea that maybe that maybe oil counties are, are somehow different from from non-oil counties. Um, sort of just using the historical narrative, we don't we don't we're not too concerned about that. Just given the extent to which oil is very difficult to find, you know, you might think that some some place is going to be an oil uh, an oil county, and then it turns out that it's not, even if it's near near another oil county um, in Texas. Sort of the earliest oil discoveries were in these southeast areas near Beaumont. People sort of searched in that area for years and years trying to find more oil and didn't. And then 20 years later, it popped up in, in Northeast Texas. And in general, uh, exploratory success rates are, are pretty low even, even today. Um, at the same time, we still wanna you know, try and get at this. Um, so uh, what we do is we compare uh, these, these oil abundant counties with sort of nearby uh, non-oil counties um, in the period directly prior to the former's uh, discovery of oil, just to try, try and see if there's any uh, differences um, or if they're you know, otherwise similar as we would hope. Um, so we look at various outcomes uh, within these county clusters of nearby uh, treated and non-treated counties. Um, and so, for instance, looking at sort of differences in, in Christian membership in the period prior to oil's discovery, we don't really find anything there. Uh, various compositional differences uh, that might that one might expect aren't present. Other economic differences aren't present either. So we don't think that there's anything really uh, special about these oil counties prior to their discovery. Uh, and then, of course, all of a sudden, oil's discovered and they become quite special. Um, now, we're going to talk talk about some other identification concerns when we get to the results. Um, so let me go ahead and get to those. So this is sort of our main uh, result. It's just progresses our, you know, our, our measure of membership in major Christian churches on this um, oil abundance dummy. Um, here we are using this donut model that drops these oil adjacent counties. So you can see that an oil discovery and oil abundance in general is associated with about a 6.6 uh, percentage point increase in um, membership in these major Christian churches. Obviously that coefficient declines a little bit when we include uh, counties that are uh, adjacent to oil counties, but don't have oil themselves. 
Um, we, we, we run these event study approaches. So both of these we can, we can see here. Um, this is our baseline result. Uh, we don't estimate uh, statistically significant uh, pre-trends. Uh, that being said, you know, we're, we're a little concerned that if we had more pre-periods, we might uh, find this uh, to become statistically significant. So we do some other things too. Uh, for instance, we use sort of Goodman-Bacon's uh, you know, uh, way of, of, of partialing out pre-trends in, in the presence of increasing treatment effects. Uh, that looks something like this. And then we also, Andy, Andy did this matching procedure here using various pre-treatment uh, population growth and log, log population density growth. And that looks something like this. So we don't see these, these, uh, these pre-trends persist when we do that. And then finally, we've got a bunch of other specifications that we've included here to just sort of preempt some of the comments that we know we're gonna get um, thinking about sort of the population and urbanization effects um, that, 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 that are likely to follow oil discoveries. Um, so we look at that in both the intensive and extensive margin. Uh, so for instance, we look at, uh, if, we, if we look at the relative importance of, of just population or log population, include that as control, uh, sort of as expected, we find that this increases our coefficient uh, to the expect that population uh, tends to be sort of negatively correlated uh, with religious participation. On the other hand, we can look at uh, various compositional uh, controls and include those and see if they're important. So things like the share of the population that's black or the share of the population that's of German descent, things that we might expect to be associated uh, with um, sort of Christian participation. These don't seem to have much of an effect at all, um, including both of those same thing. And then of course, we can also include other things that we might be sort of relevant uh, as controls, things like um, cotton production. So cotton's another volatile asset that's sort of um, present in a lot of these areas, um, agricultural production in general. So these are, these are things that we can we include as controls in this in this sixth, this, uh, sixth, sixth column here. Uh, and we don't find those to mean very much as well. So uh, as I said before, uh, the effects here account for about 30% of the overall increase in sample Christian church membership in these oil donor counties over this time period. Now, um, we do a number of other things um, that I could highlight um, if I had a little bit more time. Unfortunately, I don't, but I do want to just briefly flash denominational effects. So here we look at sort of the three biggest denominations in our sample, the Southern Baptists, which grow a lot over the course of the 20th century, the Roman Catholics, which sort of continue to monopolize the areas in Southern Louisiana and Southern Texas, uh, and then United Methodists, which are our largest mainline church in the sample. Uh, we only find effects for the first two. Uh, we think that there's some there's some sort of spatial differentiation there going on. I think in future work we're going to explore sort of the relationship between these two denominations. But I think we think this is sort of the most interesting thing that the lack of, there's a lack of effects for this particular mainline church, which is sort of consistent with what you'd expect given um, the economics of religion sort of literature. Um, I won't be able to get to these other ones, so let me just get on to the uh, sort of the mechanism section. Um, so social insurance, that's sort of the mechanism we focus on. We don't necessarily think it's the only thing that might be driving these effects, uh, the only thing that's sort of connecting the dots between oil and religion, but we think it's a key part of this story. Uh, and so to get at this, we ask these three questions, beginning with the first, which is do effects stem from oil, uh, the risk exposure associated with oil abundance? And so the first thing that we do to get at risk exposure is just use this temporal variation in oil prices over time uh, to measure economic volatility. Um, and so to do that, we have these running standard deviations at the 5, 10, and 25 year uh, period level. Uh, and we interact um, those uh, as standard deviations with the treatment dummy. And what we find is that um, long, longer term volatility matters uh, more. And in particular for 25 year oil price volatility, a one standard deviation increase is associated with about a 23% increase in the treatment effect. So this seems to be an important uh, sort of driver of this treatment effect. Maybe it's not the only driver, but it seems to be an important one. The other thing we do to try and get at risk is look at riskier places, that is places that aren't just oil abundant, but maybe oil dependent. Um, and so to get at this, we look at uh, we look for places that really didn't have economic activity prior to oil discoveries. These are sort of oil boom towns uh, that we think might, might be likely to still be sparsely populated if oil had never been discovered as much of West Texas uh, continues to be. You know, there are counties in West Texas with like 300 people living in them still. Um, and so doing to do that, we look at uh, sort of four different interaction terms. The first two measure the level of urbanization uh, prior to oil's discovery. We drop uh, counties that are treated before these years. Um, uh, and then also the manufacturing presence. So there's the same, there's a sort of common theme here, which is that not having much of an economic presence prior to oil's discovery seems to be sort of a, uh, what's, what's, what's driving uh, the overall treatment effect. So we think that this is sort of also consistent with this risk story, um, but that, that being said, it doesn't really say anything about the social insurance story. So the next thing we do is we look at this sort of crowd out uh, explanation. We try to understand, did religious communities emerge in the face of oil risk as social insurance that is an economically meaningful form uh, of, of, or economically, economically meaningful service offered by these religious communities. Um, so the first thing we look at is we look at state social insurance, which really originated after the New Deal. Um, so this continues to vary by state um, and places in the South often have less sort of levels of unemployment insurance and workers comp than places outside the South, but there's also significant variation within the South. 
Um, so if we look at, for example, state max weekly unemployment insurance and then standardize that by various levels of, of sort of standards of living, like po the poverty line, uh, we find that this cuts into our treatment effects quite a bit. So places that have sort of a, a larger availability of public uh, uh, social insurance don't have the same sort of demand for um, uh, sort of participation in, in these Christian churches at the county level. Uh, and then the same thing goes for workers' comp. So workers' comp being relevant for understanding, say, like injuries in oil towns that might occur, say, on oil rigs. Um, we see the same sort of patterns there where this cuts into our effects by about 67%. Um, and then the second thing we look at, which is we think not as convincing, um, but but a nice compliment is, is sort of private alternatives. So we look at, for instance, places that have savings and loans banks, which were important savings banks, um, and as well as as well as uh, bank tellers and private insurance agents uh, to see if places that had these prior to oil's discovery uh, tend to have sort of smaller treatment effects. Maybe these are crowding out some of the treatment effects that might otherwise occur. And there's the same sort of story there where these are cutting into uh, having any savings and loan banks or having any bank tellers or having any so insurance agents is cutting into our treatment effects by about 67%. Um, we also find that oil increases demand for these as well, which I can't really get into, but it sort of, again, is consistent with this idea that these are sort of substitutes for each other. And then the last thing we look at, which again is sort of the, the crudest part of our analysis and maybe the, the most difficult to interpret um, is, is through what precise channels did churches actually smooth consumption? This will be the last thing I talk about, I promise. Um, so we can't, can't directly observe you know, church expenditures at the local level to try and understand how they were say supporting oil workers after they were laid off after a negative oil price shock. But we can look at how lo like local labor market composition changes in response to negative oil price shocks and then compare that across counties that have a large versus a small religious community. Um, and so what we find um, is the following. So we use census data from 1940 to measure uh, labor market composition. And then we construct this time invariant size of the religious community dummy, dropping counties treated after that just to sort of reduce back control concerns. And, and, then, and then this is what we find. So we have basically this first column shows a response to an oil price shock in an oil county relative to a non-oil county when there's, a, when there's a small religious community present. And then you can, you can compare that to the, the same effect when there's a large religious community uh, uh, present here. And there's a sort of consistent pattern across all these specifications, which is that religious communities tend to sort of smooth the volatility associate, associated with these oil price shocks when there's a large religious community present. In particular, a large religious community reduces relative unemployment increases in oil counties by about 30%. And that this seems to be driven by reduced uh, sort of out migration following an oil price shock, as well as reduced spillovers outside of the oil sector. So the, the local agricultural sector is not suffering as much, or the local manufacturing sector is not getting as many oil workers substituting into that line of work after a negative oil price shock. All right, so let me just conclude with a couple of things that we don't do yet. There's a lot of sort of uh, room to grow here. Uh, we can't speak to whether this relationship holds elsewhere. Uh, we can't speak yet to whether resource abundance outside of oil matters. Uh, we can't yet speak to a lot of different mechanisms. We've gotten some suggestions, things like religious coping, things that we do want to look at. Uh, and then finally, we can't speak to sort of the whole story as to why the South is, is so uniquely religious. Um, that's sort of uh, maybe a larger research project that we'd like to be a part of. Um, all right, thank you. All right, that was great. Um, again, uh, please type in your Q and or questions in the Q and A feature. I will uh, take the first question as I guess I've been doing here. Um, I guess my first question is: Did you and Andy meet at our uh, Iris event a couple years ago? Yeah, um, that, that's, that, cool. that's 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 right. Yeah, I think um, so. Andy and I, I can't remember if it was the Iris event or if that was the second time or the first time we met in person. But it was always it was these Azrak and Iris events over and over again, plus the EJ events where we just kept sort of running into each other. So that was how this got started. That's an ad advertisement for all the grad students out there. Um, my my question, I, I guess you do have compositional controls in there, but I was wondering if you could speak to who who are the the type of workers that come come to work in the the newly found oil fields? Because I know, like in North Dakota now, at least, uh, well, you know, pre COVID, at least, you had um, a, a overabundance of young unmarried men that. Uh, that, that came now, if anything, they were probably like less church going. So maybe maybe that actually works against what you're doing. But um, I was wondering if you could speak historically to that. And, and particularly, you didn't, um, I'm sure you explained in the paper, but you didn't explain here what your compositional controls are. You know, do you have it for uh, marriage and age as well? That's a great question. Um, unfortunately, no, we don't have anything regarding um, employment composition or age composition. Um, that's something that that we can look into, and I'm gonna write that down. Currently, the compositional controls are um, regarding ethnic or ancestral grouping. So for instance, the share of the population that's black, uh, French, German, things like that, uh, to try and get at, you know, is, this, is the, the population changing in sort of uh, observable ways? Um, 
that being said, I can speak to the history, the history a little bit. Um, I know for a fact that uh, in Texas, uh, oil towns often drew workers uh, that had been previously agricultural, and in particular, after sort of the bull weevil uh, stuff, um, a lot of those workers came in and became oil workers. Um, but I can't really speak to that with the data, and I think that's something that we need to do more. All right, your next question is from Carice, who I believe was also at your IRIS event. Um, I have the impression that oil is not only volatile in price, but risky physically. It can be an ex existential threat for those involved in its production. And the families of those harmed would also need social insurance. Do you think you can or should separate out these similar mechanisms connected to oil and church membership? That's a good question. So one of the things that I looked into doing when we first started this project was to try and see if we could get data on oil rig explosions. Um, that being obviously a source of risk. And that's something that Dotruck had talked about in his history a lot was that these, there were these explosions and that was sort of why there was this sort of mixed um, relationship um, on the part of local religious communities uh, with, with the oil industry. I haven't been able to find that data, uh, but it would be cool to do. That's sort of, that's, it, that's one of the reasons I like having this workers comp data is it speaks to a little bit, you know, that, that injury component, but uh, there's, I've not found anything yet that can really let us gauge sort of that, that margin of, of risk. But that, that's a great question. All right, our next question is from Rosie uh, is re Is religiosity observed in other oil producing parts of the world with different religions? That's, so my, my prior says, yes, um, it would be really cool to take this to another setting. The first setting we could take it to naturally would be California. California had a smaller oil boom in the early 20th century. We have that data as well. So we could easily do that. Um, Alberta has a similar sort of, it's, it's one of the more religious parts of Canada and also, you know, one of the more, one of the more oil producing parts of Canada, Middle East. So I, I have no clue, um, but that would be very interesting follow up work. Yeah. Well, certainly uh, in the Gulf states, that would be uh, of interest. Uh, uh, Dan Ungerman. Yeah, thanks. Um, as you might imagine, I found that paper super interesting and enjoyable, really, really, uh, really liked it, right? Um, you were rolling through a lot of results there. And so um, like a uh, one thought I had at the end was um, I, I was trying to pick through in my head the results that kind of help us distinguish risk-based shocks from just straight income-based shocks. Um, and so I think you had some in there, but I, I would simply put that out there as, um, you know, when, as you're putting your paper together, something you want to kind of take some pains to, to clarify, right? Um, uh. Definitely. Yeah. And that's the, that's a great point. Um, I, I know, I know because I ran that regression that treatment effects don't respond to changes in oil prices in the, in the preceding period. Right, it, it does. It does respond to changes in volatility. That being said, um, our treatment effects do decrease if we control, say, for income. Right. So there's. So that's explaining part of this effect, sort of independent of the risk channel, is that places that have a little bit more money, they they tend to they tend to participate a little bit more in local churches. So yeah, I think that you're right that there's there's there needs to be more said about that, um, and that's that's something that we can definitely speak to. We have the data to speak to that. All right, is anyone else, we, we do have time maybe for a, a short question, if anyone would like to, to ask something. Hi, Patrick, uh, great stuff. Um, I commented earlier on the paper, but so I don't remember what I asked that uh, some months ago. Um, I remember a paper that the linking um, background risk and insurance um, from years ago um, where the story was, if people have a higher unemployment risk, they buy more car insurance. Because uh, you can't insure against unemployment, you may get fired. Um, so you try to hedge other unrelated risks. Is that the same logic here? Uh, that's In the sense that God insures you. Sure. Um... In a sense, I, I I don't interpret what we find as that that's that sort of speaks almost more to this this idea of religious coping, the idea that sort of God insures you against uh, sort of the the fears and uncertainties of oil. Um, 
which we haven't explored. And we maybe could if we if we could find the right survey data. Um, the way that I'm thinking about it is the, these these churches are literally insuring people against the the negative income shocks uh, associated with oil um, by offering them various forms of charity and aid in the in the interim um, that keep oil communities from suffering on the whole as much as they otherwise would. Um, that being said, I'm curious to to find that paper because that sounds incredibly fascinating. Um, so if you if you can remember what that was, I would love to I would love to take a look at it. I'll dig it out. Yeah. Excellent, Pat. Uh, thank you. So uh, we're going to move on to Alexander York. Okay. Can you can you hear me well? I'm going to share my slides. Can you see that? Good. All right. Just to check the slides are changing. Can you see the changing slides? All right. So um, that's a talk about epidemics, you know, nowhere without epidemics these days. And uh, we're living through tough times. And um, basically in this, in this project, I'm researching the way that uh, epidemics and Ebola in particular can be shaping something that we often think of as something hardly malleable. But as I will show, it's not the case actually that group identities, and I'll be talking specifically about ethnic versus national identities and various ways to conceptualize these things, how they might be reacting to a local level exposure to an epidemic, okay? Um, so uh, without any further ado, we of course are all aware of how important oftentimes group identities and group attitudes are. So these perceptions of group boundaries, they are often a key component of development. They can, for example, a feeling of strong in-group attachment as opposed to a more broader, uh, more welcoming attitudes towards diversity. They can harm cooperation and trade. They can uh, distort the allocation of talents. They can uh, allow ethnic favoritism and stuff. And so the question is, of course, why, why, the, why, why do we see such a variation, for example, in the sense of ethnic versus national identity. So for example, here in Sub-Saharan Africa, we see that the share of people who report identify more along the national lines as opposed to ethnic lines varies a lot. And the question is, of course, why is that? And maybe even more importantly, how certain salient events can be changing these perceptions of group identities and group attitudes. And this is precisely what I'll be doing in this paper. And I'll be looking at how, what, what is the effect of an exposure to an epidemic? What is the effect on ethnic identities as opposed to a broader national identity? And moreover, how this effect can depend on the type of a community that people live in. So whether the community is diverse, whether ethnic groups are spatially segregated or not. And I, um, so this is something that I explore in this project. All right. Um, and so just to give like a preview in the in the sense of the things we are all thinking about these days, we of course know that uh, by now that uh, epidemics like COVID, for example, they can cause xenophobia and uh, scapegoating and mistrust towards people who are who are not like us, basically. So this kind of us versus them uh, mentality can be uh, increased. But on the other hand, as we can see these days, this is, for example, a picture from Brown. Uh, Epidemics acting like as a common experience for a community can can sometimes act as a community building devices. All right. So on the one hand side, we can have this uh, alienation effect, whereby we try to distance ourselves from uh, from strangers. So like strangers not in my village. Okay. But on the other hand side, we also can experience this community building process when epidemic hits harder. Okay. And so these are kind. Some sort of like opposing forces, and I will try to argue how they are into how they how these two forces can be interplaying in the case of Ebola, how they can force uh, identity formation and change in the identity. And so, basically, to repeat what I just said, I won't be able to show the theoretical model because of well because of time constraints. But uh, to you know to condense it in one slide, when basically 
I propose to think about it in the following way. When the epidemic arrives, okay, it acts as a penalty on long range communications and uh, activities. So people are becoming more localized in their interactions. All right. And this brings two effects. So first, as we discussed, people are you know, engaging in this kind of pathogen avoidance behaviors and both consciously and subconsciously, as many psychological studies are showing, it can lead to a, you know, to a hostility directed at strangers, all right? So this is the first effect. The second effect is that when epidemic arrives, it also acts as a strong social and economic stress, of course. And because people are becoming more localized, their reliance on local level networks, safety nets, public goods, becomes uh, intensified. So this reliance becomes more important and crucial. So for example, whether people wear masks in your community is like a public good thing. Or whether, like for example, in Liberia, in uh, Monserrado County, which is like uh, the capital county, there, there are like numerous reports of people helping each other, helping diverse others to bring sick to the hospital or to deliver food or to deliver information within this diverse community, all right? And so these are the two types of effects I'll be looking at. And so interestingly, these two types of effects, they will uh, change group attitudes and group identities differentially depending, what, depending on what type of a community you live in. And so I'll be showing that basically in diverse communities, in ethnically fractionalized communities where you have uh, people of various ethnicities, this, uh, they, they are basically living through a common experience with diverse others. And so this sort of uh, reliance on these sort of local networks, which are becoming more important during the epidemic, they consist of diverse others. And this, I will argue, will lead to this increased uh, perception of broader identity. Then you can think also not only of diversity itself, but also about how spatially, uh, how spatially clustered uh, ethnicities are. So basically, whether uh, there, is, there is high or low ethnic segregation. And I'll be showing that basically, when there is high ethnic segregation, think of like ethnically homogeneous villages scattered around the region. In this case, basically avoiding strangers during the type of the pandemic or, or epidemic is basically the same as avoiding non-coethnics, okay? When ethnicities are spatially clustered, when uh, uh, ethnic segregation is high. All right, so I propose, I suggest you to think about this uh, effects of an epidemic as depending on these two features, how at the community level diverse the community is and at the sub-regional level, how segregated this region is, all right? Okay, and so basically just if, if there is a takeaway from this talk, the, so I think this, this is it, so basically, Ebola, on average, outside of the biggest cities and urban communities, Ebola elevates ethnic identity. However, there is also an important heterogeneous treatment effects with respect to these two crucial characteristics. So first, uh, in ethnically isolated, ethnically homogeneous communities, there is a very strong elevation of ethnic identity and a decrease in national identity. However, in uh, less segregated, more diverse communities, there is an increase in, uh, in national identity, or at least a strong, uh, a weaker decrease in national identity, all right? I also do, if you wish, a robustness analysis for different types of measures, maybe looking at ethnic voting and inter-ethnic inter marriages as an additional measure of group identities, and, as, and I find very similar patterns. And I will try to argue, at least preliminary, that these results are not driven by, you know, selection to treatment, the endogenous spread of Ebola, and things like that. All right. So regarding the literature, uh, you know, there are several strands of important lit literatures here. So I think the most important one, of course, is this uh, very recent literature on the formation of ethnic identity, where people are trying to uh, basically plausibly identify uh, either with uh, some historical resettlement IVs, as for example, Batsi's paper, or with some event study analysis as the Petri Chavan et al. They're trying to identify how certain events or certain local level compositions 
of ethnicities can be affecting the formation of identities. I think the novelty of my paper is that, is that, is that I'm basically combining these two things. So I'm looking at both the events interacted with the local level composition of population. And uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I haven't seen this done before. So I'm looking forward to, to hear what you say. And of course, there are many other uh, literatures that are related to this, to this question. All right, so uh, for my main outcome variable, I'll be using Afrobarometer, where uh, the survey asks about the extent of national versus ethnic identity. You can see the precise wording here. As a robustness, I will be using also the ethnic voting. So basically, whether a person su uh, supports or votes for the party which was historically associated with his ethnic group, his or her ethnic group. For example, whether men, the people, vote for SLPP in Sierra Leone, which were historically engaged in this kind of exchange of favors with this ethnic group. Okay, So whether you maintain loyalty to your ethnic party. If you do. All right, and also uh, I'll be looking at ethnic intermarriage as an additional measure of uh, group, uh, your the strength of attachment to your in-group. All right, so just to give a context, Ebola was mostly happening in these three countries, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. I have these Afrobarometer locations. Then I have at the two levels of analysis, I have first at the regional level, I have this exposure to Ebola. Here I'm showing just aggregate cases, case counts, but of course I use the normalized, normalized by population case count. So then uh, this at the, uh, this figure gives you the regional level thing. So Ebola has begun in this region of Gikadu. Then it was spreading into Sierra Leone, Liberia, and other regions in Guinea. So in my like in my first uh, take on the IV analysis, I'll be using this uh, quasi-random, well, basically the random first location, and then uh, I will say something on how uh, I try to instrument for the spread of Ebola. And then I will be able to zoom uh, in into, into Sierra Leone and uh, get a much finer level data on actually local level exposure to Ebola at the level of chiefdoms, which are on average something like 15 by 15 kilometers. So this is indeed like the space of your daily interaction. All right. And so like the empirical strategy is the following. I will be, it's like not a rocket science, you know, it's a, fixed effect models and the uh, IV fixed effect model. So I'll be looking at how the outcome, one of the measures of ethnic identity versus national identity, how it reacts to it, basically to a shock of a ball. All right, controlling for various things like, you know, regional or sub-regional fixed effects, time fixed effects, ethnicity fixed effects, and various other controls. All right, and importantly, I'll be looking at the heterogeneity analysis. So whether the effect of Ebola um, plays out differentially depending on the type of the community, whether it's a segregated region, whether it's a diverse community, and so on. All right. So, uh, as I said, there are several potential issues. We'll talk more about this later on. So, first, to give like a first glimpse of how this looks. So, this is changes on changes. So, yeah, all right. On the horizontal axis, this is the uh, exposure to Ebola, and on the vertical axis is a change in the national versus ethnic identity, all right? And we see that for the most of the sample, there is a clear negative effect, okay? So higher exposure to Ebola is kind of decreasing national identity or if you wish, increasing ethnic identity. But then something happens and for, you know, five or four or something regions, you have for some region, this upward part of the curve. You might be wondering like, what's going on, okay? So the story might be that, you know, of course, higher exposure to Ebola makes you more localized, more in-group oriented, but then why this increasing part, all right? And so let's see in more detail what's going on here. So these regions, by the way, these four regions, just to preview, the results are very densely populated and mostly capital regions and those regions that are surround capital, all right? So the, these are very ethnically diverse regions and ethnically non-segregated. And so you'll see how, how it works. So the first two columns are just basically representing this figure. 
once again the outcome is national identity as opposed to ethnic identity and then what i do in column three for example i exclude these capital regions and for those as we can see again as you should expect you see a very strong negative effect of ebola on a broader idea so ethnic identity gets elevated all right then in column four i interact the exposure to ebola with the type of the community you live in namely whether it's a rural or urban community and what we see is that basically the bulk of the negative effect or well the whole negative effect comes from rural rural places so in rural communities people are becoming much more in-group oriented not so much in urban communities all right and basically the same effects are here for the iv analysis where i instrument exposure to ebola by basically network connectivity to the hotspot to the initial hotspot all right i won't be able to go much into detail i'm happy to discuss it later on how this iv works um, so this is like the first bunch of results then as i said the main thing is basically the heterogeneity i think this is the most interesting part of the paper so namely here what i show is that again in the fixed effects and iv framework basically the same thing is that in more segregated places there is a very strong negative effect of ebola on national identity you can see this in columns one and two in column two i give basically the most restrictive specification where i interact levels of segregation with time trends so basically uh it partials out any covariate that, that can be correlated with uh segregation over time okay so this is very restrictive and and, and still we see this uh, strong negative effect of Ebola on national identity in more segregated places. Then in columns three and four, I do basically the same thing, but with fractionalization. And we see that in communities that are diverse, all right, like very, say, diverse neighborhood in a, in, in a town. In these communities, we see the opposite. So basically, uh, Ebola is strengthening national identity in more diverse communities and so i think that these two results of segregation fractionalization they might be speaking precisely to those two stories that we are that we were uh, discussing at the beginning of my presentation namely that uh, in more diverse places people are basically living through this common experience of ebola together and so they develop this feeling of broader identity in more segregated places people are basically stuck with the, with their own kinds with their own ethnic groups and so the pathogen avoidance is basically aligned with the avoidance of non coated all right and so this is why we see this kind of increased ethnic identity and this is just the illustration of this of these main results so in places with high segregation you see that ebola decreases national identity but in low segregation not so much you see that in, in places with low fraction with low fractionalization again ebola decreases national identity but not so much in places with high uh, fractionalization all right so this like the these are the main results uh let me skip this i also do something with ethnic voting as i said i'm looking at whether people for example of mende origin do they vote vote for party that was historically associated with mende people SLPP right and the same for temne the same for malinke and, and, and fula in guinea okay so i construct this measure of ethnic voting and i ask whether ebola affects this uh, political ethnic loyalty if you wish. and i see a uh, very very similar pattern so basically in more fractionalized places um, ethnic voting is decreasing stronger Okay, so people are becoming less loyal to their ethnic uh, party. But in more segregated places, in more segregated places, people are becoming more uh, loyal to their ethnic party following Ebola. All right. Although here, on average, there is a negative effect. So people are, on average, becoming less loyal to their ethnic party, maybe because of, you know, punishing the incumbent effect, for example. So they're unhappy with the performance of the government. And so, uh, because it's like not coping well with Ebola, and so they are punishing their party on average. But in in more segregated places, maybe they're uh, increasing their attachment to 
to their ethnic, their ethnic loyalty increases nonetheless. All right. I also do something with ethnic intermarriage, very preliminary. So what I find is that in the years of Ebola, 2014, 2015, the share of newly formed couples that are ethnically mixed drops very significantly, okay? As an indicator of, again, higher in-group attachment. I will be doing more analysis with this outcome variable later on. Then I do show very similar patterns at the final level for Sierra Leone, okay? So here, again, you can see these interactions and the main effects. For Sierra Leone, uh, we see that, again, in places that are more ethnically segregated, okay, we see that national identity decreases following Ebola, but in more fractionalized places, ethnic identity, uh, national identity, national identity seems to go up, right? So again, this very same effects that we were finding before. Um, I try to address uh, whether it can be caused by ex post selection, and I, I do not find much using these age subsamples or ex post reported mobility. I do not find much. We can discuss this more later on. All right, let me skip this. As I was saying, and I'm, I'm trying to argue for the specific mechanisms behind these effects. Uh, this is still work in progress, of course. And uh, what I'm trying to, I will try to show you something in the maybe one or two minutes uh, that I have. So let me show you one thing related to. Uh, to trust to traditional leaders. This is something I use to basically argue that if this net local network, local attachment effects are indeed happening, if people are using local networks and local safety nets to cope with the epidemic, then basically in rural and uh, ethnically homogeneous places, people will be, you know, trusting more and contacting more their uh, traditional leaders. And this is what I find. So on average, this is not the case. But it is the case in more segregated subregions. Okay, so in places where ethnicities are spatially clustered, people are becoming more trusting to their traditional leaders, and this can be part of the reason why ethnic identity is uh, growing in these places. Very speculative, not claiming much of uh, results. So next, I will also try to look at whether uh, whether activity of various organizations government-based or non-government organizations are uh, are giving some interesting insights here. And for example, what I find is that if we look at rural communities, okay, and if I measure the activity of government organizations there if at the time of Ebola and before, we see that government responds in rural communities to Ebola by, you know, increasing activity, but in more segregated communities, again, this is this is not the case. So then, if in more segregated communities, these people are not receiving much of a help from the government, they might be more relying on their traditional and local ways of coping with the epidemic. So again, this can be part of the reason why in more segregated places, ethnic identity gets elevated. Okay, and in urban communities, we see that the government is actually providing fewer help in more diverse places, okay? And then again, if in more diverse places, the government is not providing much of a help, then maybe in more diverse places, the people are dealing by themselves. And so this is again aligns with the interaction that I find. I feel like I should stop right now, basically because of time. And so I'm, I'm happy to know what you think. Let me just, um, yeah, maybe put myself on this slide. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Alexander. That was that was uh, really both interesting and timely. Um, again, you know, if you have questions, put them in the Q and A. Um, I'll start. Uh, so, I wanted to know a little bit more about the response of of the the government leaders or tribal leaders or whomever. Um, you know, because if if you did a similar analysis, maybe you know, five years from now, looking back at the U.S., you probably find almost you know, you might find the exact opposite results because it's. You know, the response has become very polarized. This was something that was, uh, you know, perpetrated by you know, government officials for the most part. Um, 
and I, I just wanted, it, it could even be anecdotal, but to the extent to which um, people tried to use the Ebola crisis, or especially government officials tried to use the Ebola crisis for political gain, um, would be something that would be nice to especially put in greater context now. Yeah, that sounds interesting because I haven't been thinking of like, yeah, so basically you want me to show if, if it's possible that the government is using this Ebola case, for example, if there is a certain party in rule and this party is, for example, ethnic party, then it can be using this case to basically strengthen its positions to somehow maybe engage in some, you know, scapegoating behavior or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, maybe. I mean, well, your one of your outcomes is trust in government. So, yeah, <laughs> the the mechanisms there, I think, yeah, you know, part of it has to be what was the response of the government, and and, and was it? Yeah, yeah. I have this response in terms of like the activity of these government organizations. This is true. Also, I control in some of my specifications for trust in government. So this is not my outcome, okay? So outcome is like basically national versus ethnic identity. But even if I control for, for example, trust in parliament or trust in president, it, it basically isn't affected. The main results are, are, are still there. Uh, but I see, yeah, probably the, maybe, maybe there are ways to look in more detail into that. Um, I will think about it. Yeah. Anybody else? I can ask another if nobody else. All right, I don't see any other one. So um, I'll ask another question. I. Um, so if I don't know if you were here, uh, and I can't even remember, the hours are blurring together, but Max Winkler's presentation from earlier, I guess it was this morning for me, had a similar flair to it in that he was looking at the response to earthquakes. It wasn't exactly the same, the, the same outcomes, but it was, it, it was in a similar vein, you know, the response and how people follow social norms. And yep. while I was thinking about that, you know, I was, while during his presentation, I was thinking about how, how it related to COVID. And one thing that struck me was that earthquakes are kind of, you know, they're, they're immediate and then they're over and then there's an aftermath you have to deal with. Whereas a virus outbreak, it's kind of an indeterminate period of time. At least while you're going through it, you don't know how long it's gonna last. And I also wonder uh, to, to the extent that you might have any information or insight into how, how your insights would relate to other types of shocks, let's call them. Um, and uh yeah yeah no that's that's, uh, that's a great point i think well i would like to try to also do something with covid but uh, we don't have such a clear pre and post analysis just yet so yeah but but i i agree yeah that's that's something i can i can think about regarding other disasters it seems like generally any kind of disaster that puts a pressure on basically coping with this disaster for a community can be expected to produce a similar result in the sense that if community comes together following the exposure to this disaster, it is possible that community will become more cohesive, more organized, and maybe more in-group oriented. The, the thing that, that basically epidemics are special in is that you also have the second effect of basically avoiding strangers, this kind of, this kind of contamination avoiding mechanism. And so if you engage in this thing, you kind of try to distance yourself from strangers, it can basically lead to this outgroup avoidance thing, to this uh, increase in outgroup bias, something that I find here. All right. yep. So you have two questions, and by the way, I'm not suggesting that you write a COVID paper. I think we have enough of those. Uh, so uh, Jean-Paul, then Sasha, if you both want to ask yours, and then um, with any remaining time, Alexander might be able to respond. Alexander, uh, thanks. Um, Thank you. I, I, I wonder if I could suggest a, perhaps a, a small tweak to the framing of the paper, and that is, this goes back to a um, a literature, a long-standing literature, and you would know Mary Douglas's work on purity and danger. Um, that's the famous book, and uh, that suggests that um, pure this no this striving for purity on the behalf on behalf of communities, groups, etc. Um, really comes from some sense of danger and the, the archetypal form of danger is some kind of virus from without. And it's linked uh, there to uh, ethno-nationalist movements. For example, if you look at the language used by ethno-nationalist movements early on, middle of the 20th century, for example, 
you see uh, the other being described as you know dangerous, impure, dangerous, etc. Now, um, the there, but here you have something that goes beyond that because you have this conditional result. Um, and so I think that's a big addition to this literature because uh, it could go one way or the other depending on the context and the, and the existing diversity, ethnic diversity of the place. And so what you're really saying is that this, this translation of Mary Douglas's purity and danger idea to, eth, uh, to um, ethno-nationalist movements or to ethnic um, favoritism, et cetera, um, may, may be, uh, it may be because the local grouping is conflated with the ethnic group. And it's really all about the local grouping and it's about local cooperation. And so I wonder if you could, yeah. All right, so um, there's there is one more question. Sasha said that oh. uh, Jean-Paul mainly asked his question. I'm just gonna ask it and then we're gonna have to stop. So you essentially just take these questions because we're out of time. This is from Blake Hannigan. So he says, this may be beyond the scope of the paper, but is there any evidence of migration of ethnic minorities from rural areas to urban areas in response to increased ostracism? All right, so we are gonna to have to stop there. Um, Alexander, thank you so much. That finishes the uh, 11th of 12 sessions. Um, I didn't get a chance to do it earlier. I do wanna thank Monash University and especially Holly Travers who's been um, amazing in helping us do everything as well as uh, Chapman University, Linda Williams. Uh, they have been thanked before at the very beginning but that was 22 hours ago. So I wanted to thank them again. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Dan Ungerman who will be chairing our final session. Thank you, Jared. Um, yep, I am delighted to be uh, chairing the last session here. Um, so we're right on time. This is perfect. In case uh, there's anyone at this point who doesn't quite know the way this is going, for the last time, take 20 minutes, 22 minutes, give your talk. During the talk, if you have questions you'd like to submit in the Q&A, that's great. If you're a panelist and you've got the chat, you can you can jump in the queue that way if that's that's what you got. Then uh, we'll have uh, ten, five or ten minutes for for questions, and that's that. So um, first up, uh, we're going to be hearing about the origin of theocracy. So um, Ben, if you're ready, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Dan, and uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the last session of this marathon conference. So let me start by thanking Jared and uh, I see uh, on my screen Sasha, JP, and uh, and all the other organizers uh, wherever you are. Thank you so much for putting together this wonderful conference. So this is uh, let me share my screen. Uh, this is a. Can you see my screen? This one. Just one second. So this is a, a joint paper with two of my colleagues at UConn, uh, Dick Langlois and Tom Miscelli. And the question, oops, this is, this is not working. Okay, the question we're asking is why do states become uh, theocracies? This is, uh, uh, all right, I'm just having some technical difficulties here. Sorry, it's all sorted out. Uh, this is obviously a, an old and um, elusive question, especially in economics. Uh, what the way we are approaching it uh, in this paper is through the uh, more recent literature that ask uh, conditions uh, under which uh, societies transition from one equilibrium uh, to another. The, maybe the most prominent example of that is the recent the 2009 book by North Wallace and Moingast. So what they do there uh, is I'm sure many of you know, they analyze how states move from what they call natural state equilibrium to open access equilibrium. And the important characteristics of these two states are, uh, the first one is ruled by identity rules and you give limited access to different uh, groups and uh, 
uh, that of course leads to uh, a low growth kind of an equilibrium. But then the more modern states are the ones that have general rules that does not exclude, and that leads to high growth. The uh, important thing here in the North Wallace wine gas stories, they do not recognize the way the role of religion in uh, the way uh, uh, this transition happened. And that happens, as I'm sure many of you know, in the that's the theme of the recent book by uh, Noel Johnson and Mark Koyama. What they're looking at is the what they call the transition from the uh, what they call the conditional toleration equilibrium. Uh, what you have there is a, a weak state, and of course that uh, weakness of the state uh, prevents the state from uh, uh, discriminating against minorities, uh, but also. Uh, allows the system to run in a stable manner uh, through uh, religion-based identity rules. Uh, and then the modern state, you rise to a, a religious toleration equilibrium. And the important thing here is you have a stronger state. State is strong enough to be able to implement uh, secular general rules. Uh, so they make the point, uh, going back to the North Wallace uh, wine gas story, to make the point that uh, religion may have actually prolonged the transition to a modern uh, eco state equilibrium uh, by uh, uh, maintaining uh, order uh, through identity rules. But then the rise of the uh, state capacity allows the state to uh, implement general rules. The important thing here is that uh, the whole thing hangs on uh, religious legitimacy, which is why in the uh, pre-modern state you rely on uh, religion, and high state capacity are substitutes so that when state capacity rises, you substitute that for religious legitimacy. But then why do we have states, modern states, that have religious general rules? We all know many examples of that in, around the world rules regarding veiling and uh, marriage and divorce and uh, uh, in Islamic finance, for example, things like that in, in taxes, religious taxes uh, being collected by uh, states. Why do we observe those? Our answer is going to look at the possibility that's the alternative to what uh, uh, Noel and uh, Mark are uh, proposing. Uh, they actually recognize this possibility, of course, but their book is more about the sub, uh, substitute relationship between religion and uh, state capacity. What we are doing here is to put the emphasis on uh, the, uh, the way that a strong state can actually uh, complement religion rather than be substitute for it. So what you have is in the modern theocracy, uh, you can have a high state capacity and that can work with religion to extract resources from the citizenry. So we make a distinction between the two types of theocracy. So it's important to point it out at this point. Typically, uh, we would talk about pre-modern theocracy. That's what uh, comes to mind when a lot of people mention theocracy. And there you have a state using identity rules to differentiate among religious groups. And but the state is weak, uh, and, and that's precisely why they're resorting to identity rules. That's to be differentiated from what we call a modern theocracy, where the strongest state is strong enough to implement general rules. This is a very different type of theocracy than uh, what took place in the pre-modern uh, weak state. So here's what I'm going to do quickly. Uh, I'm gonna give you a quick model of the uh, rise of theocracy and give you a few case studies to show uh, implications of the model. And then I'm gonna give you a quick run of an empirical uh, analysis of uh, what we do. Here's the model. This is actually, uh, some of you may be familiar with this. The, the, Tom and I uh, used this in previous uh, papers. It's our workhorse model to uh, look at the relationship between state and religion, the legitimacy relationship. Uh, the way we um, have been modeling 
uh, legitimacy is through the benefit that it confers to the ruler in its uh, tax collection. So uh, when you collect taxes, uh, T here, uh, always a small fraction, well, a fraction of it will be uh, will dissipated to compliance. Uh, this may be in the form of a, a bureaucracy that you need to support to collect taxes, or in the more earlier days, perhaps, to go after people who might be running up to the mountains as you, the tax collector comes. All of those, whatever that cost is, is going to result in a, 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 a deduction from the amount that you collect. What does that depend on? It depends on delta that we call ruler's legitimacy. It also depends on rho, what we call here, uh, or use to refer to state capacity. So both of these, are going to decrease, uh, I mean, rather uh, delta this, the amount deducted is going to decrease in both arguments. So if the state ruler is more legitimate, uh, the ability to collect taxes will go up. And likewise, if the ruler is uh, strong, uh, if the state is strong, the ability to collect taxes is going to be, per unit of uh, dollars co uh, collected is going to go down. So what does that mean in terms of what types of rules to uh, that would emerge? That's going to depend on the state's ability to uh, legitimacy or, or the religious able, able to legitimize the ruler. Let's just to see that. Let's just we have two variables. Let's keep one of them constant, uh, rho, the uh, state capacity low, and let's see how uh, variation in lambda is going to affect the outcome. To see this, just to keep it simple, suppose there are two groups. In the first case, the way the two groups view the ruler uh, is equally as legitimate. This, of course, is the same as having just one group. But if you have two groups and they are viewing the ruler identical, the ruler has no basis for uh, discriminating between them and is not going to do so. It's going to apply uh, general rules that applies to everyone. But when you have between the two uh, groups, one of them views the ruler more legitimate, in this case, the first group. Uh, and that can happen, by the way, because the ruler is uh, shares religion uh, with that same group, or, or it could be some other uh, mechanism. Um, what is going to happen is the ruler is going to view that group as being more productive in terms of uh, the taxes. Uh, so that's, the ruler is going to skew resources more towards that group. And not, it's important to note here that this is not happening because ruler is uh, religious or uh, has a preference toward uh, his co-religionist or anything like that. This is a you know, good old uh, maximizing ruler is doing that as an investment in, the, in his uh, co-religionist or, or whichever group is giving him greater legitimacy. This is just to maximize the total revenue. What is going to happen then is if you're doing that, if you're treating the two groups differently, either in taxation or allocation of resources, you're going to implement identity rules. So what happens when rho goes up? Uh, keeping the same case of uh, differential legitimacy, you're going to have, uh, if this is going to depend on whether uh, the uh, uh, lambda and uh, rho are uh, substitutes or uh, complements to each other. If in the first case, this is the case uh, analyzed by um, you know, uh, Noel and uh, Mark, if state capacity and legitimacy are substitutes, an increase in rho will lower delta two, the second group's uh, uh, tax uh, deduction more than delta one. Well, why is that? Because the uh, marginal product of uh, uh, religion is, is going down in this case. So, if you have instead a, a complementary relationship between religious legitimacy and state capacity, the opposite is going to be true. So in that case, an increase in rho will result in more unequal uh, treatment. So if you actually keep doing that, so if rho, this could be a one-time shock to increase rho to shift from one equilibrium to another, or it could be happening gradually and you're gonna in the end have a, a, the second group being totally suppressed uh, either taxed out or uh, no resources given to that group. And, and this is all happening through general rules. It's going to lead to what we call modern theocracy. So let me show you that in a nutshell in a two by two matrix. 
Uh, on the left side, uh, we are looking at whether the state capacity is uh, on the vertical side, the left, uh, uh, whether the state capacity is low or high. And on, on top, we are looking at whether what type of uh, fragmentation we have in the society, either a single religious group or the case of uh, viewing the uh, legitimacy of the ruler the same, even if you have multiple groups. Taking, we're going to take that as our uh, benchmark case and focus more on the right hand side of uh, multiple religious groups. The, the top, uh, so here, before I go there, in the single religious group case, whether the state capacity is low or high, for reasons that I just mentioned, there is no reason for the ruler to differentiate or, or, or there might be just one group. Oh. But if you go to a case uh, with a low state capacity and multiple religious groups, uh, one of them uh, viewing the ruler more legitimate than other rulers going to uh, allocate resources in a differential manner, you're going to have uh, the case of religious identity rules and what uh, Johnson and Kiyama uh, refer to as the conditional religious toleration. So our focus here is how to shift out of this low state and uh, Low, low state capacity and conditional religious toleration, toleration equilibrium, how do you shift out of that to other equilibria? In the case of uh, this relationship being substitute, you get to a, a religious uh, liberty equilibrium that again, Johnson and Kiyama have analyzed. You have a non-religious secular religious, uh, general, non-religious general rules. The case that we are analyzing is in the right bottom box the case of a uh, complementary relationship between religion and uh, uh, high state capacity. And in that case, you're going to have uh, religious general rules, what we call modern theocracy. A few examples of all this. The cases that are analyzed in detail, I'm not gonna get into details here uh, that, that you know, J J Johnson and Kiyama examine quite well, are the cases of France, England, and in Europe, their fo book is focused more on England. And I can give you also examples from the Ottoman Empire where the, uh, the, the what was called the people of the book, the religious minorities, uh, Jews, Christians, uh, are subject to different types of taxes and they receive different types of uh, resources from the uh, ruler. Uh, so that's the uh, I, um, identity rules equilibrium. And in F France, England, and elsewhere in Europe, you have likewise Jews being uh, uh, treated differently than the uh, majority Christians. But then when you shift out of that equilibrium uh, with the rising state capacity, both in modern uh, France and England, you have uh, more and more general rules, more secular rules uh, and religious liberty. But then I'll give you just two examples. Uh, you also have high state capacity uh, societies and typically Iran and Saudi Arabia are the best known examples of our modern era. And in both states, uh, Islam is, uh, you know, different versions of it, but Islam is the uh, majority religion. It's also the, uh, religion that dictates uh, laws it, it, to the point of being in the constitution as the basis for uh, rulemaking. All right, so to continue, what I'm gonna do now is to give you an empirical analysis of all of this. You know, this uh, admittedly uh, uh, it turned out to be a kind of a difficult test uh, because none of the variables we are talking about, state capacity, religious legitimacy, identity rules, all of that stuff, none of those are your typical off the shelf, uh, go to a website and download kind of variables. So we had to do a lot of um, uh, creative interpretations of the data we had access to. And, and also a, a heads up on this, we, uh, even though we, you know, in other work, we t do take identification seriously, we don't, do a good job of doing that here. So results are, uh, for reasons you will see in a minute, uh, more suggestive than uh, causal uh, explanations of what's going on. So what we're going to do is just give a, a do an OLS estimate of the equation. What are the variables? RR are the religious rules. 
uh, we are looking at the modern societies and contemporary religious rules. And I'll tell you in a minute what kind of variables we are losing for this. IR is an index of identity rules. So our focus is going to be the transition from identity rules to uh, more general rules, the ones on the uh, left-hand side, the religious rules. But that can happen in two ways, through states in which, or, or in states in which religion and state capacity, uh, so they are uh, substitutes and complements. And the way we're gonna model that uh, empirically is to divide all societies into three groups, modern societies, keeping as benchmark or the reference category, the, the ones with low state capacity. We're going to look at among those with strong state, those that uh, in which state capacity substitutes through, you are gonna give them an S equals one. Otherwise you get a C if it's complements. Again, uh, our reference category is, is the weak state. Now we have a whole bunch of controls that we think might be needed to uh, uh, avoid the uh, omitted variable uh, kind of biases uh, running. So we, you know, again, we're not entirely eliminating the problem, but we do our best uh, that we can. So what are our, uh, what type of data we have to run these? The, uh, the dependent variable, the religious general rules is coming from Jonathan Fox data. He has this uh, religion and state data set uh, runs between uh, 1990 to 2014. And we basically, it's, it's, got, it's a, a bunch of dummy variables uh, between uh, the 52 different uh, ones. We just take an average for each society to see which of the rules or the laws that are in the data set are in a, in a society. So we run the index, the darker are, are the ones that have a lot of uh, uh, religious general rules. Uh, mostly as you see, it happens around the Mediterranean there. And then our uh, identity rules variable is the key variable. Uh, we're gonna use a proxy uh, for this uh, based on this idea that we don't know, obviously, whether societies in a, in a worldwide manner, whether societies have used in their past identity rules or not. What we do know is the, uh, they, or at least hypothesize that if the, there was fragmentation in a society, then the ruler had a basis for uh, applying identity rules for reasons we just talked about. So going with that assumption, if there was fragmentation, if I can somehow measure the fragmentation in a society's history, that's gonna give me a sense of uh, how much identity rules have happened in its history. So we're gonna go with that assumption. The data we have for this is uh, something we've used in the past. This is fairly new novel data set called historical polities data. And what we have there is uh, information on today's territories. We basically take the same geography as our unit of analysis and take it back in time uh, all the way down to year 1000. We do it in two steps. In the first one, we define a down variable for each year in each country, we decide whether there is a religious fragmentation or not. And obviously as you go farther in time, the more difficult it gets to collect this data. So we do a, this in a very dummy variable, kind of a simple uh, rough measurement. Uh, if you can measure, we look at 10% as the cutoff. If we cannot in the past, we look to see if there's a significant uh, secondary religion. If there is one, we put the one, and then we aggregate this over time with a discount factor. How does that uh, end up if we put it on a map? Uh, you're looking at it and the way, again, you, you see around the Mediterranean and the Middle East, the same darkness shows. Uh, the darkness uh, here refers to the uh, fraction of years in percentage terms uh, with religious fragmentation going back to the year 1000. We stopped this in uh, the, uh, 1990 when the uh, dependent variable kicks in. So by the time we look at our, we run our uh, general rules, how much in a society's history you had uh, fragmentation and by implication identity rules is what we are measuring here. So, uh, how do we then this split, do, do this measure the split between uh, substitute and complementary relationship? And for that too, we go back to the Jonathan Fox data. 
And there he has one, this variable called um, official support. It's got, I think, 13 different uh, uh, units and the lower values refer to more substitute relationship. Uh, and there it, it can range from hostility, uh, outright hostility to state being supportive. Supportive doesn't necessarily mean a lot of support. Uh, the greater support is when you get a complement relationship when the, that variable goes from cooperation all the way up to uh, state and religion being the same under state religion. And again, our reference category is going to be weak state. And oh, we are looking, of course, here, uh, the way we split substance and complements, we to, uh, to mark whether we are looking at a strong state, we are looking at the uh, ones that are above the median of World, world median in, in terms of average total revenue as percent of GDP. We're looking at high tax collecting or high revenue states. And among them, we are splitting them between S and C, keeping weak state as our reference category. So here we go, here's the results. If we do not control for anything else, the first column is showing us, and we do if we do not split, this is just the baseline look to see if fragmentation in history is giving us more uh, religious rules today, and it does. That's the positive uh, coefficient there. But then if you split it between uh, substitute and uh, complement states, we get the coefficient in exactly the way, not, uh, well, in, in the second uh, row there, you see the hypothesis of uh, John Johnson and Koyama confirmed that the relationship, the negative relationship is showing that uh, the substitute relationship between the uh, uh, state and uh, religious rules. And then, but the third column is uh, confirming our hypothesis that there's this other type of relationship going on in another uh, set of states, perhaps. So th this sh is showing when you shift out of the uh, uh, conditional toleration equilibrium, states are split into two categories in which in one, you see a different set of relationship between state and religion than the other. If you want to look at this in pictures, these are the substitute relationships. Uh, it's a, a same negative relationship we were just looking at. And, and on the other one, uh, you look the you see the um, uh, among states where the state and religion are more complementary, you see the positive relationship here. Metin, just uh, to jump in, you have Metin, Metin, just to jump in, you have like three minutes for Q and A, uh, so you might want to wrap oh, okay. it up just to make sure you got a time for, you know, any right. questions. I'll, or I'll, I'll like then that. leave this here and stop. Okay. <laughs> Thank Whoa. You, uh, all right. Uh, do, you, do you want thirty <laughs> seconds or anything? I didn't mean to, to, well, to totally. Uh, 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 well, okay. So all of this is in the book, and for those who are into robustness checks, we do a whole bunch. Of, I I put the ones we could fit in one table, but then there is more. If questions come up, I can tell you about it. So what we do is we split, uh, make a distinction between pre-modern and modern types of theocracy and show that the um, uh, transition from pre-modern societies to modern societies happen in two types. In the one, you have religious liberty. In the other, you have more theocratic elements. And we give examples of that and show that empirically. Just great sure great uh, i think we have time for for at least one question here so uh jared rubin uh, i know has a question i don't know if we'll have time for much more but jared how about how about get us going try to be as quick as possible then madden you know that i like this uh way of thinking so not surprisingly i like this um i i i was having a little trouble with one aspect of the con of conceptualizing what you're doing here though because it seemed like there was a lot of moving back between religious fragmentation, theocracy, and religious suppression, both in the model and then in the empirics, and then in the conclusion, it was kind of three different things. And those are, as you, you know, as you know, aren't, three, aren't the same. Can you guys hear me? Okay, go go go. Can you hear me? I, I can hear it. Was I think somebody else was talking at the same time. Okay. Yeah. So I just I think that kind of uh, streamlining that and using almost like one one type, one almost uh, ter term maybe, or I, I don't know, because it, it, it seemed like you kept jumping back and forth between those things. Like I didn't get from the first part of your, you know, until like actually the last slide that this is really about theocracy, 
which is about governance as opposed to, you know, the either having a single religion or suppressing religion. Um, that's it, because you know, so like pre-modern England was not a theocracy, for instance, and that was on your on your high, higher list right there. So just a thought. Right. Let me just very quickly answer by saying uh, we don't. I, it, it, at least in the empirical analysis, I, we don't think of theocracy as zero one thing. It's more grades of it. And we're trying to basically capture different grades of it in for the period we have data for the modern uh, period. But going back in time, it's obviously different. We can talk about it, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, thanks so much. Um, now it's uh, time for our, our second speaker, Jonathan Moreno. So Jonathan, uh, take it away. Um, Jonathan, uh, are, you might be on mute, by the way. There you go. Okay. Can you guys hear me now? Yep. All right. Uh, well, uh, thank you everybody who helped uh, put this together. It has been a great uh, conference to be a part of, uh, Jared and uh, Sasha and, and all the others. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, today, and, and thank you for holding up until the very end. I'm, I'm going to talk today about uh, this paper uh, uh, called Immigration and Trust, the Case of Venezuelans in Colombia. And this is uh, joint work with a uh, fellow student uh, from Duke, uh, Jeremy Libau, who will be on the market next year. So keep an eye for him. He's amazing. Uh, me, myself, I'm on the market. So uh, if you can give me a job, that would be even greater. Um, and uh, Horacio Coral, who uh, works at the Statistics Department in Colombia. Um, okay, so uh, just to motivate this uh, paper, uh, around 80 million people uh, have been uh, displaced worldwide. About, this is uh, close to 1% of the global population, and 26 million of those uh, have been displaced internationally. So, of course, this has led to a big discussion you know, among policymakers and academics on the role of xenophobia and discrimination. Um, uh, as it's arising um, throughout the globe. So um, there's this particular case of the Venezuelan exodus into Colombia where close to 2 million Venezuelans have entered uh, that country since 2014 and now represent over 3.6% of the, of the Colombian population. Um, so this is one of the biggest migrations between any uh, two countries in, in recent times. And anecdotal evidence shows that there is an increasing xenophobic attitudes against Venezuela and in, in Colombia as well. So can I, uh, the, the natural question to ask is what is happening with social capital in, this, in these cases? Um, and of course, we know that trust uh, as defined as the expectation of goodwill and benign intent of others is a key ingredient into uh, social capital. So just uh, to put a little bit more context here, this is uh, the change in overall uh, trust attitudes towards foreigners in Colombia at a very aggregate um, level uh, geographically called uh, Departamento, you can think about it as a state. But as you can see, if you, if you compare here the zero, and this is the change between uh, to, uh, 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 2012 and 2019, uh, most places report um, a decrease in overall uh, trust uh, for, toward foreigners. But interestingly enough, the correlation with the amount of foreigners as a share of the population in these areas is, uh, is um, uh, uh, kind of uh, positive. So um, in this case, you see the, the greatest drop in uh, trust on places that have the lowest, um, uh, the lowest share of, of, of migrants. So the natural question that we wanna ask in this paper is if trust toward foreigners and potentially other natives as well is shifting um, in places that receive more migrants, right? So like kind of this close proximity, how is it changing these attitudes? And if so, what characteristics of the individual of the region help explain it? So um, we wanna keep three theories in mind to test for. Um, so the, the tribalism hypothesis essentially says that um, human beings are very quick to self-identify with in an in-group um, and, and uh, detect an outgroup where they would cover in more with the in-group and defect uh, with the with the outgroup. So here the, the prediction is that you would see increasing trust toward other natives as more migrants come in, right? Because as more migrants come in, I kind of uh, break uh, increase my uh, my grouping of the in-group toward other uh, natives as well. 
the contact hypothesis uh, uh, put forward by Outward in 54 says that uh, contact under right conditions uh, reduces prejudice and increases cooperation. So this also has the prediction that increasing trust uh, toward foreigners will be the outcome of uh, having them in close proximity. And lastly, you can think about economic competition in the labor market or in public good provision or security concerns. Um, and this would uh, uh, predict that trust decreases more for people in more vulnerable uh, areas. So what we're gonna do in this paper is that we're gonna include trust related questions into a large survey in Colombia. Um, and then we're gonna use a cross-sectional IV strategy to get at the causal effect of proximity to migrants on trust. Um, I'll, I'll explain a lot on what that IV is. Um, and then we're, we're gonna do um, heterogeneity analysis, exploring uh, how do these effects change by differential labor market competition, uh, public deprivation, the oral-rural divide, and uh, the actual interaction between migrants and natives uh, in, in, the, in, in the area that we're looking at. So to preview the results, um, what we find is that perhaps not surprisingly, there's big selection. So migrants uh, go to areas that have more trusting attitudes towards foreigners. But uh, once we control for this selection with the IV, we find no average effect of migration uh, into uh, um, uh, immigrant exposure on trust. Um, but once we break into the heterogeneity analysis, we find uh, supporting evidence for the contact hypothesis. Now the contact hypothesis for those who know it um, stipulates a list of conditions that are the right ones. And here we find that among that list, um, uh, the, the characteristics that seem to, to uh, drive this, this contact hypothesis having a positive effect on trust toward foreigners um, has to do with better provision of public goods and areas being more urban and where there is actually more, more interaction. Uh, okay, so let me now talk a little bit more about the context of the Venezuelan exodus uh, into Colombia. So just uh, as, a, as a reference point, unlike most previous studies of migration or diversity, uh, here, the native and the foreign population are quite similar. So they're going to speak both Spanish, uh, culturally very similar um, in terms of religion as well and genetically uh, as well. Um, and so this is going to help uh, to think about the mechanisms that we're going to be thinking about later down because it shuts down or attenuates several potential mechanisms that you might be thinking of in terms of, you know, uh, the technology of communication, for example, uh, between, between the, the two groups. So, in 2016, the Venezuelan economy collapsed and out migration started uh, to increase exponentially fast, uh, mainly because people were escaping uh, poverty and, and violence. And so, as I mentioned before, Colombia received uh, over uh, 1.8 million Venezuelans, uh, more than any other country. And so right now, uh, Venezuelans represent 95% uh, of all foreigners who arrived between 2014 and 2018 uh, into, into Colombia and the 90% uh, of the total stock of the foreign population. This will be important because the variables that we're gonna use to explore the changes in trust ask for foreigners, but not specifically for Venezuelans, but we're gonna uh, assume that the two are essentially the same. Um, and um, if you think about what kind of uh, migrant is coming in, into uh, the Colombian side of the border, these migrants are gonna be more educated, at least in terms of uh, years of education, uh, and they will be uh, earning lower wages and more likely to work in the informal sector. So this is uh, kind of a picture of one of the main points of entry between the two countries, uh, where you see, uh, you know, uh, Venezuelans coming in uh, into into uh, Colombia, and then um, you know, like this this uh, huge uh, flow uh, was was uh, pretty heightened during this time. So uh, in a picture, this is the the percent uh, of the Colombian population that is uh, Venezuelan uh, on the left uh, axis, Y axis, and then the number on the on the right axis. And as you can see, starting in 2016, kind of the slope uh, increases quite fast. So geographically, um, previously in 2014, there were a few Venezuelans uh, living in Colombia, but these were mostly living here right next to the border. Uh, so between one and 2% of, of this uh, state, uh, whereas um, in 2019, uh, the, the variation is quite varied uh, geographically and in places further away from, from, from the border as well. 
So in terms of the data, uh, what we're going to do is uh, include what we did is include a series of questions into this survey that ran in 2019, uh, surveying 40,000 individuals across close to 120 municipalities, and then we added questions on trust and preference for segregation. Um, okay, so the, the question on trust is uh, the classical uh, world value survey, uh, and then uh, we asked them in a scale to one to five. Uh, how much they trust uh, people from a different nationality. And we're also going to have uh, family and friends kind of a, uh, as a placebo, as we don't expect uh, limited trust to, to change with migration flows. We're also going to ask for preferences for segregation, asking them if they would not like to have uh, a foreigner as a neighbor. Um, and that's going to be a dummy and that will be also uh, analyzing. So lastly, in terms of the right-hand side uh, variable for the migration shares, we're going to use the full 2018 uh, uh, population census. Um, okay. So the empirical strategy, uh, it's going to be the following. Uh, the left-hand side is going to be uh, the, the outcome. And then our coefficient of interest is going to be this beta uh, that uh, is, is the effect of the share migrant uh, while we control for individual covariates and municipality level covariates, as well as region fixed effects. And throughout, we're going to be standardizing uh, errors, um, uh, sorry, clustering standard errors at, at the municipality level. So just like a long list of characteristics uh, pre-migration flow that we're going to be including in the controls. Um, so this includes uh, uh, GDP per capita, share um, uh, that is rural, um, and so on. But uh, the, the, main, the main results are going to be coming from our instrument. So of course, the naive OLS uh, can have problems of reverse causation as migrants are going uh, are gonna to locate more likely in places with higher trust toward migrants. And we might also suffer from omitted variable bias. So what we're going to use as the instrument is going to be the minimum driving distance from the municipality capital to the Venezuelan border crossing. Um, so what does that look like? Uh, these in yellow, I don't know if you can see them here, are going to be the four main points of entry uh, or crossing uh, between the two countries. And in dot, uh, in the, uh, the black dots are going to be the center of the municipalities. And we're going to take the minimum distance uh, to any one of those four points um, as, as our instrument. Now, rightly so, you should be thinking about all the possible limitations from this design. Um, and uh, so, uh, to, to be completely transparent, of course, we do not have kind of a panel here. We only observe at the one point in time in 2019. Um, so we're going to leverage identification from this cross-sectional variation. So we need to uh, put our uh, instrument to a battery of, of tests uh, to make this design uh, credible. So the, the first uh, thread that you might be thinking of uh, is that there's cultural variation across regions that are closer uh, to, the, to the border. Um, and so in order to address that, we're going to include region controls of varying geographical size, and that they don't seem to matter that much. Another uh, possible threat is that places near the border have had uh, past exposure to Venezuelans, and we're going to do two things to control for that. One is to drop municipalities close to the border, and the other one is to include a migrant share in the last census in 2005 as a control as well. You might be thinking that proximity to the border uh, is endogenous to local economic uh, or social outcomes. Uh, so we're going to regress uh, lag variables uh, that might be uh, social and highly correlated with the trust measure on uh, our instrument. And we essentially find nothing. Um, and we also find that our uh, instrument uh, is not uh, correlated with any of the observables that we see at present time as well. Lastly, uh, it might be that the driving distance captures some form of local isolation. So as a robust, uh, as a robustness check, we're going to use the linear distance instead of the driving distance to the closest point or controlling for the driving distance to Bogota, which is the capital city. Um, so all of this, just to say that um, we really put this instrument uh, to a stringent uh, battery of tests, and um, it seems to, to pass. So. As, as far as we can see it, uh, it is, is, uh, that variation is, is as good as random. Uh, so the, the summary statistic uh, for the outcomes that we're going to be observing, 
is, is going to be the, the, the foreigner, trust in foreigner. Again, this is a, a scale from one to five, and the mean is 1.7. And uh, not, wanting, uh, not wanting a foreigner as, as uh, your neighbor, 7% of the people responded that they wouldn't. And we're going to be using the family and friends answer uh, almost as a placebo throughout. So here are the main results. We find no uh, effect on, uh, on trust and preference uh, for segregation uh, uh, for the migration share. And you can see the, here in the OLS in columns one, two, and three that the correlation is positive, meaning uh, uh, migrants are uh, going to places that have higher trust for foreigners, but with our IV, uh, that uh, effect essentially goes to zero. And if you're thinking about the weakness of our instrument, it is not weak at all. It passes uh, kind of the, the checks for weak instrument pretty well. Um, and here is uh, the, the placebo. Uh, so here, uh, again, we see that uh, the, uh, the uh, trust uh, limited, which is our measurement of trust toward family and friends, really uh, doesn't, doesn't move as well either. And uh, the effects were not wanting a uh, foreigner as, uh, as your neighbor uh, shows that um, uh, foreigners are going to places where people are less likely to say that they wouldn't like a foreigner as, as the neighbor. And all of these uh, point estimates should be thought about as a one percentage point increase in the foreign share. Uh, as, um, and the, and the left-hand side is, is uh, standard deviations of, of the, of the uh, trust measurement. Okay, so now these effects uh, or the lack of, of uh, these effects is quite robust. Here are eight different specifications where we uh, do the, the checks that I mentioned before and none of it really seems to matter. So what we're gonna do now is a heterogeneity by municipality characteristics. We also do it by individual level characteristics, but they don't seem to matter that much. Um, and, and at the municipality level, we're gonna see divide the sample between the uh, more urban and less uh, urban, uh, the ones that have better provision of public goods and the ones that have worse uh, income. We're also gonna have a measurement of uh, labor market competition where essentially we're gonna take uh, the native uh, share uh, of Colombians working in the bucket, on a bucket uh, defined by gender, age, and education group. Um, and, uh, and we're gonna be thinking about how many Venezuelans are working in, in that same industry as well. We're gonna add that up and that's gonna be our instrument, uh, sorry, our measurement of uh, uh, competition in the labor market at the, at the department level. And we're also going to be thinking about uh, the segregation. Uh, so uh, how closely are they living together, foreigners and, um, and migrants? And we're going to use this index, uh, who has, uh, which has been used by Dustman in some other papers, um, where uh, it, it essentially called the interaction index, which essentially shows which places have a higher likelihood of foreigners and um, natives living within the same uh, block of uh, or group group of, of blocks. Okay, so here are the, the results. When we do the heterogeneity by these uh, characteristics, what we're finding is that uh, the, the places that are more, more urban, places over the median in urbanization have a positive effect of migration on trust toward foreigners whereas those below the median have a negative effect. Uh, we find, uh, we don't find any difference for uh, P per capita, um, and, uh, sorry, GDP per capita. And uh, for uh, public good provision, we find the same as, as share urban. So in places that have better provision of public goods, there is this uh, positive effect on trust attitudes. Um, of the migrant population, whereas places that have worse provision of public goods, the effect is the reverse. And here on the last column, in places where actually uh, migrants and uh, natives are interacting or uh, uh, more uh, or, or in close, uh, closer proximity, then you see a positive effect, whereas you see a negative effect on, on the ones that are below the median in this measure. Okay, so. These heterogeneity results suggest that migration uh, is, uh, as I mentioned, positive, um, have a positive effect on trust in places that are more urban. So going from the 10th 
uh, percentile to the 90th percentile in the migration share uh, for, for those uh, above the median increases uh, the, the response for trust on foreigners by 0 0.2 standard deviations, which is roughly the gap in the response between those with a college education and those with no education. Um, and uh, also, it seems that in, in places that uh, have more interaction, this effect is also uh, positive. Um, and we, uh, we, we don't find any difference for uh, here for income, employment, or labor market competition. So to conclude, uh, what we're finding uh, in, in our paper is that migrants are sorting into more trusting municipalities uh, toward migrants, but we find overall uh, no average effect of this migrant share and trust, uh, but this average effect, the, uh, the no result on the average effect is masking important heterogeneity um, this heterogeneity uh, supports the contact hypothesis, uh, but it, we don't find any evidence for the tribalism hypothesis. I'm not, I, I didn't present those results here, but essentially we don't, we don't see that generalized trust between natives is changing that much with uh, the incoming uh, migrant population. Um, among the characteristics that seem to matter for the contact hypothesis, we find uh, that public good provision is key. Having actual contact is key. Um, and uh, places that are more urban uh, seem to seem to contain these these conditions as well. Uh, things that do not matter, for example, is previous exposure to violence, labor market competition, which I think is interesting on it, in and of itself as well. Um, and of course, uh, keep in mind that these effects are, uh, if, if there are effects on, on trust here, these uh, are quite rapid compared to how we think trust is changing usually. Uh, so they, it, it might have happened over a span of five years in a population that has um, a lot of similarities along ethnic, cultural, and linguistic characteristics. So some thoughts uh, on open questions that we have going forward is that still we haven't fully explained why the low interaction generates these negative responses. Uh, so we're thinking about maybe the portrayal on, on, on the media might be important here, uh, or there might be something else that is happening. Uh, if you have any ideas, please let us know. And we're also thinking about potential uh, political economy outcomes as we move forward. Anyways, uh, that's what I wanted to talk about to you today. Thank you very much. And looking forward to your questions and comments. Thanks so much. We, uh, we have a couple questions uh, here. The first question for you is from Sasha. So. <clears throat> please, Sasha. Hi, it's actually two questions. Uh, one is um, the first stage coefficient is negative. Can you remind me what that means? Um, and the second is just a random uh, paper that you surely cite, but for me just to think through what the effects mean. This paper by Andreas Steinmeier on uh, contact hypothesis in Austria, where he finds effects of people uh, Syrians walking through the Austrian countryside on their way to Germany, more or less, um, having positive effects, if I recall it correctly. Um, that seems to be a quite different experiment, where a group that is surely different from the typical Austrian um, comes in contact with you. Now, you have uh, Latinos and Latinos, um, and especially a group of which there is already a large chunk of residents in Colombia. So in that sense, they are not new. It's just more of the same. And I'm wondering what that means for the interpretation. Absolutely. Thank you, Sasha. Um, so on the, on the negative coefficient, yes. Uh, so it, it essentially means that uh, if you're further away from the, uh, from the border, uh, the, the migration share is lower. Uh, so, so higher, higher uh, distance to the border leads to a lower uh, share of migrants. Um, and then um, I, I thank you for, for the, the comment on, on the paper on Austria. Uh, yes, I've seen it. And then there's this other paper in, in Denmark as well uh, that, that shows similar results uh, where in more urban places, the, the um, um, living in close proximity to, to the migrants led to uh, better attitudes towards them, whereas in places uh, that are more uh, rural, uh, it, it was the reverse. 
uh, so there seems to be a lot um, uh, of now piling up evidence that these these uh, actually this heterogeneity seems to be important. Um, and, um, and 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 yeah, going back to the to the point that you made about the the number of uh, Venezuelans in the country, um, it wasn't that much. So just to put things in, into perspective, uh, Colombia has been a country that has been. Uh, with a lot of conflict where not a lot of migrants go in there. Uh, it, it, it actually uh, pushes migrants out, uh, doesn't, haven't really received any big uh, population uh, from migrants throughout essentially most of its history, except, you know, colonial past. Um, so it is, it is quite rare um, for, for, uh, uh, for Colombians to have contact with, with Venezuelans. Um, so, uh, but but yeah, this this difference still doesn't matter, um, and you still see kind of the, the same the same effects. Um, I think um, it might show just that these potential differences that we have built in terms of uh, the uh, cost of uh, integration culturally or uh, linguistically might be over overplayed a bit. Uh, they don't seem to matter as much, at least in this context. Okay, uh, our next question is from Alexander. Yeah, thanks a lot for the talk. Super interesting. As you, well, maybe you've heard my presentation also. Looks at this. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm wondering one thing. So in your context, I think it would be super interesting to try to check if, if pre-existing sorting of people across localities can be part of the story. Sorting of natives, I mean. So basically mm -hmm. I can see how, for example, in urban places, there can be place, people living there can be more open-minded, okay? Or how in places where higher public goods provision, people can be more civic and so more, again, kind of more positive towards foreigners, you know? How people who actually interact with people may be more trustworthy, to, more trusting to begin with. And so it's just interesting whether the reason, oh, well, I guess you see my point, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, so maybe you can I, measure. Maybe I, you can measure these things. I don't know in a survey for for the natives. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Alexander. This this is a good point. Um. Th so there are like two things um that I'm thinking of. One is that potentially if if the sorting uh, into these uh, locations was quite important uh, before, and this is actually correlated with our instrument, it actually invalidates our our identification. So so what we do uh would be what we do is uh we. There is no previous question about uh, trust toward foreigners in any survey that we have found in Colombia because there were no foreigners, right? Uh, yeah. That was not a big issue. So what we're doing is finding out in 2019, what are the uh, questions that correlate the most with that answer on, on uh, trust toward foreigners and seeing how uh, the previous version, the previous answer to those questions correlates with our instrument and we find nothing. Um, so that that kind of uh, brings a little bit of validity to, to the to the identification. But going more into the the heterogeneity, uh, which which I think is is important. I think that's that's a potentially interesting way of of looking at at the heterogeneity of the true effects. I would say though that uh, mobility, geographical mobility in Colombia is quite limited. So it tends to be that uh, people just stick around whatever they're born. Um, of course, there there is there is migration into urban areas, but that has uh, kind of slowed down uh, through time, and and is not as high as say in the U.S., where I think like this sorting would really really matter. Um, but but it's definitely something to think about. Thanks. Thank you. Great. I've got one quick question. We only have a minute or two left, uh, but. I was actually surprised when you did your interaction uh, in using, you know, labor market shares uh, to find that uh, more interaction was better. I, I would think that, you know, if you're working in an, in, you know, I, I'm I'm thinking more of a competition story than a than an interaction story. Um, so I, yeah. I, I would have been unsurprised to see that coefficient go the other way. Yeah. So actually, this interaction is not the labor market measurement. This is actually uh, being in close proximity in in uh, the the houses. So like how how close very close proximity 
uh, are natives and and uh, and and uh, migrants. But for the measurement, I think I might have this somewhere here. Uh, this is the the actual column one is the actual effect for competition in the labor market. And and there we don't we don't find any statistically different results, which again I think for me was quite surprising. I was I was expecting to see a lot of movement coming from the fact that um, there's labor market competition, uh, but it might be that um, yeah I'm I'm exactly not not sure why that isn't tracking our intuition here, but uh, but it was surprising. Got it. Well, well, hey, thank you for, for quickly clearing that up. That's uh, appreciate it. Um, okay. Um, uh, talk number 47. Uh, thank you. Is by Luke. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Jonathan. And uh, ne next we have Luke. So, uh, hey. uh, uh, although, the Jonathan, Jonathan, can you uh, stop sharing your screen? Yeah, so I'm we... trying to find the button. It's always so hard. Yeah, found oh, it. There you go. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right. Um, so, Dan, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your work organizing uh, this conference and also for all of the organizers. Uh, the conference has been really uh, fun 24 hours uh, and what a unique idea. So, I think it's uh, been uh, a lot of fun to see all, all this work being presented. Um, the paper that I'll be talking about. Uh, is joint work with Sophia Ahmad. Uh, she's one of my former students uh, and currently studying at uh, UBC. Um, in this work, we investigate the long term impact of uh, the ancient Silk Road uh, on the distribution of um, modern uh, economic activity. And so we know a lot um, about kind of this persistent story, right? We know uh, that historical uh, political institutions and colonial political institutions, even long after um, they're no longer in use, still have a really large effect on today's uh, economic well-being. There's also a lot of work that's shown that investments in capital, physical investments in transportation infrastructure also really matter uh, throughout the century. But the question that we uh, are posing in this paper is, what if the activity that we're studying is not promoted by any uh, formal institution, or it doesn't depend on any single political actor, and it relies on no physical infrastructure. If that's the case, can some informal network of trade routes exhibit the same type of persistence that we see uh, persistent effect on today's economic activity that we see in these kind of more formal results? And the reason that we frame it in this way is uh, as a kind of a broad introduction to what the Silk Road are, it's a really loose network of trade routes. There was no concept of the Silk Road until the late 1800s uh, when the phrase, the, the term was coined. Um, and the roads that people traveled on, the merchants traveled on, were not paved, were not stone, were not constructed. Uh, merchants largely just moved from their city to the next city over. Uh, and trade goes there, and the emergence of that next city moved beyond. This is not a story about Marco Polo. That's really the exception uh, rather than the rule to what happened along the Silk Roads. Governments, uh, as empires rose and fell, or local city governments did provide security and collect taxes, but rarely was that something that occurred in the open spaces uh, between ancient cities. And the time hey, period Luke, was. Yeah. Luke, can I, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Can I jump in? Uh, yeah. Could you maybe just fiddle with your AirPod a little for the audio? I can hear it, but uh, if you fiddle with it, it, might get it a little louder, a little easier to hear. Um, okay. I'm not much better. Let me... uh, uh, whatever you just did, I think was better. Okay. Better. I think it's better. Uh, and if anyone okay. has any problems, just you know, chat them to me, and I'll I'll jump in. But that's much better. So perfect. Keep going. Okay. I'll turn them off and, and try the computer thing. Uh, let me know. Um, so the the peak period that we're really thinking about when we're studying these Silk Roads is this period from 100 BC, uh, when we had a consolidation of power from the Roman Empire in the east, in the west, the Han Dynasty in the east, and the Parthian and Kushan empires in between. So we had these four empires that really span this entire area. This peacescape opportunity uh, for trade 
period during that period. And that's going to be really persistent until the 15th century uh, when this overland network lost out to European uh, seafaring vessel uh, that provided a safer way and a cheaper way uh, to make goods. The area that we're looking at is this kind of entire continent of Eurasia from Istanbul in the west to the coast of China in the east. That's about 7,000 uh, kilometers across, about 40% longer or uh, wider than the United States. So it's a pretty large geographic area. We obviously don't have these boundaries that we're used to seeing when we're thinking of that ancient period. So when we look at how the routes uh, affected economic activity today, we're going to be measuring economic activity using night lights in this area. I won't talk about it today, but in the paper we do work showing that night lights across this Eurasian continent uh, do map to um, country level GDP and have an elasticity of about 2.4, which is pretty consistent with other estimates of other regions in the world. The Silk Roads that we're studying are described by uh, this set of routes here. This is from uh, Tim Williams and work that he did uh, for UNESCO trying to identify where these routes existed so they can both preserve their cultural heritage uh, across this entire continent. And he's been able to identify what he calls the main part of the trade network, uh, and that's over 40,000 kilometers of routes and over uh, 500 different specific locations. Uh, that have artifacts from these routes. And just to kind of give you some idea of what motivated this study, the next slide, I'm going to take these routes away. So we'll get back to an image like this, but I'm going to black out the entire map, except for the part of the map uh, within 50 kilometers of the route. And so here we see just the night lights that lay specifically on the silk roads. And we can see basically across the entire extent of Eurasia that there is uh, visible nightlight uh, and economic activity in almost all parts of the route. This includes the densely populated areas as well as kind of the, um, the sparsely populated areas uh, in Kazakhstan and the Tar Basin in China where you see little dots of light uh, just perfectly oriented along the route. And so this gave us some idea that there might be something going on with the way these routes are oriented uh, and the economic activity that we see today. We can look at this kind of, and I'll talk a little more about uh, how we think we're identifying this uh, effect of the routes themselves uh, in a few slides. Um, but this kind of bandwidth around the routes of 50 kilometers uh, away is going to be our main kind of corridor that we call uh, where we look for the results of the silk roads. To formalize this, a Luke, bit Luke, more, Luke, Luke, that, uh, that, so, really sorry again. The audio is still no like a little. Can you, uh, I don't know, maybe fiddle a little more, scoot a little closer to the to the laptop, one or the other, just to so make sure. This, Dan, is this working better? Much, I think, again. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, my bad. I'm sorry about that. All good. Perfect. Um, okay. Take it away, man. Sorry. Yep. No worries. All right. So to formalize this a little bit more, um, we just look at the night light intensity as measured as the log of that uh, night light variable. And we look at it relative to the distance away from the Silk Roads. And this is the pattern that if the Silk Roads are driving this distribution, this is basically exactly the pattern that we would expect to see. We see higher level of nightlight intensity along the roads that uh, dissipates as you move further away from the roads um, and really bottoms out at about 200 uh, kilometers away. That 200 to 500 distance is what we'll use as our reference group, this place where um, the we get a pretty balanced level of economic activity. Um, the other thing that's really nice to see here is one possibility is that any increase along the roads is just a redistribution of activity that would have existed somewhere else. Uh, and while we see a little of a made air uh, around this 200 kilometer point, it's not that deep relative to that kind of balanced uh, level in the distance. 
uh, and it's not that wide either. And in our econometric specification, we'll see really no uh, hollowing out effect anywhere away from the roads. The main place that we're going to be spending a lot of our time is a comparison of these first two bins, places that are geographically right next to each other where night light activity uh, and economic activity is very different. And so if we go back to this map, the observations that we're going to use are a set of, uh, in our kind of largest sample up to 7,000, one half degree by one half degree grid cells. And we'll put the Silk Road onto that map. And this uh, whited out area again is the same area we saw in the night lights map. Um, this is the area where the cell centroid is within 50 kilometers of the route. That's going to be our main estimate. We're gonna uh, constrict our sample to being within 500 kilometers of the route. So if you're too far away, it's not that good of a comparison. So we'll drop the cells too far away. And then we're gonna be making comparisons right next to the route. So that white kind of Silk Road corridor, we're gonna be comparing that to the darkest bin just 50 to 100 kilometers away. And as the shades of gray go lighter, that's in each 50 kilometer distance. So we can rewrite that uh, with our estimating model where we have our outcome of interest, generally log night lights. Uh, in a given cell, we'll have potential vegetation and country fixed effects, um, a set of controls, and then our four dummy variables indicating how far the cell is away from the Silk Road. So an indicator for being right along the Silk Road, our main comparison group from being 50 to 100 kilometers away, and then two additional distance bins. That theta one variable then is representing, right, that uh, semi-elasticity, the percent difference of night lights in this first distance bin relative to the 200 to 500 kilometer area. But what we're really interested in is comparing that theta one and theta two the difference in night light intensity in the first two distance bins. So areas that are right next door to each other that should be similar other than the fact that one has the silk roads. Um, we'll use standard errors, uh, Conley standard errors, allowing for spatial correlations uh, within 1500 kilometers. Uh, our main results have a uniform weighting matrix. Uh, we can do a lot of different things with that and the results are strong uh, no matter how far uh, we allow this to go or whether we have a decaying uh, weighting matrix. This is um, an identification strategy used by Jedwab and Maradi in two of their papers. Before we look at the results themselves, um, this is our balanced sample where we get rid of non-desert cells, we get rid of any cells that have a river or any cells that are within 50 kilometers of 122 ancient cities. And so what you can see here is that whether you're next to the road within 50 kilometers or 50 to 100 kilometers away, um, the elevation uh, and the standard deviation of elevation are quite similar. They're at the same latitude. Uh, the Silk Road is actually generally a little further away from the coast. It's less likely to be on the coast, but they're similar distances from rivers. Um, they have similar uh, estimated population uh, in 100 BC and in 0 AD, uh, and their climate, their ability to grow crops, their returns to irrigation, their temperature and precipitation are all unique, they're all similar. Um, and all of these variables will also be controls in our regression as well. And so what we find is that economic activity, um, using night lights and converting it with the elasticity with country level GDP, Economic activity is 13% higher in the area immediately adjacent to the Silk Road relative to the area just 50 kilometers over. So economic, uh, as measured by GDP, activity is 13% higher uh, right along the Silk Road relative to those cells just next door. We find information, uh, evidence that this is driven by trade connectivity. There's more likely to have major highways, more likely to have railroads. Uh, in these areas along the routes. And actually these are two different results. This is not, we'll show evidence that this is not just um, the fact that they have mountain passes through the Himalayas where the, all three are located. Um, we also see that technology such as irrigation, uh, which was known to be used along the Silk Road quite heavily, uh, is still more likely to be used in areas um, with the Silk Road. Again, this is always the first distance bin compared to the second. 
We find no evidence that these results are driven by persistence around economic centers. Our balanced sample drops all cells within 50 kilometers of economic centers, but we can expand that out to a couple hundred kilometers. The results barely move at all. Um, modern population levels, while they're higher along the Silk Road, don't explain uh, the relationship between the Silk Roads and, um, and economic activity. And we also see that there are more diverse populations along the Silk Roads, but again, that is not something that's able to mediate the relationship with economic activity at all. And there's no evidence that uh, public good provision, uh, the number of roads, access to healthcare centers are larger along the Silk Roads. So we're really zeroing in on these kind of connectivity and technology transmission uh, mechanisms as the reasons why uh, this effect has persisted for so long. To get at um, a little bit of, of the estimates that we have, here we have log nightlight intensity as our outcome of interest. In that balanced sample, we see that nightlight intensity is about 88% higher along the Silk Roads relative to the reference group. And the difference between the first two bins uh, suggest about a 56% increase in nightlight intensity in that first bin relative to the second. And you can see down here at the bottom that that difference is uh, statistically significant at the 99% confidence level. We also see evidence of that fade out when you move further from the road, right? The result is consistently going towards zero, but doesn't go past uh, zero in any meaningful way. We can also add to the sample, we can bring that the desert cells in, we can bring all of the cells within 500 kilometers in, and we see results that are really similar. Actually, the difference between the first two distance bins uh, are all within about a percentage point of each other, um, all statistically significant in a similar way, but it doesn't seem that these geographic characteristics are doing anything to drive the results. If anything, that most restricted sample um, gives us even uh, slightly larger results in that first distance bin. Um, again, it's, uh, we could do a bunch of checks and we do in the paper, um, different assumptions on our standard errors. We have 21 years of nightlight intensity. This is all 500 years from after the Silk Road's kind of peak period ended. So it shouldn't matter which year we use, it doesn't. Uh, and we can do a lot of different uh, adjustments to our controls as well. So the results we have to this point really show that the areas immediately adjacent to the Silk Roads have higher levels of economic activity today. And so we wanna start thinking about why that is. The first thing we want to spend some time doing is just getting rid of the explanations that aren't that interesting. The explanation that we hypothesize is driving this result is that pro uh, portions of the routes that were used longer, places where ac economic activity trade occurred for a longer period, have larger results. Um, and so I think I'm just gonna kind of talk through this, but we can, I can show in more detail in questions. What we do is we have 33 cities that we know were along the ancient routes. And so we define the ancient period of the routes as the routes connecting those 33 cities. So these are cities that traded 2000 years ago uh, along the Silk Roads. And we see that nightlight intensity is higher in the portions of the routes connecting those ancient trading cities. Um, and so higher relative to the other parts of the Silk Road. So we see larger returns in the parts of the route that traded for a longer duration. We then connect those same 33 cities using a least cost path. So basically we look at the slope and elevation uh, and we let the computer decide how to move between all 33 cities. Again, this is 33 cities in an area about one and a half times wider than the United States. Um, and we're able to get results back that look very similar uh, to our Silk Road estimates. And so we can connect these um, cities with this kind of walking, uh, cost of walking between them. Uh, and we get very similar estimates sug uh, suggesting that it's not just the fact that we know these things were parts of the Silk Road because they survived history, right? Um, it seems that they actually show something very close to the optimal way to move between these cities. We use that same algorithm to connect 48 ancient cities um, that were just the largest ancient cities of the time. And so 
About 12 of them were part of the Silk Roads. The rest of them were not. They are larger than Silk Road cities on average. Uh, and so these are kind of routes that we shouldn't see a result for, and we don't. Um, the largest coefficients are no more than about 20% of our Silk Road effect, and they are not statistically significant. And then we also build a set of 2,000 random routes to make sure that we're not identifying spatial noise and that basically our results are very unique to the Silk Roads. We select 33 uh, cities of the 48 ancient pl uh, placebo cities, so cities of at least 30,000 people uh, 2,000 years ago, select 1,000 combinations of those and connect them with the least cost routes. And then we also put 33 random points somewhere on the map and connect those 1,000 times. And you'll see results comparing these kind of placebo estimates relative to our uh, main roads estimate, the larger um, ancient routes estimate, and then the optimal path. And so here you see two distributions of that first distance bin for the uh, distribution. This is the coefficient in that first distance bin um, for connections of ancient cities and for connections of random points. And then to the right, you see the lines of this, the size of our Silk Roads estimate. And you can see consistently our Silk Roads estimates are larger and there is no statistical random path uh, that's going to be able to match our results. Um, we can also compare that first distance bin and the size we get between the first two distance bins. This is all, the distribution of all thousand connections between random cities and our results out to the right. So our results are very unique uh, compared to any possible combination, either random cities or random points. Um, and I, I can talk more about that, but uh, time is getting a little bit short. And so we don't see that selection, geography, or spatial noise is able to explain our results at all, but we do see evidence that there is a return to the duration of economic activity. The last set of results we look at are um, different possible explanations, whether um, the results are driven by uh, being closer to ancient cities, we can continue to cut. This is the radius around 122 ancient cities that we cut uh, further and further away. The results stay very similar. Um, and so does that difference between the first two bins. Um, and I'll show you just kind of one of the results. The railroads seem to be the best explanation we have for why uh, the Silk Roads matter today. And so here is the first distance band and then the difference between the first two when we include all non-desert cells. So for railroads, their railroads are about 24 percentage points more likely to be along the Silk Road than uh, in the reference area 2,000 kilometers away and 200 kilometers and about 14 percentage points more likely in the first band relative to the second. Um, and so that's true for both of our baseline samples. It's also true if we control for whether or not there's a highway. So this result holds even if we control for modern highway location. Uh, there's no evidence. This is the coefficient on the first distance band when we use the placebo routes. So the placebo routes do not explain um, where today's railroads are. So the railroads lie strongly along the Silk Roads. And then here in column one, this is our main Silk Road estimate, first distance bin, and the difference between the first two. And when we control for whether or not that cell has a railroad, we get this strong mediating effect in the nightlight relationship between this, or in the relationship between the Silk Roads and the nightlights. So railroads are able to mediate somewhere about a third uh, of that uh, relationship between Silk Roads and nightlights. So this is one of these effects that we really see. Uh, affecting our nightlight Silk Roads relationship. That's true for highways, that's true for irrigation use as well, but not for population, ethnicities, uh, or the public goods provision. And so to conclude, um, we see, see evidence that the areas immediately adjacent to the Silk Roads have higher levels of economic activity today. They're more connected to international markets through highways, through railroads, and they're associated with, higher, with uh, high, more use of technology that traveled along the Silk Roads with that irrigation. So we think we're establishing some information that informal trade routes that didn't depend 
on physical infrastructure or the support of any single political institution can lead to increases in economic activity that do persist across centuries, right? So we can link this directly back to where the routes were 2000 years ago, but we also have these large effects in routes that were not uh, in use for overland trade uh, for nearly 500 years. So I think that's all uh, I have for now. Wow, thank you. Um, really fascinating, uh, cool. So um, we've got a couple questions and let me just remind uh, folks, uh, if you wanna type questions into the Q&A, um, I'll be happy to pass those along, or if, if you're one of the presenters or whatnot, you can use the you can use the chat, and, and we can do the same. So, um, the first person I think who has a question for you is uh, Sasha. Hi, Luke. That's uh, super cool stuff. In terms of your pitch, you said in the intro and now again in the conclusion that it's not about infrastructure, and it's really a nuance in my view, but why not call it infrastructure? I know there may not be a paved path, right. but there must have been historically something like a right of way um, that um, no one would build a house in the middle of uh, the place where camels would ride. You know what I mean? <laughs> so in that sense, at least by custom, there must have been, um, I, I'm not sure whether you want to push back so much against infrastructure. It may not be um, physical infrastructure, but there must have been some huts, some stopover places where you can uh, feed yeah. your camels and, and all that, no? Okay, yeah, no, I, and, and actually, I think we, we think that those caravanseries, those inns along the route were exactly why we see such large results uh, away from major city centers. This is something that in the middle of deserts, you see these results. Um, yeah, so we definitely mean, you know, infrastructure built to make transportation easier. Um, but yeah, that's a good point that, uh, that is exactly the type of thing that, that we believe it, you know, really was important that it moved this, this economic activity, this, this commerce kind of created a market in these places where there otherwise wouldn't be a market and that market has persisted. Uh, until this day. So yeah, in that sense, uh, I'm in complete agreement. Great, uh, Alexander. Yeah, hi Luke, very interesting, thanks a lot. Two short questions. So first, is it possible that along these trade routes, there was also exchange of populations, which I think is not too hero heroic to assume. And so maybe, you know, higher diversity or something like that can be part of the story. Can you check for that? And then the second question is that, you're conducting the analysis at the level of, like at the level of locations, but can you look at the pairs? So basically, I mean, the narrative I'm wondering about is that if places A and B were connected historically, they were probably exchanging technologies, trade, whatever. Is it true that now those places that were connected historically are also more actively connected in terms of trade, in terms of maybe, I don't know, migrations, culture, whatnot? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so for question one, we actually do look at that. Uh, and the answer is there is more diversity along the routes. However, there is basically no mediating effect of that diversity on the nightlight results. Um, so yes and no to that. Um, and the, the connections and the trade, uh, that is on the to-do. I mean, that's, I think we're hopefully establishing kind of this persistent effect along the Silk Roads. And now next up is figuring out some way to get at across this entire area, sub-national trade uh, measures. I think that's that's what's next for sure. Interesting, thank you. Okay, and uh, next is Jared. Oh, I think you're on mute. You think after 23? Yeah. There we go. <laughs> uh, all right. So um, are you familiar with the paper by Lisa Blades and Chris Pike on uh, trade and political fragmentation on the Silk Roads? No. Forthcoming at AJPS. Um, they have something, I mean, they, they're kind of doing something pretty similar to what you're doing. Um, not, not too similar. I'm not, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's good to know. Um, but uh, 
what their paper is about is that they're kind of looking within the Silk Roads. Um, they look at the effect of, the, of uh, being on the Silk Road on city growth, um, just mm -hmm. within cities that are already on the Silk Road. So you know, you're looking at cities near the Silk Road versus cities next to it. They do use a similar thing to you looking at you know, kind of fake Silk Roads and they find the same thing. But what, what their hypothesis is, is that where there was political fragmentation or where you were for places on the Silk Road that were around places that were politically fragmented, those cities tended to not grow as fastly as those that were, you could say, under empire. Because, and yep. you could think about it if you know, you're uh, along a, a trade route, having a lot of political fragmentation is not good for you. Um, yep. So this is something to, you know, to consider, I think, you know, and definitely want to read that paper uh, when um, yep. thinking about, really for you, it's more about the mechanisms, I think, than, than for them, which that's their outcome. Yeah. Um, so that's who are the? Could you send me that possibly? Yeah. It's. Uh, I, I, yeah. It, I can even. I'll pull. I'll pull it up here and put it in the chat. Okay. Perfect. Um, yeah. I think that's. You know. The thing that we're building right now is we're digitizing borders every hundred years through this period of where the empires were, um, and so we're going to be building in a, a measure of of kind of that. Uh, consolidation, uh, so that hopefully, and, and maybe that already exists, and that we'll we'll have an easier way to do that. Um, but that's I, I completely agree. There's no question that that's that's what we expect to find. And moreover, I, one thing on this, I do believe that for publication, it is published. They had to make their data public, so you might even want to just kind of like double, you know, check your data against theirs too. Yep. Hmm. Okay, great. Uh, so finally, we have. Uh, Mark. Uh, Hi, let me get my uh, slides up if I can. Let's see. Um, give me a second. Here we go. Hey, Dan. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I've had an issue with Zoom where I, if I full screen it, I, I feel like I may lose it. So I'm going to try once, but uh, we'll see. Oh, okay, that should work. It looks like it's working. Anyway, so this, can you see? Yeah. So far, so good. Great, awesome. So Shipwreck by Rent uh, is f with uh, Fernando Artiago and Desiree Dicia. So it doesn't have religion in. It's about institutions, but hopefully sort of interest to everybody. Um, so what's it about? It's about the Manila Lugannian train. So this is a, a depiction of, uh, of a Manila Lugannian. And um, the, the basics everyone needs to know to follow the paper is that the Lugannian trade is these are the largest ships, the, the, the most richest ships, most profitable uh, voyage in the pre-modern kind of pre world, the 1400 world. And why is it so profitable? Well, they're transporting the goods of Asia to, uh, to, to, to Americas. And on the other route, they're transporting the silver of the Americas to buy these, kind of, these East Asian goods. And um, to give you an idea of how important these were, this was, this was the number one target of both the British Navy and pirates uh, during, uh, during this whole period. So Francis Drake uh, captured a Manila Galleon in 1579, and uh, that, that basically bankrolled um, the English state for many years. That's how, hey, that's how big it was. Uh, John Maynard Mark Keynes, in, in his essay, The Economic Consequences of Our Grandchildren, attributes the origins of English growth to the capital Francis Drake acquired uh, in this one, uh, one episode, which is somewhat fanciful. Um, hey, Mark, so Mark, paper, Mark. Uh, yeah. Mark, let me jump in. I may have led you wrong when I told you you were looking good. We're still on your title screen. So before you get yeah, too okay. far off. Yeah, yeah. so there's um, the Zoom sharing. This is an ongoing uh, problem I, I have with uh, Zoom. Uh, I thought updating it would help. So uh, I'm going to try again. Sure. Do, um, that looks fine so far. Yep. Per, yep, yep, now it's jumping okay, forward. So this, is, this is where I was, you missed the picture, that's all. Okay. Um, so this paper examines the institutions governing this trade uh, based on a novel data set, which is, um, we collected the universe of all ships sailing the Manila Galleon route. And we're using this to study the costs of monopolistic trading um, institutions, particularly the cost of corruption of rent seeking. And one of the, and the costs we're focusing on is going to be the, the additional dangerous uh, 
run by the captains of these ships as a result of their incentives to, to take bribes and, and, and the outcome variable will be shipwrecked. So these ships are being shipwrecked by rents. Um, so that's, that's a, actually a relationship between ships which are leaving late and are overloaded, we think, and then voyages which are failing, either with the ships being lost at sea or returning to port so damaged they cannot sail. And we're going to have a formal model to show why um, leaving late, being overloaded, were both generated by the bribery taking place in the, in the shipyards and how that then could have resulted in uh, ship captains running these risks. So I'm going to, have to skip some of these slides. The basic historical background beyond what I've told you, you, you need to know is that China was on a silver currency. So China has a huge demand for silver. All, all of Asia has a huge demand for silver. And in return, um, consumers in both Europe and in the Americas have a huge demand for the extremely high quality goods being produced in Asia, particularly porcelain, which is obviously called China, uh, but also silks, cotton textiles, um, rugs from India, um, but predominantly goods from China, some goods from Japan as well. These are in high demand in Europe, whereas the Chinese particularly want silver. So there's a very profitable trading opportunity, extremely lucrative. And the Spanish colonized the Philippines in order to access this trade. trade. And they found Manila as a port in order to access this trade. However, merchants within Spain, particularly in Seville, want to restrict this trade. They have an incentive to um, they don't want European or American markets being flooded with Chinese textiles because they want to sell the textiles themselves. And so due to this lobbying from Spain, they restrict the number of ships to initially two per year and later one per year. And they also put in place restrictions on, this, on the volume uh, of goods that could be transported. Um, so had this trade been free, you would have seen dozens, maybe hundreds, who knows, a large number of ships would have been sailing on this route, but it's restricted. It's kept very, uh, very, high, very tight. So there's a pent up demand amongst uh, the, the merchants in Manila to load many more goods than can actually be loaded. Um, that's the Manila to Acapulco trip. In contrast, the Acapulco to Manila trip is different because um, they're just carrying silver, some of which is a subsidy to the Philippine government. And so the ships leaving from Acapulco to Manila, we think are less likely to be overloaded, in part because silver is a higher value to volume ratio. So the, the corruption we're studying, we're seeking, is taking place on one route of this journey, the, the Manila to Mexico route. Um, so this voyage is 6,000 miles approximately. It lasts six to nine months. So it's uh, the longest, most dangerous voyage in a pre-industrial world. And um, it's particularly hazardous when the ships are leaving, the, leaving Manila, navigating a Philippine archipelago. That's when there are many opportunities to crash, basically, or shipwreck. So, um, and this is the return voyage from Acapulco to Manila. Um, so as stated, there's a nominal limit on the outgoing cargo. This nominal limit is very low. It's 250,000 pesos. In contrast, we know that the largest shipwreck um, which has been discovered, they think was carrying goods worth, I think, 7 million pesos. So the nominal value was not adhered to. Uh, nonetheless, the cargo was still limited, and it was particularly limited um, by um, Basically, you could, buy a, you could buy a ticket called a boleta, which allowed you to load a certain amount of cargo onto the ship. But the possession of a boleta was in the hands of the governor. And so the governor could sell more or less of his boleta. Uh, and the that's, that's, and, and captain could also accept uh, more or less uh, ships, uh, um, more, more, more goods than should have been legally loaded. We're going, in our model, we're going to focus on the captain, but really we're talking about probably several officials colluding together in the overloading of these ships. So we're not making any of this up in the sense that we're building on what historians are telling us. So historians say this is extremely highly sought over and there's a ton of bribery. So there's a lot of abuse, there's a lot of bribery going on. And this is an illustration of a process of loading in the galleon. This takes a lot of time because the, the goods, say the porcelain, the china, has to be very carefully wrapped um, and it was often wrapped in the textile. So you would wrap the valuable porcelain and the silver in, in, inside um, cotton and silks with the uh, most valuable stuff in the middle and uh, wrapped by less and less valuable materials to prevent it from getting waterlogged or damaged. So it would take several weeks to load a galleon, uh, uh, even longer. 
Yeah, so as I've suggested, we know that um, these ships are massively overloaded. Um, contemporaries say overloading is a problem. So uh, Fernand Versic said in 1752, crews have been innocent victims of a barbarous greed of those who wish to use all the space on the ship for their cargo. And so the, the, this overloading is a well-known uh, problem. The, 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 and the overloading pushes back the date at which the ship can depart. Specifically, due to the um, weather patterns in that part of the world, the ships coming from China and other parts of Asia are arriving in Manila in late May. So they arrive in late May after the end of, end of the rains uh, with these goods, and they, they, they trade with the merchants in Manila who purchase the, the Chinese goods. But then there's a tight deadline before which the, the, the galleons can leave to go to Mexico, because if they leave too late into the summer, they run into rough weather, choppy waters, and a higher probability of encountering a typhoon or a storm. Specifically, um, the safest time to sail is early June. Once you hit mid-July, you're basically guaranteed um, that you'd run into bad weather or rough water. This is uh, Schultz, Schultz, who's our main source. And he says, if you leave after mid-July, you're practically certain of leaving in rough weather. And there's a nominal, uh, date at which the ships should depart, which was the end of June. In practice, they often uh, violate the nominal leaving date, and they often leave late into, into July, which is very curious, because like, why, given these ships, these voyages are already very perilous, they're very dangerous anyway, why would you make it more dangerous by leaving late at a time when storms are more likely? Well, the answer is, is because, you're, because you want to wait for the Chinese merchants, and then you need time to buy these goods, load them. Uh, onto the ship, and that's that could be that's what's what's delaying you. And we're we're going to argue based on the kind of qualitative stories we've studied that the, the particularly the overloading of these cargoes is the strategic delay uh, is going to induce incentives for, for strategic delay. By delaying to the last moment, the ship captain gets a bigger a bigger bribe as possible, even though that's going to lead them to sailing later than they would otherwise want to sail. Uh, so empirically. We've collected a lot of data from a variety of sources, which gives us a unique ship level panel uh, data set for the entire period. So we have every single ship uh, sailed, sailing between Acapulco and Manila. And for each ship we know, or we can estimate, dates of arrival and departure. And uh, the first time it made its voyage, uh, ship types, estimated tonnage, and the number of previous voyages the ship made. We can control for estimated reconstructed temperatures in the Pacific, both Eastern and Western, number of typhoons, presence of uh, potential pirate, pirate threats, uh, foreign powers, wars, and some estimates for some of the period for volume and value of the trade with China. Um, so I'm gonna show you the econometric shortly, but this is a bin scatter plot. So um, you know, condensing, just showing us basic relationship between departure dates and lost or being lost, a ship being lost or returned, conditional on our baseline controls. So ships leaving later in the year were much more likely to be um, to be sunk or, or shipwrecked, so that they had to return to port damaged. Um, so that's our dependent variable, a failed voyage. Um, briefly, I should say that being lost at sea is actually fairly rare. Much more common is a shipwreck where you recover some of the ship recover some of the crew, but you can't make the voyage. So that's called an Arabad. And uh, historians say that Arabad is almost as bad as the shipwreck itself, because essentially you lose a lot of your cargo, the ship is very damaged and you can't make the voyage. Oh, that's what always happens. So um, we're going to estimate, and this is the explanatory variable, uh, length zero one, uh, but we can also have a continuous variable based on the exact day you leave. So we estimate um, simple OLS, and also um, we, we use um, budget probit as well, but um, the baseline will be OLS. Um, probability of a failed voyage um, at the ship indexed by your ship, I, and the, the number of the voyages that ship has made, V, um, the main explanatory variable being whether or not you're late, whether or not you've departed after the middle of July. And this is the control vector. And then we have the ship fixed effects and voyage fixed effects. Okay, so um, these are the baseline results. And it's about um, between like point, um, so it's roughly on average, 
once we've added controls, around a 20% increased probability of being shipwrecked or returned to port if you leave late. And this is remarkably stable when we include all of our, our various controls, um, including we have a control for ship captains if they're experienced. I'll just preempt some questions on this. So you might think that more experienced captains would be less likely to leave late, or also just better at, at, at getting the ships through the voyage. And that could be true. We've coded this quite carefully because we were interested in that fact. What's remarkable though is most captains only make this voyage once. The reason being that you, it was so lucrative to be a captain on a Menelia Galleon, but you, you've made it. Once you've completed this voyage, uh, you, you've, you've got so much money, both in, in, in the baseline fee that you've collected so many bribes, you, you can retire. Uh, so the experienced captains are often captains who've made voyages on other routes. They've sailed transatlantic routes before, but very few captains repeat the Manila Ghanaian voyage. And also many captains are not experienced. And actually one of the things we're not able to, to capture, but another aspect of the corruption taking place on this route is the fact that the, the governor might be appointing his relatives or his cronies to be captains. Um, so, so, so experienced captains doesn't uh, budge our estimates, partly because they're not very many of them in the data set. Um, now, as a first check, um, on, on, on whether what we're picking up is being genuine. We also have a departure date, official departure date for the ships leaving Mexico, Acapulco, which is the port of Mexico. Uh, but ships which leave late coming from Mexico to Manila do not run into, um, into, into, into worse waters. They don't shipwreck at a higher rate. And so this suggests that there's something unique about the Manila to Acapulco route rather than the Acapulco, rather than a general phenomenon. So these ships, which are leaving late um, from this part of the voyage, are probably not overloaded. That's that's our hypothesis for why this is a null relationship. Now, um, in, in the literature, the late departure is commented upon, although it's not linked to overloading per se. Uh, we're, we're kind of the first to do this. The historians such as Schultz there's alternative possibilities for why the ships were late. One is the necessity of awaiting the return of the Acapulco galleon with the proceeds of a previous year's sale. So this explanation might make sense to the extent that capital markets uh, or credit markets are imperfect, although actually we know there were somewhat functioning credit markets, so you could borrow in the expectation of, of the ship arriving, but we're gonna check that. The other factor mentioned by Schultz is you might leave late if you believe, um, that there's a threat of pirates or the English are nearby or the French are nearby. So we, we can check that. And then the other reason you might leave late, which is mentioned by contemporaries, is if the Chinese arrive in Manila late, that could be, a, or, or, or if the trade in China is disrupted, that could be a, another source of delay. So empirically, we can, we can test for these. Uh, first, we control for arrival dates. And um, we don't find, um, we find the opposite signs than we'd expect on arrival date. And we certainly find it doesn't affect the coefficient on length whatsoever. So we think we can rule out um, Schultz's explanation. We can also look at uh, the presence of pirates. Um, so pirates are mentioned in the logs that we have. So that's, that's where pirates are coming from. But we can also construct our own measures of whether or not the Spanish empire was at war whether there are general wars in Southeast Asia or whether or not there are conflicts within the Philippines. And individually, we find nothing from these. When we combine all conflicts, we do find that it can, it, it's, it's positive and slightly significant, but even then it doesn't affect the coefficient on length. So it's working independently of its effect on, on length. Um, for a smaller sample now, we have some estimates of, of how, um, how much trade was taking place with China. This varies for a bunch of reasons, such as the fall of the Ming Dynasty. So stuff's going on in China, uh, and it does reduce the number of observations, but it doesn't really affect the coefficient on length. This, this coefficient, it's slightly smaller because we lose, lose some observations, but it's, it's still pretty consistent across specifications. Um, so we don't think it's these factors. We think late has an effect independent of the factors given by uh, historians. And we think that, that that's, the, that's the overloading. So now I have to speed up, really have to speed up in the interest of time. There's a model, which I'm not gonna have time to go into in a lot of detail. But what, we get, what the model does is it explicitly traces out the process 
by which merchants are going to bid, uh, pay bribes, bid for captain or ship officials in order to load their cargo. And there's a strategic incentive for the ship captain, called here the incumbent, to delay, because by delaying, they can induce the, 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 the uh, merchants to bid more and bribe more. And in equilibrium, they go bid up to their reservation value of a good, which is D. So the, the main result is in equilibrium, the, 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 the relationship just between the briber and the bribee um, is efficient in the sense that it doesn't leave any, anything on the table. The, the merchants will pay the maximum bribe and the, the captain who has this monopoly position extracts all of the, all of the um, uh, value from, from the merchants. And that's going to, so if this if V is high, if the merchants are willing to pay a big bribe, they're going to load a lot of extra cargo onto the ship. That's going to induce the ship to be overloaded and it's going to also result in a late departure. And we show that this late departure is more likely when the ship is more valuable and it's more like, uh, yeah, so that's, it's more likely when the ship is more valuable. And, and here, the, the, the intuition to be clear is that even though the ship captain understands and knows that by each day or week he delays, he raises the probability of shipwreck. The bribe can be so big, it can more than comp compensate for it, up to some point, of course. So that's, that's, the, um, that's the, 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 they're being induced to stay on link, prove a, prove, a, prove, a, prove a bribe. Now, this is not efficient for, it's not socially efficient because what we're not modeling here are the costs on the Spanish crown who paid for the ship, we're not modeling the costs on 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 like other merchants who who didn't bribe or on the sailors or on other people who are not beneficiaries of uh, of a bribe. So I think I've explained the intuition here. Um, you may come back to me in the Q and A if I have not done a good job. But the the, the 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 one of the predictions we get is for more valuable ships or or. Ships which are going to fill up more quickly, so smaller ships, are going to uh, reach the point at which they are overloaded quicker. And they're going to be more likely to shipwreck. Um, so we get two additional frictions from a model which we can test. The first is that smaller ships are going to reach their capacity sooner. And they're going to, so they, and, and so when they sail late, they might be even more overloaded by, by, by the captain has, has V is, is larger relative to the ship size. Um, similarly, if a ship didn't sail the previous year, which happens on a, sometimes for um, uh, exogenous reasons, such as a war or a breakdown in the relationship between Manila and then Mexico, then, so if there's no voyage for previous year, this year's voyage is gonna be especially valuable. So there's gonna be more reason to, um, to uh, 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 overload or to bribe a lot. And so, um, we can show that smaller ships and, uh, and, and ships following a failed voyage look identical on all other margins. Okay, that didn't work. Um, but the, but the, the, the only difference is, the, is when they sail late, the smaller vessels are more likely to encounter a shipwreck. So now we're splitting the sample between low and high tonnage, and we can see the result is much stronger for the lower tonnage ships. Similarly, even when we include all our controls. And those are statistically significantly different coefficients. Similarly, we find a significantly larger coefficient on late when the, the, there was no voyage the year before. So these are additional predictions we're deriving from our model, which then receive support in the data. Um, finally, and I should wrap up, I know in the interest of time, uh, everyone's getting Zoom fatigue probably. Um, we, we're interested in the history of this. So we construct a bunch of other uh, variables. So we look at the period be before and after 1640. 1640 is when the tight regulations really come in. We also constructed uh, a data, uh, a variable for when um, the Spanish crown was implementing oversight to reduce corruption. Um, and we, we contrast periods of heightened oversight with periods, periods of lesser oversight. And then we look at the end of a period. So we look at various institutional reforms um, and see if they had an effect on the late coefficient. And we find very little effect uh, for uh, 
uh, reforms such as this consolado of the Royal Philippine Company, which is consistent with the historical literature that they had no effect. But we do find that this relationship just disappears and bizarrely kind of reverses at the very end of a period when there's complete liberalization. So that's when we allow any ship to sail. But of course, uh, we've got very few observations here, so we don't want to read too much into the actual coefficient. Okay, so um, I think I've concluded just about in time. Uh, this paper shows that late departures are systematic and correlated with failed voyages between Manila and Acapulco, but not on the other trip. And we argue that this is explained by bribe taking and corruption. And we find support for the model and for additional predictions of the model in the data. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Mark, for uh, that presentation, the 48th presentation, well, I guess 47th presentation to my knowledge today. Anyway, who's counting? Um, now we got some questions. Jared, I believe you are up with our first question. All right. Well, first off, if you saw me going in and out, it's because I was having a celebratory drink. I think we've all deserved it. Um, yeah. So Mark, um, it's very, very cool paper. I've given you some uh, comments on before, and I wanted to kind of reiterate one that that I gave you that I think is kind of a big one that can't that I kind of crystallized my mind as you were presenting this. So the question you're getting at is essentially, did the did this or what was their bribery, right? What was and you find that they were and you find out you find that there was and you then say, well, here's a here's a reason, you know, here's a model for why they're they might have extracted bribes, even though it created more shipwrecks. I, and in a sense, yeah, that you're, you're doing something I think a lot of economic historians do and do it do it well, and that you're confirming what historians have long known, but you're doing it with data. And I think there's a big value add to that. But it strikes me that with these data, there's even a bigger value add that you're not doing. Um, that in this is just namely, you could quantify the law, the, the welfare losses here. What what was the, what were the welfare losses to the Spanish Empire, uh, and you know this yeah. and if you can do that, that places it, this paper in such a bigger literature. I mean, you can because you know there's this entire literature on why the Spanish fell behind, um, and empire being a big one of them, and being able to un, you know not really control their empire, you know, incredibly weak you know fiscal state capacity in their empire, and this is a clear manifestation of that. This would be one of the first papers I know of, though, that could really start to quantify what some of the uh, the implications of that would be. And I don't actually think, you know, it would be that hard, given that you've already done the hard part of, you know, you've run the regressions. We know we kind of have point estimates for just how much these um, you know, these extra days or whatever we're causing in losses. That's a great suggestion. It, it, we're thinking a little bit along those lines, but that pushes us a lot further. So yeah, we should do it basically. That's great. Yeah, cheers. Great. Uh, Jonathan, do you have a question? Hey, uh, hi, Mark. Uh, very cool paper. I just uh, wanted to ask you what characteristics do you see uh, from the, the captains? Um, and uh, so how, how were you thinking about uh, like risk yeah. aversion, maybe proxies uh, or um, yeah, maybe age or something like that, um, that you can include. Uh, yeah, so age might be um, possible, but we should, um, I suspect that's one of our data collection we might have to revisit. It's very, very difficult. So basically um, the captains are not always mentioned, their names are not always mentioned. So we only know the names for some sample. And then we did, did a exhaustive check throughout all of the secondary literature for these people. And actually we find, found out quite a lot about some of them, but then coding, coding whether they're experienced or not is a bit of a judgment call. So uh, um, we don't know, I don't know how many we know their age for. They're, they're, it's normally, we code them as experienced if we have any evidence of them being captains before. So sometimes it says this guy sailed this route. He was, um, he was a captain of a ship. He fought, you know, the, the English and this particular engagement. And so we can code him as experienced. Sometimes it says this person's incompetent, uh, but, we, but not enough times that we can really use that as a separate uh, explanatory variable. But um, it's something where we, it's, 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 one, it's a very difficult data, data collection task because it doesn't have an end. You know, uh, we've, we've searched exhaustive, exhaustively, uh, but yeah, that could, could be, we could hopefully improve that. Terrific. Um, 
if there are if there are no other questions, um, we're pretty much right on time. Um, I, I'll just uh, reiterate uh, a thank you to Monash University and Chapman and to Jared and to Sasha um, for for getting us here to the finish line. I would say super smoothly, actually, for for a twenty four hour uh, conference. That is terrific. Uh, oh. A question on the Q and A. Oh, thanks. Goodbye. Okay. Um, I, I um, I'll throw out one question. Feel free to to chat Q and A, email me, whatever. I would be curious who was here for the most sessions in this conference. Awesome. Um, so, you know, uh, so um, if you you know if you think if you think it might be you, I should check with Sasha. I you know I think you're that's a good guess. Um, uh, you know, Nasi was here. He, he was here when I went to bed last night and he was here this morning and for a lot of today too. So he's gone. But uh, anyway, but all of us deserve congratulations. We're all heroes. We all made it. Um, and, you know, I don't know if Sasha or Jared or anyone else has anything to any closing words. Sasha. It was fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, Sitting in my living room and listening to, I think I did 30, 32 talks um, was yeah. enjoyable. Yeah, I agree. It's crazy. <laughs> I agree. It, uh, might not be the last one. Maybe even after everything's over. This, 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 uh, this worked much better than I expected. Uh, yeah. Very, I think very... we should start another one right now, actually. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Anyway. Um, All right. Well, thank all right you. Terrific. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone who came and presented and who might be watching this in posterity. This is on YouTube, so it's going to be there forever. Um, I guess. Thanks, uh, guys. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Yeah. And Dan has thank the pleasure you. to uh, press yeah. the nuclear button. And it, I fall. see a button on my screen that says "end." Right, you you had wrote me before. You told me not to press it, but yeah, I can <laughs> press it. Now is the time, probably. All right. <laughs> Five. Great job, four, Jared. Three, Good job, Sasha. Two. Good job, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.